dedication, list of officers and ship's company, acknowledgement, and preface to In the Arctic Seas. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. In the Arctic Seas by Captain F. L. McClintock Dedication My dear Lady Franklin, there is no one to whom I could, with so much propriety and willingness, dedicate my journal as to you. For you it was originally written, and to please you it now appears in print. To our mutual friend, Sherard Osborne, I am greatly obliged for his kindness in seeing it through the press, a labour I could not have settled down to so soon after my return, and also for pointing out some omissions and technicalities which would have rendered parts of it unintelligible to an ordinary reader. These kind hints have been but partially attended to, and, as time presses, it appears with a mass of its original imperfections, as when you read it in manuscript. Such as it is, however, it affords me this valued opportunity of assuring you of the real gratification I feel in having been instrumental in accomplishing an object so dear to you. To your devotion and self-sacrifice, the world is indebted for the deeply interesting revelation unfolded by the voyage of the fox. Believe me to be, with sincere respect, most faithfully yours, F. L. McClintock, London, 24th November, 1859. List of Officers and Ship's Company of the Fox F. L. McClintock, Captain Royal Navy W. R. Hobson, Lieutenant Royal Navy Alan W. Young, Captain, Mercantile Marine David Walker, M. D., Surgeon and Naturalist George Brands, Engineer, died 6th of November, 1858, Apoplexy Carl Peterson, Interpreter Thomas Blackwell, ship steward, died 14th June, 1859, scurvy. William Harvey, chief quartermaster. Henry Toms, quartermaster. Alex Thompson, quartermaster. John Simmons, boatswain's mate. George Edwards, carpenter's mate. Robert Scott, leading stoker, died 4th December, 1857, in consequence of a fall. Thomas Grinstead, sailmaker. George Hobday, captain of hold. Robert Hampton, able-bodied seaman. George A. Hasselton, able-bodied seaman. George Carey, able-bodied seaman. Ben Pound, able-bodied seaman. William Walters, carpenter's crew. William Jones, dog driver. James Pitcher and Thomas Florence, stokers. Richard Singleton, Officer's Steward. Anton Christian and Samuel Emmanuel, Greenland Eskimo, discharged in Greenland. Official Acknowledgement of the Services of the Yacht Fox. Admiralty, London, 24th October, 1859. Sir, I am commanded by my Lord's Commissioners of the Admiralty to acquaint you that, in consideration of the important services performed by you in bringing home the only authentic intelligence of the death of the late Sir John Franklin, and of the fate of the crews of the Erebus and Terror, Her Majesty has been pleased, by her order in council of the 22nd instant, to sanction the time during which you were absent on these discoveries in the Arctic regions, viz. from the 30th of June 1857 to the 21st of September 1859, to reckon as time served by a captain in command of one of Her Majesty's ships, and my lords have given the necessary directions accordingly. I am, sir, your very humble servant, W. G. of Romaine, Secretary to the Admiralty. Preface The following narrative of the bold adventure which has successfully revealed the last discoveries and the fate of Franklin is published at the request of the friends of that illustrious navigator. The gallant McClintock, when he penned his journal amid the Arctic ices, had no idea whatever of publishing it, and yet there can be no doubt that the reader will peruse with the deepest interest the simple tale of how, in a little vessel of 170 tons burthen, he and his well-chosen companions have cleared up this great mystery. To the honour of the British nation, and also let it be said to that of the United States of America, many have been the efforts made to discover the route followed by our missing explorers. The highly deserving men who have so zealously searched the Arctic seas and lands in this cause must now rejoice 
that after all their anxious toils the merit of rescuing from the frozen north the record of the last days of franklin has fallen to the share of his noble-minded widow lady franklin has indeed well shown what a devoted and true-hearted englishwoman can accomplish the moment that relics of the expedition commanded by her husband were brought home in eighteen fifty four by ray and that she heard of the accounts given to him by the eskimo of a large party of englishmen having been seen struggling with difficulties on the ice near the mouth of the back or great fish river she resolved to expend all her available means already much exhausted in four other independent expeditions in an exploration of the limited area to which the search must thenceforward be necessarily restricted whilst the supporters of lady franklin's efforts were of opinion that the government ought to have undertaken a search the extent of which was for the first time definitely limited it is but rendering justice to the then prime minister to state that he had every desire to carry out the wishes of the men of science who appealed to him and that he was precluded from acceding to their petition by nothing but the strongly expressed opinion of official authorities that after so many failures the government were no longer justified in sending out more brave men to encounter fresh dangers in a cause which was viewed as hopeless hence it devolved on lady franklin and her friends to be the sole means of endeavouring to bring to light the true history of her husband's voyage and fate looking to the list of naval worthies who during the preceding years had been exploring the arctic regions lady franklin was highly gratified when she obtained the willing services of captain mcclintock to command the yacht fox which she had purchased for that officer had signally distinguished himself in the voyages of sir john ross and captain now admiral austin and especially in his extensive journeys on the ice when associated with captain kellett with such a leader she could not but entertain sanguine hopes of success when the fast and well adapted little vessel sailed from aberdeen on the first of july eighteen fifty seven upon this eventful enterprise deep indeed was the mortification experienced by every one who shared the feelings and anticipations of lady franklin when the untoward news came in the summer of eighteen fifty eight that the preceding winter having set in earlier than usual the fox had been beset in the ice off melville bay on the coast of greenland and after a dreary winter various narrow escapes and eight months of imprisonment had been carried back by the floating ice nearly twelve hundred geographical miles even to sixty three and a half degrees north latitude in the atlantic but although the good little yacht had been most roughly handled amongst the ice floes we were cheered up by the information from disco that with the exception of the death of the engine driver in consequence of a fall into the hold the crew were in stout health and full of energy and that provided with sufficient fuel and provisions a good supply of sledging dogs two tried eskimo and the excellent interpreter peterson the dane ample ground yet remained to lead us to hope for a successful issue after all we were encouraged by the proofs of the self-possession and the calm resolve of mcclintock who held steadily to the accomplishment of his original project the more so as he had then tested and recognized the value of the services of lieutenant now commander hobson his able second in command of captain allen young his generous volunteer associate and of dr walker his accomplished surgeon despite however of these reassuring data many an advocate of this search was anxiously alive to the chance of failure of the venture of one unassisted yacht which after sundry mishaps was again starting to cross baffin's bay with the foreknowledge that when she reached the opposite coast the real difficulties of the enterprise were to commence any such misgivings were happily illusory and the reader who follows mcclintock across the middle ice of baffin's bay to pond inlet thence to beachy island down a portrait of peel strait and then through the hitherto unnavigated waters of bellow strait in one summer season may reasonably expect the success which followed whilst the revelation obtained from the long-sought records which was discovered by lieutenant hobson is most satisfactory to those who speculate on the probability of franklin having in the first instance tried to force his way northwards through wellington channel as we now learn he did those who held a different hypothesis namely that he followed his instructions which directed him to the southwest may be amply satisfied that in the following season the ships did pursue this southerly course till they were finally beset in north latitude seventy degrees o five minutes at the same time the public should fully understand the motive which prompted the supporters of lady franklin in advocating the last search putting aside the hope which some of us entertained that a few of the younger men of the missing expedition might still be found living among the eskimo we had every reason to expect that if the ships were discovered the scientific documents of the voyage including valuable magnetic observations would be recovered in the absence of such good fortune we may however be well gladdened by the discovery of that one precious document which gives us a true outline of the voyage of the erebus and terror 
that the reader may comprehend the vast extent of sea traversed by Franklin in the two summers before his ships were beset, a small map is here introduced representing all the lands and seas of the Arctic regions to the west of Lancaster Sound, which were well known and laid down when he sailed. The dotted lines and arrows which extend from the then known seas and lands into the unknown waters or blank spaces on this old map indicate Franklin's route, the novelty, range, rapidity and boldness of which, as thus delineated, may well surprise the geographer and even the most enterprising Arctic sailor. For those who have not closely attended to the results of other Arctic voyages may be informed that rarely has an expedition in the first year accomplished more by its ships than the establishing of good winter quarters from whence the real researches began by sledge work in the ensuing spring. Franklin, however, not only reached Beachy Island, but ascended Wellington Channel, then an unknown sea, to 77 degrees north latitude, a more northern latitude in this meridian than that attained long afterwards in ships by Sir Edward Belcher, and much to the north of the points reached by Penny and De Haven. Next, though most scantily provided with steam power, Franklin navigated round Cornwallis's land, which he thus proved to be an island. The last discovery of a navigable channel throughout, between Cornwallis and Bathurst Islands, though made in the very summer he left England, has remained even to this day unknown to other navigators. Franklin then, in obedience to his orders, steered to the southwest, Passing, as McClintock believes, down Peel Strait in 1846, and reaching as far as latitude 70 degrees 05 minutes north, and longitude 98 degrees 23 minutes west, where the ships were beset, it is clear that he who with others had previously ascertained the existence of a channel along the north coast of america with which the sea wherein he was interred had a direct communication was the first real discoverer of the northwest passage this great fact must therefore be inscribed upon the monument of franklin the adventurous mcclure who has been worthily honoured for working out another northwestern passage which we now know to have been of subsequent date as well as collison who taking the enterprise along the north coast of america and afterwards bringing her home reached with sledges the western edge of the area recently laid open by mcclintock will i have no doubt unite with their arctic associates richardson sherard osborne and mcclintock in affirming that franklin and his followers secured the honour for which they died that of being the first discoverers of the northwest passage again when we turn from the discoveries of franklin to those of mcclintock as mapped in red colours on the general map on which is represented the amount of outline laid down by all other arctic explorers from the days when those modern researches originated with sir john barrow we perceive that in addition to the discovery of the course followed by the erebus and terror some most important geographical data have been accumulated by the last expedition of lady franklin thus mcclintock has proved that the strait named by kennedy in an earlier private expedition of lady franklin after his companion the brave lieutenant bellow and which has hitherto been regarded only as an impassable frozen channel or ignored as a channel at all is a navigable strait the south shore of which is thus seen to be the northernmost land of the continent of america mcclintock has also laid down the hitherto unknown coastline of boothia southwards from bellow strait to the magnetic pole has delineated the whole of king william's island and opened a new and capacious though ice-choked channel suspected before but not proved to exist extending from Victoria Strait in a northwest direction to Melville or Parry Sound. The latter discovery rewarded the individual exertions of Captain Alan Young, but will very properly, at Lady Franklin's request, bear the name of the leader of the Fox Expedition, who had himself assigned it the name of the widow of Franklin. Neither has the expedition been unproductive of scientific results, for whilst many persons will be interested in the popular descriptions of the native Eskimo, as well as of the lower animals, the man of science will hereafter be further gratified by having presented to him, in the form of an additional appendix, most valuable details relating to the zoology, botany, meteorology, and especially to the terrestrial magnetism of the region examined. Lastly, McClintock has convinced himself that the best way of securing the passage of a ship from the Atlantic to the Pacific is by following as near as possible the coastline of North America. Indeed, it is his opinion, founded upon a large experience, that no passage by a ship can ever be accomplished in a more northern direction. This, it is well known, was the favourite theory of Franklin, who had himself, along with Richardson, Back, Beechey, Dees, Simpson and Ray, surveyed the whole of that same North American coast from the Back or Great Fish River to Bering Strait. Thus, when Franklin sailed in 1845, the discovery of a northwest passage was reduced to finding a link between the latter survey 
and the discoveries of Parry, who had already, to his great renown, opened the first half of a more northern course from east to west, when he was arrested by the impenetrable ice barrier at Melvin Island. And here it is to be remembered that the tract in which the record and the relics have been found is just that to which Lady Franklin herself specially directed Kennedy, the commander of the Prince Albert, in her second private expedition in 1852. And had that intrepid explorer not been induced to search northwards of Bellow Strait, but had felt himself able to follow the course indicated by his sagacious employer, there can be no doubt that much more satisfactory results would have been obtained than those which, after a lapse of seven years, have now been realised by the undaunted perseverance of Lady Franklin and the skill and courage of McClintock. The natural modesty of this commander has, I am bound to say, prevented his doing common justice in the following journal to his own conduct, conduct which can be estimated by those only who have listened to the testimony of the officers serving with and under the man whose great qualities in moments of extreme peril elicited their heartiest admiration and ensured their perfect confidence. In writing this preface, which I do at the request of the promoters of the last search, I may state that having occupied the chair of the Royal Geographical Society in 1845, when my cherished friend Sir John Franklin went forth for the third time to seek a northwest passage, it became my bounden duty in subsequent years, when his absence created much anxiety, and when I reoccupied the same position, ardently to promote the employment of searching expeditions and warmly to sustain lady franklin's endeavours in this holy cause imbued with such feelings i may be permitted to say that no event in my life gave me purer delight than when captain collison whose labours to support and carry out this last search have been signally serviceable forwarded to me a telegram to be communicated to the british association at aberdeen announcing the success of mcclintock that document reached balmoral on the twenty second of september last when the men of science were invited thither by their sovereign. Great was the satisfaction caused by the diffusion of these good tidings among my associates, the distinguished Arctic explorers Admiral Sir James Ross and General Sabine being present, and it was most cheering to us to know that the Queen and our Royal President took the deepest interest in this intelligence, such as, indeed, they have always evinced whenever the search for the missing navigators had been brought under their consideration. The immediate bestowal of the Arctic Medal upon all the officers and men of the Fox is a pleasing proof that this interest is well sustained. But these few introductory sentences must not be extended, and I invite the reader at once to peruse the journal of McClintock, which will gratify every lover of truthful and ardent research, though it will leave him impressed with the sad belief that the end of the companions of Franklin has been truly recorded by the native Eskimo, who saw those noble fellows fall down and die as they walked along the ice. Looking to the fact that little or no fresh food could have been obtained by the crews of the Erebus and Terror during their long imprisonment of twenty months, in so frightfully sterile a region as that in which the ships were abandoned, so sterile that it is even deserted by the Eskimo, and also to the want of sustenance in spring at the mouth of the Back River, all the Arctic naval authorities with whom I have conversed coincide with McClintock and his associates in the belief that none of the missing navigators can now be living. Painful as is the realisation of this tragic event, let us now dwell only on the reflection that, while the Northwest Passage has been solved by the heroic self-sacrifice of Franklin, Crozier, Fitzjames and their associates, the searches after them, which are now terminated, have, at a very small loss of life, not only added prodigiously to geographical knowledge, but have, in times of peace, been the best school for testing, by the severest trials, the skill and endurance of many a brave seaman. In her hour of need, should need arise, England knows that such men will nobly do their duty. Roderick I. Murchison End of Dedication List of Officers and Ships Company Acknowledgement and Preface Chapter 1 of In the Arctic Seas This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. In the Arctic Seas by Captain F. L. McClintock Chapter 1 It is now a matter of history how government and private expeditions prosecuted, with unprecedented zeal and perseverance, the search for Sir John Franklin's ships between the years 1847 and 55, and that the only ray of information gleaned was that afforded by the inscriptions upon three tombstones at Beachy Island, briefly recording the names and dates of the deaths of those individuals of the lost expedition, who thus fell early in the cause of science and of their country. In this manner we were made aware of the locality where the Franklin expedition passed its first Arctic winter. 
The traces assuring us of that fact were discovered in August 1850 by Captain Omani, R.N., of HMS Assistance, and by Captain Penny of the Lady Franklin. In October 1854, Dr. Ray brought home the only additional information respecting them which has ever reached us. From the Eskimo of Boothia Felix, he learned that a party of about 40 white men were met on the west coast of King William's Island, and from thence travelled on to the mouth of the Great Fish River, where they all perished of starvation, and that this tragic event occurred apparently in the spring of 1850. Some relics obtained from these natives and brought home by Dr. Ray were proved to have belonged to Sir John Franklin and several of his associates. The government caused an exploring party to descend the Fish River in 1855, but, although sufficient traces were found to prove that some portion of the crews of the Erebus and Terror had actually landed on the banks of that river, and traces existed of them up to Franklin Rapids, no additional information was obtained either from the discovery of records or through the Eskimo. Mr. Anderson, the Hudson Bay Company's officer in charge, and his small party, deserve credit for their perseverance and skill, but they were not furnished with the necessary means of accomplishing their mission. Mr. Anderson could not obtain an interpreter, and the two frail bark canoes in which his whole party embarked were almost worn out before they reached the locality to be searched. It is not surprising that such an expedition caused very considerable excitement at home. Lady Franklin and the advocates for further search now pressed upon government the necessity of following up, in a more effectual manner, the traces accidentally found by Dr. Ray, and in fact of rendering the search complete by one more effort, involving but little of hazard or expense. It was not until April 1857 that any decisive answer was given to Lady Franklin's appeal. Sir Charles Wood then stated that the members of Her Majesty's Government, having come with great regret to the conclusion that there was no prospect of saving life, would not be justified for any objects which in their opinion could be obtained by an expedition to the Arctic Seas in exposing the lives of officers and men to the risk inseparable from such an enterprise. Lady Franklin, upon this final disappointment of her hopes, had no hesitation in immediately preparing to send out a searching expedition, equipped and stored at her own cost. But she was not left alone. Many friends of the cause, including some of the most distinguished scientific men in England, and especially Sir Roderick Murchison, whose zeal was as practical as it was enlightened, hastened to tender their aid, and soon a very considerable sum was raised in furtherance of so truly noble an effort. On the 18th of April, 1857, Lady Franklin did me the honour to offer me the command of the proposed expedition. It was, of course, most cheerfully accepted. As a post of honour and some difficulty, it possessed quite sufficient charms for a naval officer who had already served in three consecutive expeditions from 1848 to 1854. I was thoroughly conversant with all the details of this particular service, and I confess, moreover, that my whole heart was in the cause. How could I do otherwise than devote myself to save at least the record of faithful service, even unto death, of my brother officers and seamen? and, being one of those by whose united efforts not only the Franklin search, but the geography of Arctic America, has been brought so nearly to completion, I could not willingly resign to posterity the honour of filling up even the small remaining blank upon our maps. To leave these discoveries incomplete, more especially in a quarter through which the tidal stream actually demonstrates the existence of a channel, the only remaining hope of a practicable northwest passage, would indeed be leaving strong inducement for future explorers to reap the rich reward of our long-continued exertions. I immediately applied to the Admiralty for leave of absence to complete the Franklin search, and on the 23rd received at Dublin the telegraphic message from Lady Franklin. Your leave is granted. The fox is mine. The refit will commence immediately. She had already purchased the screw yacht Fox of 177 tons burthen, and now placed her, together with the necessary funds, at my disposal. Let me explain what is here implied by the simple word refit. The velvet hangings and splendid furniture of the yacht, and also everything not constituting a part of the vessel's strengthening, were to be removed. The large skylights and capacious ladderways had to be reduced to limits more adapted to a polar climb. The whole vessel to be externally sheathed with stout planking, and internally fortified by strong crossbeams, longitudinal beams, iron stanchions, and diagonal fastenings. The false keel taken off, the slender brass propeller replaced by a massive iron one, the boiler taken out, altered, and enlarged, the sharp stem to be cased in iron until it resembled a ponderous chisel set up edgeways. Even the yacht's rig had to be altered. She was placed in the hands of her builders, Messrs. Hall & Co. of Aberdeen, who displayed even more than their usual activity in effecting these necessary alterations, for it was determined that the Fox should sail by the 1st of July. Internally she was fitted up with the strictest economy in every sense, and the officers were crammed into pigeonholes, styled cabins, in order to make room for provisions and stores 
Our mess room, for five persons, measured eight feet square. The ordinary heating apparatus for winter use was dispensed with, and its place supplied by a very few small stoves. The fox had been the property of the late Sir Richard Sutton, baronet, who made but one trip to Norway in her, and she was purchased by Lady Franklin from his executors for two thousand pounds. Having thus far commenced the refit of the vessel, I turned my attention to the selection of a crew, and to the requisite clothing and provisions for our voyage. Many were the old shipmates, my companions in the previous Arctic voyages, most readily volunteered their services, and they were as cheerfully accepted, for it was my anxious wish to gather around me well-tried men, who were well aware of the duties expected of them, and accustomed to naval discipline. Hence, out of the twenty-five souls composing our small company, seventeen had previously served in the Arctic search. Expeditions of this kind are always popular with seamen, and innumerable were the applications sent to me, but still more abundant were the offers to serve in any capacity, which poured in from all parts of the country, from people of all classes, many of whom had never seen the sea. It was, of course, impossible to accede to any of these latter proposals, yet for my own part I could not but feel gratified at such convincing proofs that the spirit of the country was favourable to us, and that the ardent love of hardy enterprise still lives amongst Englishmen, as of old, to be cherished, I trust, as the most valuable of our national characteristics, as that which has so largely contributed to make England what she is. My second in command was Lieutenant W. R. Hobson, R. N., an officer already distinguished in Arctic service. Captain Alan Young joined me as sailing master, contributing not only his valuable services, but largely of his private funds to the expedition. This gentleman had previously commanded some of our very finest merchant ships, the latest being the steam transport Adelaide of 2,500 tons. He had but recently returned in ill health from the Black Sea, where he was most actively employed during the greater part of the Crimean campaign. Nothing that I could say would add to the merit of such singularly generous and disinterested conduct. David Walker, M.D., volunteered for the post of surgeon and naturalist. He also undertook the photographic department. And just before sailing, Carl Peterson, now so well known to Arctic readers as the Eskimo interpreter in the expeditions of Captain Penny and Dr. Kane, came to join me from Copenhagen, although landed there from Greenland only six days previously, after an absence of a year from his family. We were indebted to Sir Roderick Murchison and the Electric Telegraph for securing his valuable services. Like the Paris omnibuses, we were at length too complet and quite as anxious to make a start. Ample provisions for 28 months were embarked, including preserved vegetables, lemon juice and pickles for daily consumption, and preserved meats for every third day, also as much of Messrs. Olsop's stoutest ale as we could find room for. The government, although declining to send out an expedition, yet now contributed liberally to our supplies. All our arms, powder, shot, powder for ice blasting, rockets, maroons and signal mortar were furnished by the Board of Ordnance. The Admiralty caused 6,682 pounds of pemmican to be prepared for our use. Not less than 85,000 pounds of this invaluable food had been prepared since 1845 at the Royal Clarence Victualling Yard, Gosport, for the use of Arctic expeditions. It is composed of prime beef cut into thin slices and dried over a wood fire then pounded up and mixed with about an equal weight of melted beef fat. The pemmican is then pressed into cases capable of containing 42 pounds each. The Admiralty supplied us with all the requisite ice gear, such as saws from 10 to 18 feet in length, ice anchors and ice claws, also our winter housing, medicines, pure lemon juice, seamen's library, hydrographical instruments, charts, chronometers and an ample supply of Arctic clothing which had remained in store from former expeditions. The Board of Trade contributed a variety of meteorological and nautical instruments and journals, and I found that I had but to ask of these departments for what was required, and if in store it was at once granted. I asked, however, only for such things as were indispensably necessary. The President and Council of the Royal Society voted the sum of £50 from their donation fund for the purchase of magnetic and other scientific instruments, in order that our anticipated approach to so interesting a locality as the magnetic pole might not be altogether barren of results. Being desirous to retain for my vessel the privileges she formerly enjoyed as a yacht, my wishes were very promptly gratified, in the first instance by the Royal Harwich Yacht Club, of which my officers and myself were enrolled as members, the Commodore A. R. Sedeckney, Esquire, presenting my vessel with the handsome ensign and burgee of the club, and shortly afterwards by my being elected as a member of the Royal Victoria Yacht Club for the period of my voyage. Lastly, upon the very day of sailing, I was proposed for the Royal Yacht Squadron, to which the yacht had previously belonged when the property of Sir Richard Stratton. Throughout the whole period required for our equipment, I constantly experienced the heartiest cooperation and earnest goodwill from all with whom my varied duties brought me into contact. 
deep sympathy with Lady Franklin in her distress, her self-devotion and sacrifice of fortune, and an earnest desire to extend succour to any chance survivors of the ill-fated expedition who might still exist, or at least to ascertain their fate and rescue from oblivion their heroic deeds, seemed the natural promptings of every honest English heart. It is needless to add that this experience of public opinion confirmed my own impression that the glorious mission entrusted to me was in reality a great national duty. I could not but feel that, if the gigantic and admirably equipped national expedition set out on precisely the same duty, and reflecting so much credit upon the Board of Admiralty, were ranked amongst the noblest efforts in the cause of humanity any nation ever engaged in, and that if high honour was awarded to all composing those splendid expeditions, surely the effort became still more remarkable and worthy of approbation when its means were limited to one little vessel, containing but twenty-five souls, equipped and provisioned, although efficiently yet, in a manner more according with the limited resources of a private individual than with those of the public purse the less the means the more arduous i felt was the achievement the greater the risk for the fox was to be launched alone into those turbulent seas from which every other vessel had long since been withdrawn the more glorious would be the success the more honourable even the defeat if again defeat awaits us upon the last day of june lady franklin accompanied by her niece miss sophia Craycroft and Captain Maguire, R.N., came on board to bid us farewell, for we purposed sailing in the evening. Seeing how deeply agitated she was on leaving the ship, I endeavoured to repress the enthusiasm of my crew, but without avail. It found vent in three prolonged hearty cheers. The strong feelings which prompted them was truly sincere, and this unbidden exhibition of it can hardly have gratified her for whom it was intended more than it did myself. I must here insert the only written instructions I could prevail upon Lady Franklin to give me, they were not read until the fox was fairly in the Atlantic. Aberdeen, June 29th, 1857. My dear Captain McClintock, you have kindly invited me to give you instructions, but I cannot bring myself to feel that it would be right in me in any way to influence your judgment in the conduct of your noble undertaking. And indeed I have no temptation to do so, since it appears to me that your views are almost identical with those which I had independently formed before I had the advantage of being thoroughly possessed of yours but had this been otherwise, I trust you would have found me ready to prove the implicit confidence I place in you by yielding my own views to your more enlightened judgment, knowing too as I do that your whole heart is also in the cause, even as my own is. As to the objects of the expedition and their relative importance, I am sure you know that the rescue of any possible survivor of the Erebus and Terror would be to me, as it would be to you, the noblest results of our efforts. To this object I wish every other to be subordinate, and next to it in importance is the recovery of the unspeakably precious documents of the expedition, public and private, and the personal relics of my dear husband and his companions. And lastly, I trust it may be in your power to confirm, directly or inferentially, the claims of my husband's expedition to the earliest discovery of the passage, which, if Dr. Ray's report be true, and the government of our country has accepted and rewarded it as such, these martyrs in a noble cause achieved at their last extremity, after five long years of labour and suffering, if not at an earlier period. I am sure you will do all that man can do for the attainment of all these objects. My only fear is that you may spend yourselves too much in the effort, and you must therefore let me tell you how much dearer to me even than any of them is the preservation of the valuable lives of the little band of heroes who are your companions and followers. May God in his great mercy preserve you from all harm amidst the labours and perils which await you, and restore you to us in health and safety as well as honour. As to the honour, I can have no misgiving. It will be yours as much if you fail, since you may fail, in spite of every effort, as if you succeed. And be assured that, under any and all circumstances whatever, such is my unbounded confidence in you, you will ever possess and be entitled to the enduring gratitude of your sincere and attached friend, Jane Franklin. We were not destined to get to sea that evening. The fox, hitherto during her brief career, accustomed only to the restraint imposed upon a gilded pet in summer seas, seemed to have got an inkling that her duty henceforth was to combat with difficulties, and, entering fully into the spirit of the cruise, answered her helm so much more readily than the pilot expected that she ran aground upon the bar. She was promptly shored up and remained in that position until next morning, when she floated off unhurt at high water and commenced her long and lonely voyage. Scarcely had we left the busy world behind us when we were actively engaged in making arrangements for present comfort and future exertion. How busy, how happy, and how full of hope we all were then! On the night of the 2nd of July we passed through the Pentland Firth, where the tide, rushing impetuously against a strong wind, raised up a tremendous sea, amid which the little vessel struggled bravely under steam and canvas. The bleak wild shores of Orkney, the still wilder pilot's crew, and their hoarse screams and unintelligible dialect, the shrill cry of innumerable seabirds, the howling breeze and angry sea, 
made us feel as if we had suddenly awoke in Greenland itself. The southern extremity of that ice-locked continent became visible on the 12th. It is quaintly named Cape Farewell, but whether by some sanguine outbound adventurer who fancied that in leaving Greenland behind him he had already secured his passage to Cathay, or whether by the wearied homesick mariner, feebly escaping from the grasp of winter in his shattered bark, and firmly purposing to bid a long farewell to this cheerless land, history altogether fails to enlighten us. From January until July this coast is usually rendered unapproachable by a broad margin of heavy ice, which drifts there from the vicinity of Spitsbergen, and lapping round the Cape, extends along shore to the northward about as far as Biles River, a distance of 250 miles. Although it effectually blockades the ports of South Greenland for the greater part of the summer, and is justly dreaded by the captains of the Greenland traders, it confers important benefits upon the Greenlander by bearing to his shores immense numbers of seals and many bears. The same current which conveys hither all this ice is also freighted with a scarcely less valuable supply of driftwood for the Siberian rivers. About this time, one of my crew showing symptoms of diseased lungs, I determined to embrace the earliest opportunity of sending him home out of a climate so fatal to those who are thus affected, and having learned from Mr. Peterson, who had quitted Greenland only in April last, that a vessel would very soon leave Frederick's Harp for Copenhagen, I resolved to go to that place in order to catch this homeward bound ship. It was necessary to push through the Spitsbergen ice, and we fortunately succeeded in doing so after eighteen hours of buffeting with this formidable enemy. At first we found it tolerably loose, and the wind being strong and favourable, we thumped along pleasantly enough. But as we advanced, the ice became much more closely packed, a thick fog came on, and many hard knocks were exchanged. At length our steam carried us through into the broad belt of clear water between the ice and the land, which Peterson assures me always exists here at this season. The dense fog now prevented further progress, and as evening closed in, I gave up all hope of improvement for the night, when suddenly the fog rolled back upon the land, disclosing some islets close to us, then the rugged points of mainland, and at length, lifting altogether, the distant snowy mountain peaks against a deep blue sky. The evening became bright and delightful. The whole extent of coast was fringed with innumerable islets, backed by lofty mountains, and, being richly tinted by a glorious western sun, formed an unusually splendid sight. Greenland unveiled to our anxious gaze that memorable evening all the magnificence of her natural beauty. Was it to welcome us that she thus cast off her dingy outer mantle and shone forth with radiant smiles, such winning smiles? A faint streak of mist, which we could not account for, appeared to float across a low, wide interval in the mountain range. The telescope revealed its true character. It was a portion of the distant glacier. We found ourselves upon the Tallard Bank, thirty miles north of our port, having been rapidly carried northwards by the Spitsbergen current. July 20th. This morning the chief trader of the settlement, or, as he is more usually styled by the English, the governor, came off to us, and his pilot soon conducted us into the safe little harbour of Frederick's Harp. I was much gratified to learn that we were just in time to secure a passage home for our ailing shipmate. For trading purposes, Greenland is monopolised by the Danish government. Its Eskimo and mixed population amount to about 7,000 souls. About 1,000 Danes reside constantly there for the purposes of conducting the trade which consists almost exclusively in the exchange of European goods for oil and the skins of seals, reindeer, and a few other animals. The Eskimo are not subject to Danish laws, but although proud of their nominal independence, they are sincerely attached to the Danes, and with abundant reason. A Lutheran clergyman, a doctor, and a schoolmaster, whose duty it is to give gratuitous instruction and relief, are paid by the government and attached to each district, and when these improvident people are in distress, which not unfrequently happens during the long winters, Provisions are issued to them free of cost. Spirits are strictly prohibited. All of them have become Christians, and many can read and write. Have we English done more, or as much, for the Aborigines in any of our numerous colonies, and especially for the Eskimo within our own territories of Labrador and Hudson Bay? Greenland is divided into two inspectorates, the northern and southern. The inspector of the latter division, Dr. Ring, had arrived at Friedrichshaab upon his summer round of visits only the day previous to ourselves. He came on board to call upon me, and after divine service I landed, and enjoyed a ramble with him over the moss-clad hills. Our first meeting was in North Greenland, in 1848. We had not seen one another since, so we had much to talk about. Dr. Rink is a gentleman of acknowledged talent, a distinguished traveller, and is thoroughly conversant with the sciences of geology and botany. Unfortunately for me, his excellent work on Greenland has not been translated into English. We were kindly permitted to purchase eight tons of coal, and such small things as were required. The only fresh supplies to be obtained besides codfish, which was abundant, consisted of a very few ptarmigan and hares, and a couple of kids. These last are scarce. Some goats exist, but for eight months out of the year they are shut up in a house, 
and even now, in midsummer, are only let out in the daytime. We also purchased of the Eskimo some specimens of Eskimo workmanship, such as models of the native dresses, kayaks, etc., also birds, skins and eggs. I saw fine specimens of a white swan, and of a bird said to be extremely rare in Greenland. It was a species of grebe, Podikeps cristatus, I imagine. Friedrich's Harb is just now well supplied with wood. Besides an unseaworthy brig, the wreck of a large timber ship lay on the beach, and an abandoned timber vessel, which was met with between Iceland and Greenland in July by Prince Napoleon, drifted upon the coast thirty miles to the northward in the following September. End of chapter 1「Two of In the Arctic Seas. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. In the Arctic Seas by Captain F. L. McClintock. Chapter 2. 23rd of July. Sailed the day before yesterday for Godhaab. The fog was thick and wind strong and contrary but the current being favourable, we found ourselves off the small outstation of Fiskernice, when early this morning our fore topmast was carried away. This accident induced me to run in and anchor for the purpose of repairing the damage. After passing within the outer islets, the Moravian settlement of Lichtenfels came in view upon the right hand. It consists of a large, sombre-looking wooden house, over which is a belfry, a smaller wooden house, and about a dozen native huts roofed with sods and scarcely distinguishable from the ground they stand on even at a very short distance the land immediately behind is a barrow rocky steep now just sufficiently denuded of snow to look desolate in the extreme a strong tide was setting out of the fjord as we approached and anchored in the rocky little cove of fiskernice here we were not only sheltered from the wind but the steep dark rocks within a ship's length on each side of us reflected a strong heat whilst large mosquitoes lost no time in paying us their annoying visits this remote spot has been visited by the Arctic voyagers Captain Inglefield, R.N., and Dr. Kane, U.S.N., and still more recently by Prince Napoleon. Dr. Kane's account of his visit is full and very interesting. Cod fishing was now in full activity, and the few men not so employed had gone up the fjord to hunt reindeer. The solitary dwelling house belongs, of course, to the chief trader, and is a model of cleanliness and order. Built of wood, it exhibits all the resources of the painter's art. The exterior is a dull red, the window frames are white, floors yellow, wooden partitions and low ceilings pale blue. The lady of the house had resided here for about eight years, and appeared to us to be, and acknowledged she was, heartily tired of the solitude. She gave me coffee and some seeds for cultivation at our winter quarters. These were lettuce, spinach, turnips, caraway and peas, the latter being the common kind used on board ship. Usually they have only produced leaves on this spot, but once the young peas grew large enough for the table. I expressed a wish to see the interior of an Eskimo tent. Peterson pulled aside the thin membrane of some animal which was hung across the doorway and served to exclude the wind but admitted light, for, although past midnight, the sun was up. Some seven or eight individuals lay within, closely packed upon the ground, the heads of old and young, males and females, being just visible above the common covering. Going to bed here only means lying down with your clothes on, upon a reindeer skin, wherever you can find room, and pulling another fur robe over you. Fisker Nice appeared to be a sunny little nook, yet all the people we saw there were suffering from colds and coughs, and many deaths had occurred during the spring. The boys brought us handfuls of rough garnets, some of them as large as walnuts, receiving with evident satisfaction biscuits in exchange. By next morning we were able to put to sea, and early on the day following arrived at the large settlement of Godhab. It is in the Gilbert Sound of Davis, and appears in many old charts as Barles River. Almost adjoining Godhab is the Moravian settlement of New Hernhut. Here it was that Hans Ayerda, the missionary father of Greenland, established himself in 1721, and thus reopened the communication between Europe and Greenland, which had ceased upon the extinction of its early Scandinavian settlements in the 14th century. A few years after Ayerda's successful beginning, the Moravian mission still existing under the name of New Hernhut was established. At present the Moravians support four missions in Greenland. They are not subject to the Danish authorities, but are not permitted in any way to trade. As we were about to enter the harbour, the Danish vessel, the sole object of our visit, came out, so not a moment was lost in sending on board our invalid and our letter bag, and in landing our coasting pilot. This man had brought us up from Friedrich's Harb for the very moderate sum of three pounds. He was an Eskimo, and, as the brother of poor Hans, Dr. Kane's unhappy dog driver, was received with favour amongst us, and soon won our esteem by his quiet, obliging disposition as also by his ability in the discharge of his duty. 
He was so keen-sighted and so vigilant, it was quite a comfort to have him on board during the foggy weather, for he could recognise, on the instant, every rock or point, even when dimly looming through the mist. We were not long in discovering that his absence was a loss to us. When passing out to the north of the Kukunan Islands, the wind suddenly failed, and at the same time a swell from to seaward reached us. We therefore had considerable difficulty in towing the ship clear of the rocks. For nearly half an hour our position was most critical. July 31st. Anchored at Godhaven, or Liverley, in Disco for a few hours. I presented a letter from the directors of the Royal Greenland Commerce to the inspector of North Greenland, Mr. Ulrich, authorising him to furnish us with any needful supplies. Our only wants were sledge dogs and a native to manage them. We soon obtained ten of the former, but were advised to go into Disco Fjord, where many of the Eskimo were busy in taking and drying salmon trout, and where some would most probably be obtained. I was much pleased with Mr. Ulrich's kind reception of me, and soon found him not only to be agreeable, but well informed. Born in Greenland of Danish parents, he is thoroughly conversant with the language and habits of the Eskimo, and has devoted much of his leisure time in collecting rare specimens of the animal, vegetable and mineral productions of the country. I came away enriched by some fossils from the fossil forest of Atan Eckerdluck, also with specimens of native coal. It was here I met with the late commanders of the whalers Gypsy and Undaunted of Peterhead, which had been crushed by the ice in Melville Bay five or six weeks previously. All the other whalers had returned from the north along the pack edge and passed south of Disco. They said that the ice in Melville Bay was all broken up, and that they thought we should find but little difficulty in this late period in passing through it into the north water. Leaving Godhaven in the afternoon with a native pilot, we found ourselves some ten or twelve miles up Disco Fjord at an early hour next morning. After dispatching the pilot to announce our arrival to his countrymen at their fishing station, seven or eight miles further up, the doctor and I landed upon the north side to explore. The scenery is charming, lofty hills of trap rock with unusually rich slopes for the 70th parallel, descending to the fjord, and strewed with boulders of gneiss and granite. We found a blue campanula holding a conspicuous place amongst the wild flowers. I do not know a more enticing spot in Greenland for a week's shooting, fishing and yachting than Disco Fjord. Hares and ptarmigan may be found along the bases of the hills. Ducks are most abundant upon the field, and delicious salmon trout very plentiful in the rivers. Formerly Disco was famed for the large size and abundance of its reindeer, but for some unexplained reason they now confine themselves to the mainland. At this season the natives of Godhard resort here and enjoy the trout fishery. It is truly their season of harvest. The weather is pleasant, food delicious and abundant, and the labour an agreeable pastime. Some kayaks soon came off to the ship, bringing salmon trout, both fresh and smoked. A young Eskimo named Christian volunteered his services as our dog driver, and was accepted. He is about twenty-three years of age, unmarried and an orphan. The men soon thoroughly washed and cropped him, soap and scissors being novelties to an Eskimo. Then they rigged him in sailor's clothes. He was evidently not at home in them, but was not the less proud of his improved appearance, as reflected in the admiring glances of his countrymen. We now hastened away to the Waigat Strait to complete our coals. When passing Godhaven, the pilot was launched off the deck in his little kayak without stopping the ship. As a kayak is usually about 18 feet long, 8 inches deep, and only 6 or 17 inches wide, it requires great expertness to perform such a feat without the addition of a capsize. 4th of August. Entered the Waigat yesterday morning, slowly steaming through a sea of glass. Its surface was only rippled by the myriads of eider ducks which extended over it for several miles. Most of them were immature in plumage, and probably the birds of last year. After running about twenty-four miles, towards evening we approached a low range of sandstone cliffs on the Disco shore, in which horizontal seams of coal were seen. Here we anchored, and immediately commenced coaling. It was fortunate we did so, for soon it began to blow hard, and ere noon today we were obliged, for the safety of the ship, to leave our exposed anchorage, having however secured eight or nine tons of tolerable coal. Formerly these coal seams were worked for the supply of the neighbouring settlements, but for several years past it has been found more profitable and convenient to send out coals from Denmark, and thus permit the natives to devote their whole time to the seal fishery. The Waigat scenery is unusually grand. The strait varies from three to five leagues in width. On each side are mountains of 3,000 feet in height. The disco side, upon which we landed, is composed of trap, sandstone appearing only at the beach, and occasionally rising in cliffs to about a 100 feet. Upon the moss-clad slopes many fragments of quartz and zeolite were met with. The north end of Disco is almost a precipice to its snow-capped summit, which is 4,000 feet high. Fifth, a pleasant fair wind carries us rapidly northward, passing many icebergs. Our rigging is richly garnished with split codfish, which we hoped would dry and keep, 
but a warm day in Disco Fjord and much rain with a southerly gale in the Waigat have destroyed it for our own use. It is, however, still valuable as food for our dogs. I am very anxious to complete my stock of these our native auxiliaries, as without them we cannot hope to explore all the lands which it is the object of our voyage to search. We could only obtain ten at Godhavn and require twenty more. Sixth, by Peterson's intimate knowledge of the coast, we were enabled to run close in to the little settlement of Proven during the night and obtain a few dogs and dogs' food. This morning we reached the extreme station of Upernivik, the last trace of civilization we shall meet for some time. It is in latitude seventy two and three quarters degrees north. Here Peterson resided for twelve of the eighteen years he has spent in Greenland, and his unlooked for reappearance astonished and delighted the small community more especially Governor Fleischer and his household, who received us with the most hearty welcome. 7th. Yesterday, when we hove to off Upernivik, the weather was very bad and rapidly growing worse. Therefore our stay was limited to a couple of hours. The last letters for home were landed. Fourteen dogs and a quantity of seal's flesh for them embarked, and the ship's head was turned seaward. It was then blowing a southerly gale, with overcast murky sky and a heavy sea running. When four miles outside the outer island, breakers were suddenly discovered ahead, only just in time to avoid the ledge of sunken rocks upon which the sea was beating most violently. Many such rocks lie at considerable distances beyond the islands which border this coast, and greatly add to the dangers of its navigation. Being now fairly at sea, and the ship itself under easy sail for the night, I went early to bed in the hope of sleeping. I had been up all the previous night, naturally anxious about the ship threading her way through so many dangers, and certain about being able to complete the number of our sledge dogs, and much occupied in closing my correspondence, to which there would be an end for at least a year. All this over, the uncertain future loomed ominously before me. The great responsibilities which I had undertaken seemed now and at once to fall with all their weight upon me. A mental whirlpool was the consequence, which, backed by the material storm and the howling of the wretched dogs in concert on the deck, together with the tumbling about of everything below, long kept sleep in abeyance. One thought and feeling predominated. It was gratitude, deep and humble, for the success which had hitherto attended us, and some narrow escapes which I must ever regard as providential. Yesterday's gale has given place to calm, foggy weather. An occasional iceberg is seen. The officers amuse themselves in trying new guns and shooting seabirds for our dogs. Governor Fleischer told me yesterday that for the last four weeks southerly winds prevailed, and that only a fortnight ago his boat was unable to reach the Loom Cliffs at Cape Shackleton, fifty miles north of Upernivik, in consequence of the ice being pressed in against the land. I fear these same winds have closed together the ice which occupies the middle of the Davis Strait, hence called the Middle Ice, so that we shall not be able to penetrate it. However, we are standing out to make the attempt. To the uninitiated, it may be as well to observe that each winter the sea called Baffin's Bay freezes over. In spring this vast body of ice breaks up, and drifting southwards in a mass, called the main pack or the middle ice, obstructs the passage across from east to west. The north passage is made by sailing round the north end of this pack, the middle passage by pushing through it, and the southern passage by passing round its southern extreme. But seasons do occur when none of these routes are practicable. It is very remarkable that southward of Disco northerly winds have prevailed. They greatly impeded our progress up Davis Strait, but we cheered ourselves with the hope that they would effectually clear a path for us across the northern part of Baffin's Bay. 8. Last night we reached the edge of the Middle Ice, about 70 miles to the west of Upernivik, and ran southward along its edge all night. This morning, in thick fog, the ship was caught in its margin of loose ice. The fog soon after cleared off, and we saw the clear sea about two miles to the eastward, whilst all to the west was impenetrable closely packed floe pieces. After steaming out of our predicament, a matter which we could not accomplish under sail, we ran on to the southward until evening, but found the pack edge still composed of light ice very closely pressed together. Having now closely examined it for an extent of forty miles, I was satisfied that we could not force a passage through it across Baffin's Bay, as is frequently done in ordinary seasons. Therefore, taking advantage of a fair wind, we steered to the northward in order to seek an opening in that direction. Twelfth. We are in Melville Bay, made fast this afternoon to an iceberg, which lies aground in 58 fathoms water, about two miles from Brown's Islands, and between them and the Great Glacier, which here takes the place of the coastline. We have got thus far without any difficulty, sailing along the edge of the middle ice, but here we find it pressing in against Brown's Islands, and covering the whole bay to the northward, quite in the steep face of the glacier. This is evidently the result of long-continued southerly winds but as the ice is very much broken up, we may expect it to move off rapidly before the autumnal northerly winds now due, and these winds invariably remove the previous season's ice. 
All that we know of Melville Bay navigation in August is derived from the experience of government and private searching expeditions during eight or nine seasons. My own three previous transits across it were made in this month. The whalers either get through in June or July, or give up the attempt as being too late for their fishing. It frequently happens that they get round the south end of the middle ice, between latitudes 66 degrees and 69 degrees north, and up the west coast of Baffin's Bay late in the season. But we have no accounts of these voyages, nor should I be justified, at this late period of the season, in abandoning the prospect before me, in order to attempt a route which, even if successful, would lengthen our voyage to Barrow Strait by 700 or 800 miles. We have already passed what is usually the most difficult and dangerous part of the Melville Bay transit. There is much to excite intense admiration and wonder around us. One cannot at once appreciate the grandeur of this mighty glacier, extending unbroken for 40 or 50 miles. Its sea cliffs, about 5 or 6 miles from us, appear comparatively low, yet the icebergs detached from it are of the loftiest description. Here on the spot it does not seem incorrect to compare the icebergs to mere chippings off its edge, and the flow ice to the thinnest shavings. The far-off outline of glacier, seen against the eastern sky, has a faint tinge of yellow. It is almost horizontal, and of unknown distance and elevation. There is an unusual dearth of birds and seals. Everything around us is painfully still, excepting when an occasional iceberg splits off from the parent glacier. Then we hear a rumbling crash like distant thunder, and the wave occasioned by the launch reaches us in six or seven minutes, and makes the ship roll lazily for a similar period. I cannot imagine that within the whole compass of nature's varied aspects, there is presented to the human eye a scene so well adapted for promoting deep and serious reflection, for lifting the thoughts from trivial things of everyday life to others of the highest import. The glacier serves to remind one at once of time and eternity, of time since we see portions of it break off to drift and melt away, and of eternity since its downward march is so extremely slow and its augmentations behind so regular that no change in its appearance is perceptible from age to age. If even the untaught savages of luxuriant tropical regions regard the earth merely as a temporary abode, surely all who gaze upon these ice-overwhelmed regions, this wide expanse of terrestrial wreck, must be similarly assured that here we have no abiding place. During daytime the strong glare is very distressing, hence the subdued light of midnight, when the sun just skims along the northern horizon, is much the most agreeable part of the twenty-four hours. The temperature varies between thirty degrees and forty degrees of Fahrenheit. The drift ice of various descriptions about us is constantly in motion under the influence of mysterious surface and undercurrents, according to their relative depths of flotation, which whirl them about in every possible direction. To the southeast are two small islands, almost enveloped in the glacier, and far within it an occasional mountain peak protrudes from beneath. From observing closely the variations in the glacier surface, I think we may safely infer that where it lies unbroken and smooth, the supporting land is level, and where much crevassed, the land beneath is uneven. The crevassed parts are of course impassable, but by following the windings of the smooth surface I think the interior could be reached. Some attempts to cross the glacier in South Greenland have failed, yet by studying its character and attending to this remark I think places might be found where an attempt would succeed. Mr. Peterson tells me that the Eskimo of Upanivik are unable to account for the occasional disappearances and reappearances of immense herds of reindeer, except by assuming that they migrate at intervals to feeding grounds beyond the glacier, the surface of which, he says, is smooth enough in many places for even dog sledges to travel upon. As there is much uninhabited land both to the northward and southward of Upanivik, I do not see the necessity for this supposition. The habits of the Eskimo confine them almost exclusively to the islands and sea coasts. End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 of In the Arctic Seas. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. In the Arctic Seas by Captain F. L. McClintock. Chapter 3. 15th August. Three days of the most perfect calm have sadly taxed our patience. Lovely bright weather, but scarcely a living creature seen. This afternoon the anxiously looked for north wind sprang up, and immediately the light ice began to drift away before it, but it is not strong enough to influence the icebergs, and they greatly retard the clearing out of the bay. We have noticed a constant wind off the glacier, probably the result of its cooling effect upon the atmosphere. This wind does not extend more than three or four miles out from it. 16th. One of the loveliest mornings imaginable. The iceberg sparkled in the sun, and the breeze was just sufficiently strong to ripple the patches of dark blue sea. Beyond this, there was nothing to cheer one in the prospects from the crow's nest at four o'clock. 
but little change had taken place in the ice. I therefore determined to run back along the pack edge to the southwestward, in the hope that some favourable change might have taken place further offshore. The barometer was unusually low, yet no indication of any change of weather. A seaman's chest was picked up. It contained only a spoon, a fork and some tin canisters, and probably drifted here from the southward, where the two whale ships were crushed in June, affording another proof of the prevalence of southerly winds. As we steamed on, the ice was found to have opened considerably. It fell calm, and mist was observed rolling along the glacier from the southward. By noon, a southeast wind reached us. All sail was set, the leads or lanes of water became wider, and our hopes of speedily crossing Melville Bay rose in proportion as our speed increased. We are pursuing our course without let or hindrance. 17th. The fog overtook us yesterday evening, and at length, unable to see our way, we made fast at eleven o'clock to the ice. The wind had freshened, it was evidently blowing a gale outside the ice. During the night we drifted rapidly together with the ice, and this morning, on the clearing off of the fog, we steamed and sailed on again, threading our way between the floes, which are larger and much covered with dry snow. This evening we made again fast, the floes having closed together, cutting off advance and retreat. A wintry night, much wind and snow. 19th. Continued strong southeast winds pressing the ice closely together. Dark sky and snow. Everything wears a wintry and threatening aspect. We are closely hemmed in and have our rudder and screw unshipped. This recommencement of southeast winds and rapid ebbing of the small remaining portion of summer makes me more anxious about the future than the present. Yesterday the weather improved, and by working for thirteen hours we got the ship out of her small ice creek into a larger space of water, and in doing so advanced a mile and a half. It is now calm, but the ice still drifts, as we would wish it, to the northwest. Yesterday we were within twelve miles of the position of the Enterprise upon the same day in 1848, and under very similar conditions of weather and ice also. 20th. No favourable ice drift. This detention has become most painful. The Enterprise reached the open water upon this day in 1848, within fifty miles of our present position. Unfortunately, our prospects are not so cheering. There is no relative motion in the flows of ice, except a gradual closing together, small spaces and streaks of water being still further diminished. The temperature has fallen, and it is usually below the freezing point. I feel most keenly the difficulty of my position. We cannot afford to lose many more days. Of all the voyages to Barrow Strait, there are but two which were delayed beyond this date, viz. Paris in 1824 and the Prince Alberts in 1851. Should we not be released, and therefore be compelled to winter in this pack, Notwithstanding all of our efforts, I shall repeat the trial next year, and in the end, with God's aid, perform my sacred duty. The men enjoy a game of rounders on the ice each evening. Peterson and Christian are constantly on the lookout for seals, as well as Hobson and Young occasionally. If in good condition and killed instantaneously, the seals float. Several have already been shot. The liver, fried with bacon, is excellent. Birds have become scarce. The few we see are returning southward. How anxiously I watch the ice, the weather, barometer and thermometer. Wind from any other quarter than southeast would oblige the flow pieces to rearrange themselves, in doing which they would become loose, and then would be our opportunity to proceed. 24th. Fine weather with very light northerly winds. We have drifted seven miles to the west in the last two days. The ice is now a close pack, so close that one may walk for miles over it in any direction, by merely turning a little to the right or left to avoid the small water spaces. My frequent visits to the crow's nest are not inspiriting. How absolutely distressing this imprisonment is to me. No one without similar experience can form any idea. As yet the crew have but little suspicion how blighted our prospects are. 27th. We daily make attempts to push on and sometimes get a ship's length, but yesterday evening we made a mile and a half. The ice then closed against the ship's sides and lifted her about a foot. We have had a fresh east wind for two days, but no corresponding ice drift to the west. This is most discouraging, and can only be accounted for by supposing the existence of much ice or grounded icebergs in that direction. The dreaded reality of wintering in the pack is gradually forcing itself upon my mind, but I must not write on this subject. It is bad enough to brood over it unceasingly. We can see the land all round Melville Bay, from Cape Walker nearly to Cape York. Peterson is indefatigable at seal shooting. He is so anxious to secure them for our dogs. He says they must be hit in the head. If you hit him in the beef, that is not good meaning that a flesh wound does not prevent their escaping under the ice. Peterson and Christian practice an Eskimo mode of attracting the seals. 
They scrape the ice, thus making a noise like that produced by a seal in making a hole with its flippers, and then place one end of a pole in the water, and put their mouths close to the other end, making noises in imitation of the snorts and grunts of their intended victims. Whether the device is successful or not I do not know, but it looks laughable enough. Christian came back a few days ago like a true seal hunter, carrying his kayak on his head and dragging a seal behind him. Only two years ago Peterson returned across this bay with Dr. Kane's retreating party. He shot a seal which they devoured raw, and which under providence saved their lives. Peterson is a good ice pilot, knows all these coasts as well as or better than any man living, and from long experience and habits of observation is almost unerring in his prognostications of the weather. Besides his great value to us as an interpreter, few men are better adapted for Arctic work. An ardent sportsman, an agreeable companion, never at loss for occupation or amusement, and always contented and sanguine. But we have happily many such dispositions in the fox. 30th. The whole distance across Melville Bay is 170 miles. Of this we have performed about 120, 40 of which we have drifted in the last 14 days. The Isabel sailed freely over this spot on 20th August 1852, and the North Star was beset on 30th of July 1849 to the southward of Melville Bay, and carried in the ice across it and some 70 or 80 miles beyond, when she was set free on the 26th of September, and went into winter quarters in Walsenhume Sound. What a precedent for us! Yesterday we set to work as usual to warp the ship along, and moved her ten feet. An insignificant hummock then blocked up the narrow passage. As we could not push it before us, a two-pound blasting charge was exploded, and the surface ice was shattered. But such an immense quantity of broken ice came up from beneath, that the difficulty was greatly increased instead of being removed. This is one of the many instances in which our small vessel labours under very great disadvantages in ice navigation. We have neither sufficient manual power, steam power, nor impetus to force the flows asunder. I am convinced that a steamer of moderate size and power, with a crew of 40 or 50 men, would have got through a 100 miles of such ice in less time than we have been beset. The temperature fell to 25 degrees last night and the pools are strongly frozen over. I now look matters steadily and calmly in the face. Whilst reasonable ground for hope remained, I was anxious in the extreme. The dismal prospect of winter in the pack has scarcely begun to dawn upon the crew. However, I do not think they will be much upset by it. They had some exciting foot races on the ice yesterday evening. 1st of September. The indication of an approaching southeast gale are at all times sufficiently apparent here, and fortunately so, as it is the dangerous wind in the Melville Bay. It was on the morning of the 30th, before church time, that they attracted our attention. The wind was very light, but barometer low and falling. Very threatening appearances in the southeast quarter, dark blue sky and grey detached clouds slowly rising. When the wind commenced the barometer began to rise. This gale lasted 48 hours and closed up every little space of water. At first all the ice drifted before the wind, but latterly remained stationary. Twenty seals have been shot up to this time. On comparing Peterson's experience with my own and that of the North Star in 1849, it seems probable that the ice along the shores of Melville Bay at this season will drift northward close along the land as far as Cape Parry, where, meeting with a southwest current out of Whale or Smith Sound, it will be carried away into the middle of Baffin's Bay, and thence during the winter down Davis Strait into the Atlantic. From Cape Dudley Diggers to Cape Parry, including Walsenhume Sound, open water remains until October. It is strange that we have ceased to drift lately to the westward. 6th. During the last week we have only drifted nine miles to the west. Obtained soundings in 88 fathoms. This is a discovery and not an agreeable one. Of the six or seven icebergs in sight, the nearest are to the west of us. They are very large and appear to be aground. We approach them slowly. Pleasant weather, but the winds are much too gentle to be of service to us. Although the nights are cold, yet during the day our men occasionally do their sewing on deck. Our companions the seals are larger and fatter than formerly, therefore they float when shot. We are disposed to attribute their improved condition to the better feeding upon this bank. The dredge brought up some few shellfish, starfish, stones, and much soft mud. Ninth, On this day in 1824, Sir Edward Parry got out of the middle ice and succeeded in reaching Port Bowen. To continue hoping for release in time to reach Bellow Strait would be absurd, yet to employ the men we continue our preparation of tents, sledges, and gear for travelling. Two days ago the ice became more slack than usual and a long lane opened. Its western termination could not be seen from aloft. Every effort was made to get into this water, and by the aid of steam and blasting powder we advanced 100 yards out of the intervening 170 yards of ice when the floes began to close together, a southeast wind having sprung up. 
Had we succeeded in reaching the water, I think we should have extricated ourselves completely, and perhaps ere this have reached Barrow Strait, but south-east and south-west gales succeeded, and now it blows a south-south-east gale with sleet. 10th. Young went to the large icebergs to-day, the nearest of them is 250 feet high, and in 83 fathoms water. It is therefore probably aground, except at spring tide. The floe ice was drifting past it to the westward, and was crushing up against its side to a height of 50 feet. 13th. Thermometer has fallen to 17 degrees at noon. We have drifted 18 miles to the west in the last week, therefore our neighbours, the icebergs, are not always aground, but even when afloat drift more slowly than the light ice. There is a water sky to the west and northwest. It is nearest to us in the direction of Cape York. Could we only advance 12 or 15 miles in that direction, I am convinced we should be free to steer for Barrow Strait. 43 seals have been secured for the dogs. One dog is missing, the remaining 29 devoured their two days allowance of seal flesh, 60 or 65 pounds, in 42 seconds. It contained no bone, and had been cut up into small pieces, and spread out upon the snow, before they were permitted to rush to dinner. In this way the weak enjoy a fair chance, and there is no time for fighting. We do not allow them on board. 16th. At length we have drifted past the large icebergs, obtaining soundings in 69 fathoms within a mile of them. They must now be aground, and have frequently been so during the last three weeks, and being directly upon our line of drift, are probably the immediate cause of our still remaining in Melville Bay. The ice is slack everywhere, but the temperature having fallen to three degrees, new ice rapidly forms, so that change comes too late. The western limit of the day, Cape York, is very distinct, and not more than 25 miles from us. 18th. Lanes of water in all directions, but the nearest is half a mile from us. They come too late, as do the northwest winds which have now succeeded the fatal southeasters. The temperature fell to two degrees below zero last night. We are now at length in the north water. The old ice has spread out in all directions, so that it is only the young ice formed within the last fortnight which detains us prisoners here. The icebergs, the chief cause of our unfortunate detention, and which for more than three weeks were in advance of us to the westward, are now in the space of two short days nearly out of sight to the eastward. The preparations for wintering and sledge travelling go on with unabated alacrity. The latter will be useful should it become necessary to abandon the ship. Notwithstanding such a withering blight to my dearest hopes, yet I cannot overlook the many sources of gratification which do exist. We have not only the necessaries, but also a fair portion of the luxuries of ordinary sea life. Our provisions and clothing are abundant and well suited to the climate. Our whole equipment, though upon so small a scale, is perfect in its way. We all enjoy perfect health, and the men are most cheerful, willing, and quiet. Our native auxiliaries, consisting of Christian and his 29 dogs, are capable of performing immense service, whilst Mr. Peterson, from his great Arctic experience, is of much use to me, besides being all that I could wish as an interpreter. Humanly speaking, we are not unreasonable in confidently looking forward to a successful issue of this season's operations, and I greatly fear that poor Lady Franklin's disappointment will consequently be the more severely felt. We are doomed to pass a long winter of absolute inutility, if not of idleness, in comparative peril and privation. Nevertheless, the men seem very happy, thoughtless, of course, as true sailors always are. We have drifted off the bank into much deeper water, and suppose this is the reason that seals have become more scarce. 22nd. Constant northwest winds continue to drift us slowly southward. Strong indications of water in the northwest, west and southeast. Its vicinity may account for a rise in the temperature, without apparent cause, to 27 degrees at noon today. The newly formed ice affords us delightful walking. The old ice, on the contrary, is covered with a foot of soft snow. We have no shooting. Scarcely a living creature has been seen for a week. 24th. Yesterday I thought I saw two of our men walking at a distance and beyond some unsafe ice, but on inquiry found that all were on board. Peterson and I set off to reconnoitre the strangers. They proved to be bears, but much too wary to let us come within shot. It was dark when we returned on board after a brisk walk over the new ice. The calm air felt agreeably mild. We were without mittens, and but that breath froze upon mustachios and beard, one could have readily imagined the night was comfortably warm. The thermometer stood at plus five degrees. Today, when walking in a fresh breeze, the wind felt very cold, and kept one on the lookout for frostbites, although the thermometer was up to ten degrees. Games upon the ice and skating are our afternoon amusements, but we also have some few lovers of music, who embrace the opportunity for vigorous execution, without fear of being reminded that others may have ears more sensitive and discriminating than their own. 26th. The mountain to the north of Melville Bay, known as the Snowy Peak, was visible today, although 90 miles distant. 
I have calculated its height to be 6,000 feet. A raven was shot today. 27th. Our salt meat is usually soaked for some days before being used. For this purpose, it is put into a net and lowered through a hole in the ice. This morning the net had been torn and only a fragment of it remained. We suppose our 22 pounds of salt meat had been devoured by a shark. It would be curious to know how such fare agrees with him, as a full meal of salted provision will kill an Eskimo dog, which thrives on almost anything. I used to remonstrate upon the skins of seabirds being given to our dogs, but was told the feathers were good for them. Here all seabirds are skinned before being cooked, otherwise our ducks, divers and looms would be uneatably fishy. A well-baited shark hook has been substituted for the net of salt meat. I much wish to capture one of the monsters, as wonderful stories are told us of their doings in Greenland. Whether they are the white shark or the basking shark of natural history I cannot find out. It is only of late years that the shark fishery has been carried on to any extent in Greenland. They are captured for the sake of their livers, which yield a considerable quantity of oil. It has recently been ascertained that a valuable substance resembling spermaceti may be expressed from the carcass, and for this purpose powerful screw presses are now employed. In early winter the sharks are caught with hook and line through holes in the ice. The Eskimo assert that they are insensible to pain, and Peterson assures me he has plunged a long knife several times into the head of one, whilst it continued to feed upon a white whale entangled in his net. It is not sufficient to drive them away with sundry thrusts of spears or knives, but they must be towed away to some distance from the nets, otherwise they will return to feed. It must be remembered that the brain of a shark is extremely small in proportion to the size of its huge head. I have seen bullets fired through them with very little apparent effect, but if these creatures can feel, the devices practised upon them by the Eskimo must be cruel indeed. It is only in certain localities that sharks are found, and in these places they are often attracted to the nets by the animals entangled in them. The dogs are not suffered to eat either the skin or the head, the former in consequence of its extreme roughness, and the latter because it causes giddiness and makes them sick. The nets alluded to are set for the white whale or the seal. If for the former, they are attached to the shore and extended off at right angles, so as to intercept them in their autumnal southern migration, when they swim close along the rocks to avoid their direst foe, the grampus or killer of sailors, the delphinus orca of naturalists. When the white whale is stopped by the net, it often appears at first to be unconscious of the fact, and continues to swim against it, affording time for the approach of the boat and deadly harpoon from behind. If entangled in the net, a very short time suffices to drown them, as, like all the whale tribe, they are obliged to come to the surface to breathe. The killer is also a cetacean of considerable size, 15 to 20 feet in length, but of very different habits. It is very swift, is armed with powerful teeth, and is gregarious. When in sufficient numbers they even attack the whale, impeding his progress by fastening on his fins and tail. In summer they appear in the Greenland seas, and the seals instantly seek refuge from them in the various creeks and inner harbours. And the Eskimo hunter, in his frail kayak, when he sees the huge pointed dorsal fin swiftly cleaving the surface of the sea, is scarcely less anxious to shun such dangerous company. With such stories as these, Peterson beguiles the time. I never tire of listening to them, and now amuse myself in jotting scraps of them down. End of chapter 3"'September has passed away and left us as a legacy to the pack. "'What a month we have had of anxious hopes and fears. "'Up to the 17th, south-east winds prevailed, "'forcing the ice into a compact body and urging it north-westward. "'Subsequently, north-west winds set in, "'drifting it southward and separating the flow pieces, "'but the change of wind being accompanied by a considerable fall of temperature, "'they were either quickly cemented together again, "'or young ice formed over the newly opened lanes of water "'almost as rapidly as the surface of the sea became exposed.' During the month, the thermometer ranged between plus 36 degrees and minus 2 degrees. Two more bears and a raven have been seen. A wearied ptarmigan alighted near the ship, but before it could take wing again, the dogs caught it, and scarcely a feather remained by the time I could rush on deck. Our beautiful little organ was taken out of its case today and put up on the lower deck. The men enjoy its pleasing tones, whilst Christian unceasingly turns the handle in a state of intense delight. He regards it with such awe and admiration, and is so entranced that one cannot help envying him. Of course he never saw one before. The instrument was presented by the Prince Consort to the searching vessel bearing his name, which was sent out by Lady Franklin in 1851. It is now about to pass its third winter in the frozen regions.
Two dogs ran off yesterday, in the vain hope, I suppose, of bettering their condition. We only feed them three times a week at present. They returned this morning. Seals are seen daily upon the new ice, but in this doubtful sort of light they are extremely timid, therefore our sportsmen cannot get within shot. The bears scent or hear our dogs and so keep aloof. Even the shark has deserted us, the bait remains intact. The snow crystals of last night are extremely beautiful. The largest kind is an inch in length, its form exactly resembles the end of a pointed feather. Stellar crystals two-tenths of an inch in diameter have also fallen. These have six points and are the most exquisite things when seen under a microscope. I remember noticing them at Melville Island in March 1853, when the temperature rose to plus 8 degrees. As these were formed last night between the temperatures of plus 6 degrees and plus 12 degrees, it would appear that the form is due to a certain fixed temperature. In the sun, or even in moonlight, all these crystals glisten most brilliantly, and as our masts and rigging are abundantly covered with them, the fox was never so gorgeously arrayed as she now appears. 13th. One day is very like another. We have to battle stoutly with monotony, and but that each twenty-four hours brings with it necessary though trivial duties, it would be difficult to remember the date. We take our guns and walk long distances, but see nothing. Two of the dogs go hunting on their own account, sometimes remaining absent all night. What they find or do is a mystery. The weather is generally calm and cold, very favourable for freezing purposes at all events, for the ice of only three weeks' growth is two feet thick. I hardly expect any considerable disruption of the ice before the general break-up in the spring, yet we do not trust any of our provisions upon it, nor is it sufficiently still to set up a magnetic observatory, for which purpose the instruments have been supplied to us. Peterson still hopes that we may escape and get to Upanivik, as the sea is not permanently frozen over there before December. I am surprised to hear that eagles have been seen so far north as Upanivik, although it is but twice in twenty-four years that specimens have been noticed there. In Richardson's Fauna Boreali Americana, the extreme northern limit of these birds is given as 66 degrees, but Upanivik is in 72 and three quarters degrees. A few bear and fox tracks have been seen, but no living creatures for several days, except a flock of ducks hastening southward and a solitary raven. It is said that Eskimo dogs will eat everything except fox and raven. There are exceptions, however. One of ours, old Harness Jack, devoured a raven with much gusto some days ago. All the other dogs allowed their harness to be taken off when they were brought on board, but old Jack will not permit himself to be unrobed. When attempted, he very plainly threatens to use his teeth. This canine oddity suddenly became immensely popular by constituting himself protecting head of the establishment when one of his tribe littered. He took up a most uncomfortable position on top of the family cask, our impromptu kennel, and prevented the approach of all the other dogs. But for his timely interference on behalf of the poor little puppies, I verily believe they would all have been stolen and devoured. Dogs may do even worse than eat raven. I have attempted some experiments for the purpose of determining the mean hourly change of oscillation of a pendulum due to the Earth's diurnal motion, but as mine was only eleven and a half feet in length, I failed of any approach to accuracy. The mean of several observations gave 17 degrees 47 minutes, whereas the change due to our latitude is about 14 degrees 30 minutes. A single experiment gave 14 degrees 10 minutes, and this was the longest in point of time of any of them, the pendulum having swung for 36 minutes. 24th. Furious northwest and southeast gales have alternated of late. The ship is housed over to keep out the driving snow. So high is the snow carried in the air that a little box perforated with small holes and triced up fifty feet high is soon filled up. This box is supplied morning and evening with a piece of prepared paper to detect the presence and amount of ozone in the atmosphere. It is a peculiar pet of the doctors. At eight o'clock this evening I noticed the falling of a very brilliant meteor. It passed through the constellation of Cassiopeia in a north-north-east direction before terminating its visible existence, which it did very much like a huge rocket. The flash was so brilliant that a man whose back was turned to it mistook the illumination for lightning. 26th. Our school opened this evening under the auspices of Dr. Walker. He reports eight or nine pupils and is much gratified by their zeal. At present their studies are limited to the three R's, reading, writing and arithmetic. They have asked him to read and explain something instructive, so he intends to make them acquainted with the trade winds and atmosphere. This subject affords an opportunity of explaining the uses of our thermometer, barometer, ozonometer and electrometer, which they see us take much interest in. It is delightful to find a spirit of inquiry amongst them. Apart from scholastic occupation, I give them healthful exercise in spreading a thick layer of snow over the deck and encasing the ship all round with a bank of the same material. 28th. Midnight. 
This evening, to our great astonishment, there occurred a disruption of movement of the ice within 200 yards of the ship. The night was calm, the reflection of a bright moon, aided by the more than ordinary brilliancy of the stars upon the snowy expanse, made it appear to us almost daylight. As I sit now in my cabin I can distinctly hear the ice crushing, it resembles the continued roar of distant surf, and there are many other occasional sounds. Some of them remind one of the low moaning of the wind. Others are loud and harsh, as if trains of heavy wagons with ungreased axles were slowly labouring along. Upon a less favoured night these sounds might be appalling. Even as it is, they are sufficiently ominous to invite reflection. Cape York has been in sight for some days past. 29th. Another heavenly night, and still greater ice disturbance. Some of the crushed up pieces are nearly four feet thick. The currents, icebergs, and changes of temperature may contribute to this ice action, but I think the tides are the chief cause, and for these reasons, that it wants but two days to the full moon, and that the ice movements are almost confined to the night, and change their direction morning and evening. Now we know that the night tides in Greenland greatly exceed the day tides. One thing is evident, the weather continues calm, therefore the winds are not concerned in the matter. 2nd November Having observed some days ago that a few of the dogs were falling away, from some cause or other, not having put on their winter clothing before the recent cold weather set in, they were all allowed on board and given a good extra meal. Since then we can scarcely keep them out. One calm night they made a charge and boarded the ship so suddenly that several of the men rushed up very scantily clothed to see what was the matter. Vigorous measures were adopted to expel the intruders, and there was desperate chasing round the deck with broomsticks, etc. Many of them retreated into holes and corners, and two hours elapsed before they were all driven out, but though the chase was hot, it was cold enough work for the half-clad men. Sailors use quaint expressions. The nightly foraging expeditions are called sorties. They point out to me the various corners between decks where the ice corrodes, i.e. the moisture condenses and forms frost. A ramble over the ice is called a bit of a peruse. I presume this indignity is offered to the word perambulation. There was a very sudden call to arms tonight. Whether sleeping, prosing, or schooling, everyone flew out upon the ice on the instant, as if the magazine or the boiler was on the point of explosion. The alarm of a bear close to fighting with the dogs was the cause. The luckless beast had approached within twenty-five yards of the ship ere the quartermaster's eye detected his indistinct outline against the snow. So silently had he crept up that he was within ten yards of some of the dogs. A shout started them up, and they at once flew round the bear and embarrassed his retreat. In crossing some very thin ice he broke through, and there I found him surrounded by yelping dogs. Poor fellow! Hobson, Young and Peterson had each lodged a bullet in him, but these only seemed to increase his rage. He succeeded in getting out of the water, when, fearing harm to the numerous bystanders and dogs, or that he might escape, I fired, and luckily the bullet passed through his brain. He proved to be a full-grown male, seven feet three inches in length. As we all aided in the capture, it was decided that the skin should be offered to Lady Franklin. The carcass will feed our dogs for nearly a month, they were rewarded on the spot with the offal. All of them, however, had not shown equal pluck. Some ran off in evident fright, but others showed no symptom of fear, plunging or falling into the water with Bruin. Poor old Sophie was amongst the latter, and received a deep cut in her shoulder from one of his claws. The authorities have prescribed double allowance of food for her, and say she will soon recover. For the few moments of its duration the chase and death was exciting, and how strange and novel the scene, a misty moon affording but scanty light, dark figures gliding singly about, not daring to approach each other, for the ice trembled under their feet, the enraged bear, the wolfish howling dogs, and the bright flashes of the deadly rifles. Third, I remained up the greater part of last night taking observations, for the evening mists had passed away and a lovely moon reigned over a calm enchanting night. Through a powerful telescope she resembled a huge frosted silver melon, the large crater-like depression answering to that part from which the food stalk had been detached. Not a sound to break the stillness around, excepting when some hungry dog would return to the battlefield to gnaw into the blood-stained ice. On the first, the sun paid us his last visit for the year, and now we take all our meals by lamplight. Fifth, in order to vary our monotonous routine, we decided to celebrate the day. Extra grog was issued to the crew, and also for the first time, a proportion of preserved plum pudding. Lady Franklin most thoughtfully and kindly sent it on board for occasional use. It is excellent. This evening, a well-got-up procession sallied forth, marched round the ship with drum, gong and discord, and then proceeded to burn the effigy of Guy Fawkes. Their blackened faces, extravagant costumes, flaring torches and savage yells frightened away all the dogs. Nor was it until after the fireworks were set off and the traitor consumed that they crept back again. It was school night, but the men were up for fun, so gave the doctor a holiday. Twelfth. 
Yesterday I had the good fortune to shoot two seals. They were very fat and their stomachs were filled with shrimps. Today Young and Peterson shot three more, and many others have been seen. This is cheering and entices people out for hours daily. There is just enough movement in the ice to keep a few narrow lanes and small pools of water open. The floes or fields of ice are more inclined to spread out from each other than to close. We have latterly been drifting before northerly winds. 16th. A renewal of ice crushing within a few hundred yards of us. I can hear it in my bed. The ordinary sound resembles the roar of distant surf breaking heavily and continuously, but when heavy masses come in collision with much impetus, it fully realises the justness of Dr. Kane's descriptive epithet, ice artillery. Fortunately for us, our poor little fox is well within the margin of a stout old floe. We are therefore undisturbed spectators of ice conflicts, which would be irresistible to anything of human construction. Immediately about the ship all is still, and, as far as appearances go, she is precisely as she would be in a secure harbour, housed all over, banked up with snow to her gunwales. In fact, her winter plumage is so complete that the masts alone are visible. The deck and now the useless skylights are covered with hard snow. Below hatches we are warm and dry. All are in excellent health and spirits, looking forward to an active campaign next winter. God grant it may be realised. Yesterday, Young shot the 50th seal, an event duly celebrated by our drinking the bottle of champagne which had been set apart in more hopeful times to be drunk on reaching the north water. That unhappy failure the more keenly felt from being so very unexpected. Peterson saw and fired a shot into a narwhal, which brought the blubber out. When most arctic creatures are wounded in the water, blubber more frequently than blood appears, particularly if the wound is superficial. It spreads over the surface of the water like oil. Bills of fare vary much, even in Greenland. I have inquired of Peterson, and he tells me that the Greenland Eskimo, there are many Greenlanders of Danish origin, are not agreed as to which of their animals affords the most delicious food. Some of them prefer reindeer venison, others think more favourably of a young dog, the flesh of which he asserts is just like the beef of sheep. He says a Danish captain, who had acquired the taste, provided some for his guests, and they praised his mutton. After dinner he sent for the skin of the animal, which was no other than a large red dog. This occurred in Greenland, where his Danish guests had resided for many years, far removed from European mutton. Baked puppy is a real delicacy all over Polynesia. At the Sandwich Islands I was once invited to a feast, and had to feign disappointment as well as I could when told that puppy was so extremely scarce it could not be procured in time, and therefore sucking pig was substituted. 19th. A heavy southerly gale has increased the ice movements. Happily we are undisturbed. As Young was seated under the lee of a hummock, watching for seals to pop up to breathe, the strong ice under him suddenly cracked and separated. He escaped with a ducking, and was just able to reach his gun from the bank ere it sank through the mixture of snow and water. Yesterday we were all out. I saw only one seal, but was refreshed by the sight of a dozen narwhals. It is a positive treat to see a living creature of any kind. The only birds which remain are dovekies, but they are scarce, and being white are rarely visible. The dogs are fed every second day, when two pounds of seal flesh, previously thawed when possible, is given to each. The weaker ones get additional food, and they all pick up whatever scraps are thrown out. This is enough to sustain, but not to satisfy them, so they are continually on the lookout for anything eatable. Hobson made one very happy without intending it. He meant only to give him a kick, but his slipper, being down at heel, flew off, and away went the lucky dog in triumph with the prize, which of course was no more seen. Two large icebergs drift in company with us. Our relative positions have remained pretty nearly the same for the last month. 23rd. A heavy gale commenced at northeast on the 21st, and continued for 36 hours unabated in force, but changed in direction to south-southwest. It appears to have been a revolving storm moving to the northwest. Yesterday, as the wind approached southeast, the temperature rose to plus 32 degrees. The upper deck sloppy, the lower deck temperature during divine service was 75 degrees. As the wind veered round to the south-southwest, the wind moderated and the temperature fell. This evening it is minus 7 degrees. How is it that the southeast wind has brought us such very high temperature? Even if it traversed an unfrozen sea, it could not have derived from thence a higher temperature than 29 degrees. Has it swept across Greenland, that vast superficies partly enveloped in glacier, partly in snow? No, it must have been born in the higher regions of the atmosphere from the far south, in order to mitigate the severity of this northern climate. Peterson tells me that the same warm southeast wind suddenly sweeps over Upernivik in midwinter, bringing with it abundance of rain, and that it always shifts to the southwest, and then the temperature rapidly falls. This is precisely the change we have experienced in latitude 75 degrees. 
I believe a somewhat similar but less remarkable change of temperature was noticed in Smith Sound, latitude 78 and 3 quarters degrees north. 25th. Mild Madeira weather, as Hobson calls it. Temperature up to plus 7 degrees. By my desire, Dr. Walker is occupied in making every possible experiment upon the freezing of salt water. The first crop of ice is salt, the second less so, the third produces drinkable water, and the fourth is fresh. Frosty efflorescence appears upon the ice formed at low temperatures in calm weather. It is brine expressed by the act of freezing. We need not wonder that dogs, when driven hard over this ice, which soon cuts their feet, suffer intense pain and often fall down in fits, nor that snow, falling upon young sea ice, wholly or partially thaws, even when the temperature is but little above zero. When near the freezing point, the young ice thus coated over becomes sludgy and unsafe. 29th. Keen, biting northwest winds. No cracks in the ice, therefore no seals. Grey dawn at ten o'clock, and dark at two. The moon is everywhere the sailor's friend. She is a source of comfort to us here. Nothing to excite conversation, except an occasional inroad of the dogs in search of food. This generally occurs at night. Whenever the deck light, which burns under the housing, happens to go out, they scale the steep snow banking and rush around the deck like wolves. Why, bless you, sir, the wary moment that the light goes out and the quartermaster turns his back, they makes a regular sortie, and in they all comes. But where do they come in, Harvey? Where, sir? Why, everywheres. They makes no more to do, but in they comes, clean all over. Not long ago, old Harvey was chief quartermaster in a line of battleship, and a regular magnet to all the younger midshipmen. He would spin them yarns by the hour during the night watches about the wonders of the sea, and of the Arctic regions in particular, its bears, its icebergs, and its still more terrific auroras roaring and flashing about the ship enough to frighten a fellow. 30th. Severe cold has arrived with the full moon. Eight days ago the thermometer stood at the freezing point. It is now 64 degrees below it. So dark is it now that I was able to observe an eclipse of Jupiter's first satellite before three o'clock today. For the last two months we have drifted freely backwards and forwards before northwest and southeast winds. Each time we have gained a more offshore position, being gradually separated further and further from the land by fresh growths of ice, which invariably follow up every ice movement. In this manner we have been thrust out to the southwest, eighty miles from the nearest land, and into that free space which in autumn was open water, and which we then vainly struggle to reach. That the ice has been most free to move in this direction is additional evidence of the relative proximity of an open sea and shows that in all probability, I had almost said certainty, we should have sailed, or at least drifted into it, had it not been for those enemies to all progress, the grounded bergs. End of chapter 4。Chapter 5 of In the Arctic Seas。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. In the Arctic Seas by Captain F. L. McClintock Chapter 5 4th December I have just returned on board from the performance of the most solemn duty a commander can be called upon to fulfil. A funeral at sea is always peculiarly impressive, but this evening at seven o'clock, as we gathered around the sad remains of poor Scott reposing under a Union Jack, and read the burial service by the light of lanterns, the effect could not fail to awaken very serious emotions. The greater part of the church service was read on board, under the shelter of the housing. The body was then placed upon a sledge, and drawn by the messmates of the deceased to a short distance from the ship, where a hole through the ice had been cut. It was then committed to the deep, and the service completed. What a scene it was! I shall never forget it. The lonely fox, almost buried in snow, completely isolated from the habitable world, her colours half-mast high, and bell mournfully tolling, our little procession slowly marching over the rough surface of the frozen sea, guided by lanterns and direction posts amid the dark and dreary depth of Arctic winter. The death-like stillness, the intense cold, and the threatening aspect of a murky overcast sky, and all this heightened by one of those strange lunar phenomena which are but seldom seen even here, a complete halo encircling the moon, through which passed a horizontal band of pale light that encompassed the heavens. Above the moon appeared the segments of two other halos, and there were also mock moons, or paraselenae, to the number of six. The misty atmosphere lent a very ghastly hue to this singular display, which lasted for rather more than an hour. Poor Scott fell down a hatchway two days only before his death, which was occasioned by the internal injuries then received. He was a steady, serious man. A widow and family will mourn his loss. He was our engine driver. We cannot replace him, 
therefore the whole duty of working the engines will devolve upon the engineer, Mr. Brand. 11th. Calm, clear weather, pleasant for exercise, but steadily cold. Thermometer varies between minus 20 degrees and minus 30 degrees. At noon, the blush of dawn tints the southern horizon. To the north, the sky remains inky blue. Whilst overhead it is bright and clear, the star shining and the pole star near the zenith very distinct. Although there is a light north wind, thin mackerel clouds are passing from south to north, and the temperature has risen 10 degrees. I have been questioning Peterson about the bones of the muskox found in Smith Sound. He says the decayed skulls of about 20 were found, all of them to the north of the 79th parallel. As they were all without lower jaws, he says they were killed by Eskimo, who leave upon the spot the skulls of large animals, but the weight of the lower jaw being so trifling, it is allowed to remain attached to the flesh and tongue. The skull of a muskox, with its massive horns, cannot weigh less than 30 pounds. Although it has been abundantly proved by the existence of raised beaches and fossils that the shores of Smith Sound have been elevated within a comparatively recent geological period, yet Peterson tells me that there exist numerous ruins of Eskimo buildings, probably one or two centuries old, all of which are situated upon very low points, only just sufficiently raised above the reach of the sea, such sites in fact as would at present be selected by the natives. These ruins show that no perceptible change has taken place in the relative level of sea and land since they were originally constructed. At Peterson's Greenland home, Upanivik, the land has sunk, as is plainly shown by similar ruins over which the tides now flow. Anything which illustrates the habits of animals in such extremely high latitudes, I think, is most interesting. Their instincts must be quickened in proportion as the difficulty of subsisting increases. Foxes white and blue are very numerous. All the birds are merely summer visitors, therefore the hare is the only creature remaining upon which foxes can prey. But the hares are comparatively scarce. How then do the foxes live for eight months of each year? Peterson thinks they store up provisions during the summer in various holes and crevices, and thus manage to eke out an existence during the dark winter season. He once saw a fox carry off eggs in his mouth from an eider duck's nest, one at a time until the hole were removed, and in winter he has observed a fox scratch a hole down through very deep snow to a cache of eggs beneath. The men are exercised at building snow huts. For winter or early spring travelling this knowledge is almost indispensable. Upon a calm day, the temperature of the external air being minus 33 degrees, within a snow hut the thermometer stood 17 degrees higher, this important difference being due to the transmission of heat through the ice from the sea beneath. Evaporation goes on through the ice from the water underneath it. The interior of each snow hut is coated with crystals, and the ice upon which the huts are built is four feet thick, but when no longer in contact with water, I cannot discover any evaporation from ice. For instance, a canvas screen on deck which became wet by the sudden thaw last month still remains frozen stiff. 14th. Of late there has been much damp upon the lower deck. This has now been remedied by enclosing the hatchway within a commodious snow porch, which serves as a condenser for the steam and vapour from the inhabited deck below. 19th. Light northwest winds with occasional mists. The temperature is comparatively mild, minus 12 degrees to minus 25 degrees. It is now the time of spring tides. They cause numerous cracks in the ice, but why so, at such great distance from the land, I cannot explain. The three nearest points of land are respectively 110, 140, and 180 miles distant from us. Much aurora during the last two days. Yesterday morning it was visible until eclipsed by the day dawn at 10 o'clock. Although we could no longer see it, I do not think it ceased. Very thin clouds occupied its place, through which, as through the aurora, stars appeared scarcely dimmed in lustre. I do not imagine that aurora is ever visible in a perfectly clear atmosphere. I often observe it just silvering or rendering luminous the upper edge of low fog or cloud banks, and with a few vertical rays feebly vibrating. Last evening Dr. Walker called me to witness his success with the electrometer. The electric current was so very weak that the gold leaves diverged at regular intervals of four or five seconds. Some hours afterwards it was strong enough to keep them diverged. 21st. Midwinter day. Out of the Arctic regions it is better known as the shortest day. At noon we could just read type similar to the leading article of the Times. Few people could read more than two or three lines without their eyes aching. 27th. Our Christmas was a very cheerful, merry one. The men were supplied with several additional articles, such as hams, plum puddings, preserved gooseberries and apples, nuts, sweetmeats and Burton ale. After divine service they decorated the lower deck with flags and made an immense display of food. The officers came down with me to see their preparations. We were really astonished. 
The mess tables were laid out like the counters in a confectioner's shop, with apple and gooseberry tarts, plum and sponge cakes in pyramids, besides various other unknown puffs, cakes and loaves of all sizes and shapes. We bake all our own bread, and excellent it is. In the background were nicely browned hams, meat pies, cheeses and other substantial articles. Rum and water in wine glasses and plum cake were handed to us. We wished them a happy Christmas and complimented them on their taste and spirit in getting up such a display. Our silken sledge banners had been borrowed for the occasion and were regarded with deference and peculiar pride. In the evening the officers were enticed down amongst the men again, and at a late hour I was requested as a great favour to come down and see how much they were enjoying themselves. I found them in the highest good humour with themselves and all the world. They were perfectly sober and singing songs, each in his turn. I expressed great satisfaction at having seen them enjoying themselves so much and so rationally. I could therefore the better describe it to Lady Franklin, who was so deeply interested in everything relating to them. I drank their healths, and hoped our position next year would be more suitable for our purpose. We all joined in drinking the healths of Lady Franklin and Miss Craycroft, and amid the acclamations which followed, I returned to my cabin, immensely gratified by such an exhibition of genuine good feeling, such veneration for Lady Franklin, and such loyalty to the cause of the expedition. It was very pleasant also that they had taken the most cheering view of our future prospects. I verily believe I was the happiest individual on board that happy evening. Our Christmas box has come in the shape of northerly winds, which bid fair to drift us southward towards those latitudes wherein we hope for liberation next spring from this icy bondage. 28th. We have been in expectation of a gale all day. This evening there is still a doubtful sort of truce amongst the elements. Barometer down to 28.83, thermometer up to plus 5 degrees, although the wind has been strong and steady from the north for 24 hours. Low scud flying from the east, snow constantly falling. An hour ago the wind suddenly changed to south-south-east. The snowing has ceased, thermometer falls and barometer rises. 2nd January, 1858. New Year's Day was the second edition of Christmas and quite as pleasantly spent. We dwelt much upon the anticipations of the future, being a more agreeable theme than the failure of the past. I confess to a hearty welcome for the new year, anxious of course that we may escape uninjured and sufficiently early to pursue the object of our voyage. Exactly at midnight on the 31st of December, the arrival of the new year was announced to me by our band, two flutes and an accordion, striking up at my door. There was also a procession, or perhaps I should say a continuation of the band. These performers were grotesquely attired and armed with frying pans, gridirons, kettles, pots and pans, with which to join in and add to the effect of the other music. We have a very level hard walk alongside the ship. It is narrowed to two or three yards in width by a snowbank four feet high. In the face of this bank some twenty-five holes have been excavated for the dogs, and in them they spend most of their time. It looks very formidable in the moonlight, being a good imitation of a casemated battery. After our rubber of whist on New Year's night, Peterson related to us some of his dreadful sufferings when with the party which had left Dr. Kane. They spent the months of October and November in Booth Sound, latitude 77 degrees, all that time upon the verge of starvation, unable to advance or retreat. For these two months they had no other fuel than their small cedar boat, the smoke of which was not endurable in their wretched hut, and without light, for the sun left them in October, unless we accept one inch and a half of taper daily, which they made out of a lump of beeswax that accidentally found its way into their boat before leaving the ship. In December they regained their vessel. I am surprised that no account of the extreme hardships of this party, so far exceeding that of their shipmates on board, has ever appeared, and I regret it, as I believe they owed their lives to the experience and fidelity of their interpreter Peterson. At first the Eskimo assisted them, Latterly they were quite unable to do so, and became anxious to get rid of their visitors. Observing how weakened they had become, the Eskimo endeavoured to separate them from their guns and from each other, and even used threatening language. During December we drifted 67 miles, directly down Baffin's Bay towards the Atlantic, and are now in latitude 74 degrees. Although it is quite impossible to discriminate between the several influences which probably govern our movements, or to ascertain how much is due to each of them, such as the relative positions of the ice, land and open water, winds, currents and earth's rotation, yet it appears in the present instance that the wind is almost the sole agent in hastening this vast continent of ice towards the latitudes of dissolution. We move before the wind in proportion to its strength, we remain stationary in calm weather. Neither surface nor submarine current has been detected. The large icebergs obey the same influences as the surface ice. We have noticed a slight set to the westward. It is not likely to be produced by current, and may be the result of the earth's motion from west to east. Sixth many lanes of water. A seal has been seen, the only one for six weeks. 
Of the old ice which so closely hemmed us in up to the middle of September, there is hardly any within several miles of us, except the large floe piece we are frozen to. Every crack or lane which opens is quickly covered with young ice, so that it cannot close again, and in this manner the old ice has been spread out. I rejoice in its dispersion. Today I put a tumbler full of our strong ale, Allsops, on deck to freeze. This was soon effected, the temperature being minus 35 degrees. After bringing it below, and when its temperature had risen to 17 degrees, it was almost all thawed. At 22 degrees it was completely so. It looked muddy, but settled after standing for a couple of hours, when I drank it off, in every way satisfied with my experiment and my beer. It seemed none the worse for its freezing, but rather flat from its long exposure in a tumbler. 17th. Northerly winds blow almost constantly. We have drifted 60 miles since the first, and are now only 115 miles from Upanivik, once more upon confines of the habitable world. Good light for three hours daily. All this is cheering. We continue our snow hut practice, and can build one in three quarters of an hour. 28th. The upper edge of the sun appeared above the horizon today after an absence of 89 days. It was a gladdening sight. I sent for the ship's steward and asked what was the custom on such occasions. To hoist the colours and serve out an extra half gill, sir, was the ready reply. Accordingly, the Harwich lion soon fluttered in a breeze cool enough to stiffen the limbs of ordinary lions, and in the evening the grog was issued. 30th. Our mess-made pussy is unwell and won't eat. In vain has Hobson tempted her with raw seal's flesh, preserved salmon, preserved milk, etc. At length, castor oil was forcibly administered. Puss is a great favourite. Our finest dog, Sultan, is also sick, and his coat is in bad order. Blubber has been prescribed for him. And poor old Mary has fits, not uncommon after the long winter. Peterson immediately ordered her to be bled by slitting her ear. But Christian, in his fright and haste, cropped the tip of it off. These comprise our only medical cases. A dove key in its white winter plumage and two seals have been seen lately. 15th February. The returning daylight cheers us up wonderfully. Not that we were suffering, either mentally or bodily, but the change is most agreeable. We can take much longer walks than were possible during the dark period. The men have been supplied with muskets and go out sporting as ardently as schoolboys. I took a long walk towards one of our iceberg companions, but could not quite reach it as weak ice intervened, each step producing an undulation. Finding the point of my knife went through it with but very slight resistance, I gave up the attempt and turned back. The ship's masts were scarcely visible in the distance. Almost the whole of the intervening ice was of this winter's growth, and in many places much crushed up. Daylight reveals to us evidences of vast ice movements having taken place during the dark months when we fancied all was still and quiet and now we see how greatly we have been favoured, what innumerable chances of destruction we have unconsciously escaped. A few days ago the ice suddenly cracked within ten yards of the ship, and gave her such a smart shock that everyone rushed on deck with astonishing alacrity. One of these sudden disruptions occurred between me and the ship when I was returning from the iceberg. The sun was just setting as I found myself cut off. Had I been on the other side, I would have loitered to enjoy a refreshing gaze upon this dark streak of water. But after a smart run of a mile along its edge, and finding no place to cross, visions of a patrol on the floe for the long night of fifteen hours began to obtrude themselves. At length I reached a place where the jagged edges of the floes met, so crossed and got safely on board. Nothing was seen during this walk of nearly twenty-five miles except one seal. Recent gales have drifted us rapidly southward. Cracks and lanes are very numerous. On the first, a blue or sooty fox was shot. Although 130 miles from the nearest land, he was very fat. Hence we argued dove keys were much more numerous during winter than we supposed. We have often noticed the tracks of foxes following up those of the bears, probably for discarded scraps of the seals upon which they prey. Hobson's favourite dog, Chummy, has returned, after an absence of six days, decidedly hungry, but he can hardly have been without food all that time. Some fox may have lured him off. He evinced great delight at getting back, devoted his first attentions to a hearty meal, then rubbed himself up against his own particular associates, after which he sought out and attacked the weakest of his enemies, and, soothed by their howlings, coiled himself up for a long sleep. 1st March. February has been a remarkably mild, cloudy, windy month. The winter temperature may be said to have passed away by the 10th, the average temperature for the first 10 days being minus 25 degrees, whilst for the remainder of the month it was minus 11 degrees. Had one fallen asleep for a month at least, he could not reasonably have expected to find a greater change on awakening. Our drift has also been great, 166 miles. We are south of the 70th parallel, and may soon be expelled from our icy home. On the 24th there was a fearful gale of wind. 
Had not our housing been very well secured, it must have been blown away. We are preparing for sea, removing the snow from off the deck and round the ship. Our skylights have been dug out, in winter they are always covered with a thick layer of snow, and the flood of light which beams down through them is quite charming. How intolerably sooty and smoke-dried everything looks. On the 27th, the first seal of this year was shot. It came in good time, for the 51 seals shot in autumn were finished only two days before. Our English supply of dog's food therefore remains almost untouched. Snow was observed to melt against the ship's side exposed to the sun, the thermometer in the shade standing at minus 22 degrees. A very fine dog has died from eating a quantity of salt fish, which he managed to get at, although it was supposed to be quite out of his reach. One of the two large icebergs which commenced this voyage with us last October, in 75 and a half degrees north, has drifted out of sight to the southeast. The other one is far off in the northwest. I attribute these increased distances solely to the spreading abroad of the intervening ice. When we were far north, and probably drifting more slowly than the ice in the stream of Lancaster Sound to the westward of us, the ship's head turned very gradually from right to left, from north-northwest to west. When about the parallel of 72 degrees north, we supposed ourselves to be drifting faster than the western ice. In this, as in the previous case, comparing our drift with that of Lieutenant de Haven, the ship's head slowly shifted back to the right as far as west-northwest. Latterly it has not changed at all. We are in a narrower part of Davis Strait, where the winds probably blow with equal force from shore to shore, and drift the whole pack at a uniform rate. 5th. On the 2nd, four fat seals and some dovekies were shot. The largest seal weighed 170 pounds, the smallest 150 pounds. They were males of the species Phoca hispida, or Phoca fetida, the latter epithet being by far the most appropriate at this season. The disagreeable odour resembles garlic, and taints the whole animal so strongly that even Eskimo are nearly overpowered by it. This is almost the only description of seal we have obtained, but the females are at all seasons free from fetter. Several long lanes of water extend at right angles to the straits. The doctor has taken a photograph of the ship by the albumen process on glass. The temperature at the time was below zero. Upon the third and fourth, a well-remarked revolving storm passed nearly over us to the west-northwest. Its extreme diameter was 30 hours, that of the strength of the gale 18 hours. Its centre probably passed about one-tenth of its diameter to the southwest. The barometer was rather high, having risen just before the wind commenced at northeast but it now fell half an inch in ten hours, and continued to fall until the wind shifted, almost suddenly, through south-east to south-south-west. Immediately the barometer got up rapidly. As the barometer fell, the temperature rose from zero to plus eighteen degrees, and fell again after the change of wind. This violent storm brought with it a smart hail shower. The depression of the ice about the bows, in consequence of a vast accumulation of snowdrift upon it, brought the ship down by the head considerably. Today this ice suddenly detached itself, and the fore part of the vessel sprang up. She still remains frozen and held down abaft. The snow banking looks very woebegone after this ice quake. It inclines out from the ship, and in many places has been prostrated by the shock. Early on the morning of the 7th, the high land of Disco was seen. Its distance was upwards of 90 miles. End of chapter 5「Chapter Six of In the Arctic Seas. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. In the Arctic Seas by Captain F. L. McClintock. Chapter Six. Ninth March. A bear was seen this morning, but as he was going away from us, the dogs were brought out in the hope that they might keep him at bay until the sportsmen came up. It was very pretty to see them take up the scent. The moment they caught sight of him they set off at full speed. Bruin had seen them first and increased his pace to a clumsy gallop, yet the dogs were soon around him. He seemed to care but little about them, steadily making off and following the trending from a recently frozen crack in search of clear water, evidently aware that his persecutors would not follow him there. After five hours all returned on board again. Out of the ten dogs, four were wounded by his claws, skin deep only, but one of the wounds was seven inches in length, as if made with a sharp knife. This was sewed up, the others were merely trimmed, and nature, I am informed, will do all the rest. It is really wonderful what cures nature and instinct effect. Notwithstanding the extreme cold, no external dressings are applied, because the animal must not be prevented from licking its wound. Peterson says this bear must be very thin, else he could not run so fast. 
I think it very probable that he has been hunted before, and that fear lent him wings. A black whale has been seen. 11th. Two small seals, free from taint, were shot yesterday, so he had fried liver and steaks before breakfast this morning. Both were good, but the steaks were preferred. They were very dark and very tender, had been cut thin, deprived of all fat, and washed in two or three waters to get rid of the blubber. 16th. Several long lanes of water have again opened, but now all of them extend parallel to the direction of the straits. One lane passed within 120 yards of the ship. Its extremes are not visible even from aloft. The ice upon its east side has a more rapidly southern motion than that upon its west side. 18th. Last night the ice closed, shutting up our lane, but its opposite sides continue for several hours to move past each other, rubbing off all projections, crushing and forcing out water masses four feet thick. Although 120 yards distant, this pressure shook the ship and cracked the intervening ice. I went out with a lantern to see the nip. It was certainly awe-inspiring. No one in his senses could avoid reflecting upon the inevitable fate of a ship if exposed to such fearful pressure. It is now spring tides. 19th. All yesterday the lane remained open. In the evening it closed with but slight pressure. Yet, as the opposing fields of ice continued to move in opposite directions, all jagged points were brushed off, and the debris thus formed between their edges presented a heaving surface of ice masses, an ice river. On the separation of the flows, mass after mass forced itself up to the surface, until at length all the submerged ice had risen, except such as had been forced quite under the edges. One seldom meets with a cleanly fractured flow edge. They are usually fringed with crushed up ice or newly formed sludge. 23rd. Seals and dovekies are now common. The latter have already made considerable advances towards their summer plumage. Yesterday there was a very heavy southeast gale. It blew so furiously, and the snowdrift was so dense, that we could neither hear nor see what was going on twenty yards off. At night the ship, becoming suddenly detached from the ice, heeled over to the storm. Until the cause was ascertained we thought the ice had broken up and pressed against the ship. It was not so, but when the weather moderated we found that there had been heavy pressure upon the edge of the floes. So much indeed that the lane of water was now within seventy yards of the fox, and that ice four and a half feet thick had been crushed during the storm for a distance of about fifty yards. 25th. Strong northwest winds lately. The ship is rocking to the breeze and rubbing her poor sides against the ice, producing a creaking sound which is far from pleasant. More ice squeezing and further inroad upon our barrier. It has yielded slightly, nipping the ship, inclining her to port and lifting her stern about a foot. Occasional groanings within and surgings of the ice without. Our boats, provisions, sledges, knapsacks and equipment are ready for a hasty departure. Beyond this we can do nothing. As long as our friendly barrier lasts, we need not fear. But who can tell the moment it may be demolished and the ship exposed to destruction? I am scribbling within a foot of the stern post. In fact, there is a notch in my table to receive it, and I sympathise with its constant groanings. The ice allows it no rest. 27th. Strong northwest gale with a return of cold weather. We have drifted 39 miles in the last 48 hours. The lane is open, the whole pack appears to have plenty of room to drift, and, I am happy to add, is taking advantage of it, so much so that the smaller pieces floating freely in the lane can hardly go at the same pace. Our remaining winter companion, the iceberg, was in sight a few days ago, far away to the northwest. It may still be visible from aloft, but these March gales cut so keenly that the crow's nest is but seldom visited. 31st. Another northwest gale. It is also spring tides, and this conjunction makes one fearful of ice movement and pressure but it seems as if the pack had more room to move in, as it does not close much. Seals are often shot, bear tracks are common, and narwhals are frequently seen migrating northward. The bears must prefer the night time for wandering about, else we could not help seeing them. We often find their tracks within a few hundred yards of the ship. Although the last, yet this is the coldest day of the month, the thermometer down to minus 27 degrees. The mean temperature for March has been unusually high, minus 3 degrees, whilst Lieutenant de Havens was minus 17 degrees. Notwithstanding that heavy southeast gales have three times driven us backward, yet we have advanced 100 miles further down Davis Straits. 6th April. Today we enjoy fine weather, the more so since it comes after a tremendous northerly gale of 48 hours duration. Two days ago the friendly old flow, so long our bulwark of defence, was cracked. The lane of water thus formed soon widened to 60 yards, passed within 30 yards of the fox and cut off three of our boats. Yesterday morning another crack detached the remaining thirty yards from us, and as it widened the ship swung across the opening. 
As quickly as we could effect it, the ship was again placed alongside the ice and within a projecting point. Had it closed only a few feet while she lay across the lane, the consequences must have been very serious. Even to effect this slight change of position we were fully occupied for four hours, for the gale blew furiously and the thermometer stood at twelve degrees below zero, and the cold was very much felt. Our hawsers were frozen so stiff as to be quite unmanageable, and we were obliged to use the chain cables to warp the ship into safety. Throughout yesterday the wind continued extremely strong and keen. Fortunately the ice remained perfectly still. Our funnels refused to draw up the smoke, so that between the suffocation, the cold, and anxiety lest the ice should move, our Easter Monday was sufficiently miserable. The half of our poor dogs were cut off from the ship by the lane, and continued to howl dismally until late, when the new ice over the lane was strong enough to bear them, and they came across to us. Today we have recovered the boats, shot four seals, seen two whales, and much water to the eastward. We are in latitude 67 degrees, 18 minutes north, and highly delighted with the rapidity of our southern drift. 10th. Yesterday evening the setting sun rendered visible the western land, probably Cape Dyer. We have drifted 70 miles in the last week, and are only 18 miles from De Haven's position of escape, but as we are two months earlier, we must be expected to be carried farther south. 12th. This morning we drifted ingloriously out of the Arctic regions, and with what very different feelings from those with which we crossed the Arctic Circle eight months ago. However, we have not done with it yet. Directly the ice lets us go, we will, DV, re-enter the frigid zone, and try again, with, I trust, better success. A gull and a few terns appear today. These are the first of our summer visitors. The temperature improves. Yesterday at one o'clock it was plus 19 degrees in the shade, plus 15 degrees in the crow's nest 70 feet high, and plus 51 degrees against the black surface exposed to the sun. 16th. Last night a bear came to the ship, was wounded but escaped. Today the tracks were followed up for three miles, the bear found and again wounded. Finally the unlucky beast was shot in the water seven miles from the ship. It was lost in the consequence of the rapid drifting of ice, which ran over the floating carcass. Tonight a dense fog bank rests upon the water to the southward. Its upper edge is illuminated by aurora, showing a faint tremulous light. 17th. Another northerly gale. Holding fast to the ice with three hawsers, snowdrift limits the view to a couple of miles, so all to the eastward appears water, and to the westward, ice. Last night the ice opened considerably. To secure the ship occupied us for six hours. Several of the dogs were again cut off. As the ice they were on was rapidly drifting away, I sent a boat to recover them. It was a difficult and hazardous business, but at length the boat and dogs returned in safety, to my great relief, for it was both dark and late. 18th. Yesterday morning when I wrote up my journal, I was hoping to hold on quietly to the flow edge until the wind moderated, when with clear weather we could take advantage of the openings and make some progress towards the clear sea. We were unable to hold on, for the flow edge broke away, setting us adrift. Some time was occupied in fetching off the boats and dogs. Five of the latter, unfortunately, would not allow themselves to be caught. As speedily as possible, the rudder was shipped and sail set, and before three o'clock the ship was running fast to the eastward. During the night the ice closed, and at daylight scarcely any water was visible. With the exception of a couple of icebergs, all the ice in sight was not more than two days old. It mainly owns its origin and rapid growth to the immense quantities of snow blown off the pack. It still blows hard, and the thermometer stands at 11 degrees. A sudden opening of the ice this forenoon allowed us to run a few miles southward, and then it closed again. We are now surrounded by young ice. 20th. We have been carried rapidly past the position where the Arctic discovery ship Resolute was picked up. Yesterday, three bears, a fulmar petrel, and a snow bunting were seen. Today a fine bear came within 150 yards and was shot by our sportsmen. As they were standing round it afterwards upon the ice, a small seal, the only one seen for several days, popped up its head as if to exult over its fallen enemy. It was, of course, instantly shot. We have learnt to esteem the seal's liver for breakfast very highly. It seems hardly right to call polar bears land animals. They abound here, 110 geographical miles from the nearest land, upon very loose broken-up ice, which is steadily drifting into the Atlantic at the rate of 12 or 14 miles daily. To remain upon it would ensure their destruction were they not nearly amphibious. They hunt by scent, and are constantly running across and against the wind, which prevails from the northward, so that same instinct which directs their search for prey also serves the important purpose of guiding them in the direction of the land and more solid ice. I remarked that the upper part of both Bruin's forepaws were rubbed quite bare. 
Peterson explains that to surprise the seal, a bear crouches down with his forepaws doubled underneath, and pushes himself noiselessly forward with his hinder legs until within a few yards, when he springs upon the unsuspecting victim, whether in the water or upon the ice. The Greenlanders are fond of bear's flesh, but never eat either the heart or the liver, and say that these parts cause sickness. No instance is known of Greenland bears attacking men, except when wounded or provoked. They never disturb the Eskimo graves, although they seldom fail to rob a cache of seal's flesh, which is a similar construction of loose stones above ground. A native of Upanivik, one dark winter's day, was out visiting his seal nets. He found a seal entangled, and, whilst kneeling down over it upon the ice to get it clear, he received a slap on the back, from his companion as he supposed, but a second and heavier blow made him look smartly round. He was horror-stricken to see a peculiarly grim old bear instead of his comrade. Without deigning further notice of the man, Bruin tore the seal out of the net and commenced his supper. He was not interrupted, nor did the man wait to see the meal finished. I had long ago resolved, if we escaped before the 15th or the 20th April at the latest, to go to Newfoundland to refresh the crew and to refit, even if no damage from the ice should be sustained. In order to do so, it would have been necessary for us to visit a Greenland port for a supply of water. We could not have calculated much upon the assistance from our engines upon such a voyage, Mr. Brand alone being capable of working the engines, so that ten or twelve hours daily is all the steaming that could have been expected. But we are still ice-locked, so I purpose going to Holstenborg in preference to a more southern port, as there we may expect to get reindeer and a small supply of stores suitable to our wants. The whalers sometimes reach Disco in March, Upanivik in May, and the North Water early in June. Unless we should at once be set free, we would not have time to spare for a Newfoundland voyage. 24th. Another anxious week has passed. Latterly we have experienced southwesterly currents similar to those which Parry describes when beset here in June 1819. Today we have had a strong southeast breeze with snow and dark weather. The wind had already greatly moderated when the swell reached us at 8 o'clock this evening. It is now 10 o'clock. The long ocean swell already lifts its crest five feet above the hollow of the sea, causing its thick covering of icy fragments to dash against each other and against us with unpleasant violence. It is, however, very beautiful to look upon, the dear old familiar ocean swell. It has long been a stranger to us, and is welcome in our solitude. If the fox was as solid as her neighbours, I am quite sure she would enter into this ice tournament with all their apparent heartiness, instead of audibly making known her sufferings to us. Every considerable surface of ice has been broken into many smaller ones, with feelings of exultation I watched the process from aloft. A flow piece near us, of one hundred yards in diameter, was speedily cracked so as to resemble a sort of labyrinth, or, still more, a field spider's web. In the course of half an hour the family resemblance was totally lost. They had so battered each other and struggled out of their original regularity. The rolling sea can no longer be checked. The pack has taken upon itself the functions of an ocean, as Dr. Kane graphically expresses it. 26th. At Sea. How am I to describe the events of the last two days? It has pleased God to accord us with a deliverance in which his merciful protection contrasts how strongly with our own utter helplessness, as if the successive mercies vouchsafed to us during our long, long winter and mysterious ice drift had been concentrated and repeated in a single act. Thus forcibly does his great goodness come home to the mind. I am in no humour for writing, being still tired, seedy, and perhaps a little seasick. At least I have a headache caused by the rolling of the ship and rattling noise of everything. On Saturday night, the 24th, I went on deck to spend the greater part of it in watching, and to determine what to do. The swell greatly increased. It had evidently been approaching for hours before it reached us, since it rose in proportion as the ice was broken up into smaller pieces. In a short time but few of them were equal in size to the ship's deck, most of them not half so large. I knew that nearer the pack edge the sea would be very heavy and dangerous, but the wind was now fair, and having auxiliary steam power, I resolved to push out of the ice if possible. Shortly after midnight the ship was under sail, slowly boring her way to the eastward. At two o'clock on Sunday morning commenced steaming, the wind having failed. By eight o'clock we had advanced considerably to the eastward, and the swell had become dangerously high, the waves rising ten feet above the trough of the sea. The shocks of the ice against the ship were alarmingly heavy. It became necessary to steer exactly head-on to swell, we slowly passed a small iceberg sixty or seventy feet high. The swell forced it crashing through the pack, leaving a small water space in its wake, but sufficient to allow the seas to break against its cliffs and throw the spray in heavy showers quite over its summit. The day wore on without change, except that the snow and mists cleared off. Gradually the swell increased and rolled along more swiftly, becoming in fact a very heavy regular sea rather than a swell. 
The ice often lay so closely packed that we could hardly force ahead, although the fair wind had again freshened up. Much heavy hummocky ice and large berg pieces lay dispersed through the pack. A single thump from any of them would have been instant destruction. By five o'clock the ice became more loose, and clear spaces of water could be seen ahead. We went faster, received fewer though still more severe shocks, until at length we had room to steer clear of the heaviest pieces, and at eight o'clock we emerged from the villainous pack, and were running fast through straggling pieces into a clear sea. The engines were stopped, and Mr. Brand permitted to rest after eighteen hours' duty, for we now have no one else capable of driving the engines. Throughout the day I trembled for the safety of the rudder and screw. Deprived of the one or the other, even for half an hour, I think our fate would have been sealed. To have steered in any other direction than against the swell would have exposed and probably sacrificed both. Our bow is very strongly fortified, well plated externally with iron, and so very sharp that the ice masses, repeatedly hurled against the ship by the swell as she rose to meet it, were thus robbed of their destructive force. They struck us obliquely, yet caused the vessel to shake violently, the bells to ring, and almost knocked us off our legs. On many occasions the engines were stopped dead by ice choking the screw. Once it was some minutes before it could be got to revolve again. Anxious moments, those. After yesterday's experience, I can understand how men's hair has turned grey in a few hours. Had self-reliance been my only support and hope, it is not impossible that I might have illustrated the fact. Under the circumstances, I did my best to ensure our safety, looked as stoical as possible, and inwardly trusted that God would favour our exertions. What a release ours has been, not only from eight months' imprisonment, but from the perils of that one day. Had our little vessel been destroyed after the ice broke up, there remained no hope for us. But we have been brought safely through, and are all truly grateful, I hope and believe. I grieve to think of poor Lady Franklin and our friends at home. Severely as we have felt the failure of our first season's operations, yet the ordeal is now over with us. Not so with her and them, they have still to experience that bitter disappointment. Our distance within the package, when we first made sail yesterday, was twenty-two miles. Before we got clear of the ice, the height of the waves was thirteen and a half feet. After passing through the last of it, there was no increase, but the sea was more confused. In fact, within the ice, all minor disturbances were quelled or merged into one regular fast-flowing swell. The ship and her machinery behaved most admirably in the struggle. Should I ever have to pass through such an ice-covered, heaving ocean again, let me secure a passage in the Fox. During our 242 days in the packed ice of Baffin's Bay and Davis Straits, we were drifted 1,194 geographical, or 1,385 statute miles. It is the longest drift I know of, and our winter as a whole may be considered as having been mild but very windy. We are now steering for Holstenborg, where I intend to fit and refresh the crew. It is reputed to be the best place for reindeer upon the coast. End of chapter 6 Chapter 7 of In the Arctic Seas. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. In the Arctic Seas by Captain F. L. McClintock. Chapter 7 Wednesday night, April 28th. Safely anchored at Holstenborg and moored to the rocks. A charming change after our position only a few days back. We have been visited by the Danish residents, the chief trader or governor, the priest, and two others. Their latest European intelligence is not more recent than our own, but the Danish ship is hourly expected. She usually leaves Copenhagen about the middle of March. The winter here has been just the reverse of our own experience. It has been severe in point of temperature, but with very little wind. The land lies buried in snow, and as yet there is no thaw. It is too early for the cod fishery, and not a single reindeer has been killed throughout the winter. Eider ducks, looms and dovekies are abundant, as well as hares and ptarmigan. 29th. A bright and lovely day. Our poor half-famished dogs have been landed near the carcasses of four whales, so they must be supremely happy. I visited the governor today and found his little wooden house as scrupulously clean and neat as the houses of the Danish residents in Greenland invariably are. The only ornaments about the room were portraits of his unfortunate wife and two children. They embarked at Copenhagen last year to rejoin him and the ill-fated vessel has never since been heard of. Poor Governor Elberg is in ill health and talks of returning home. By home he means Denmark, the land of his birth, and where he once had a home. 30th. This is a grand Danish holiday. The inhabitants are all dressed in their Sunday clothes, at least all who have got a change of garments, and there is both morning and evening service in the small wooden church. 
As the governor could not be persuaded to unlock the door of the dance house, our men returned on board early. Yesterday evening they were all on shore, and, with the Eskimo, were squeezed into this one large room. To be squeezed in a crowd of human beings is positive enjoyment after a winter's isolation such as ours has been. Old Harvey constituted himself master of the ceremonies, and with his flute led the orchestra. It consisted of one of the flute and a fiddle. He managed to perch himself above all the rest at one end of the room, and played with such vigour that our blue jackets and the Eskimo ladies danced away most furiously for hours. These ladies can dance in the least possible space, their costume being particularly well adapted for the purpose, partaking as it does much more of the bloomer than the crinoline. Christian looks immensely happy, his countrymen regard him as a man whose fortune is made, and the women gaze with admiration upon his neat sailor's dress, and his good-natured, full round face, and huge, fat, shining cheeks. Mr. Peterson is in great request to interpret between the English, Danes, and Eskimo. 7th May. I intended sailing for Disco this morning, but wind and weather were adverse. We have obtained but little here except water, a tolerable supply of rock cod, some ptarmigan, hares, wild fowl, and a few items of stores. The governor now thinks the Danish ship must have been directed to visit Godhard before coming here. We have left letters to go home in her, and they ought to be in England by the end of June. I visited today a small lake at the foot of Mount Cunningham. It is said to occupy the centre of an extinct volcano, but I saw nothing to bear out the assertion. This is the only part of Greenland where earthquakes are felt. The governor told me of an unusually severe shock which occurred a winter or two ago. He was sitting in his room reading at the time when he heard a loud noise like the discharge of a cannon. Immediately afterwards a tremulous motion was felt, some glasses upon the table began to dance about, and papers lying upon the window sill fell down. After a few seconds it ceased. He thinks the motion originated at the lake, as it was not felt by some people living beyond it, and that it passed from northeast to southwest. This mountain scenery is really charming, but a little more animal life, reindeer for instance, would make it far more pleasing in our eyes. The last twelve months' produce of this district amounts to only five hundred reindeer skins instead of three thousand, as in ordinary years. The clergyman of Holstenborg was born in this colony, and has succeeded his father in the priestly office. His wife is the only European female in the colony. Being told that fuel was extremely scarce in the Danish houses, and that the priest's wife was blue with the cold, I sent on shore a present of some coals. On Sunday afternoon, hearing the church bell ringing, I went on shore. It proved to be only a christening. The dusky little infant received a long string of European names. There was a small description of barrel organ, to the sound of which the congregation joined in, keeping up a loud, monotonous chant. Most of the young people had hymn books in their hands, printed in the Eskimo language. Ravens seemed very abundant, also large grey falcons. Perhaps the dead whales may have attracted an unusual number. Poor Christian has not only fallen desperately in love, but has engaged himself to the object of his affections, a pretty Eskimo girl. He asked me today to give her a passage up to Godhavn, as he wished to leave her in charge of his mother until his return there with us next year, when his engagement for the voyage would be fulfilled. Having heard a rumour of a young woman awaiting his return at Godhavn, I taxed him with it, but he replied with great simplicity that he had never promised her and would not marry her, as his friends objected to the match. What are good Greenlanders coming to? I recommended that he should have his betrothed in her own home, with her mother and family. His asking a passage for her, in order to leave her with his mother, is strong proof of the sincerity of his engagement, not only to his lady love, but to the fox also. I have written to the Admiralty to account for my prolonged absence from England, and to Dr. Rink to acquaint him with the cause of my second visit to his inspectorate. Governor Elberg has promised to get me some fossil fish, to be found only in North Stromfjord. They are interesting, as being of unknown geological date. 10th. On the morning of the 8th we left Holstenborg with a pleasant land wind and bright weather. When 15 miles offshore we were stopped by ice formed during the last two nights, the thermometer having fallen to 12 degrees. Out in the offing the weather was gloomy and cold, and strong northerly winds were blowing. On closing the land again, we regained the offshore wind and bright weather. Keeping close along shore, and threading our way through a vast deal of pack and numerous icebergs, we gained sight of Disco about noon today, and by the evening were within an hour's sail of Godhavn, when we were again stopped by a broad belt of ice stretching along the coast. This was a bitter disappointment, more particularly as a gale of wind with heavy sea was fast rising, and snow beginning to fall thickly. There was nothing for it, however, but to stand off under easy sail for the night. 12th. At anchor at the Whalefish Islands. On the evening of the 10th we stood off from the inhospitable barrier of ice, prepared to meet the storm. Snow fell so thickly that we could hardly see the icebergs in time to avoid them. 
We supposed ourselves to be well to leeward of the whalefish island, but were deceived by the tides. Suddenly, a small low islet was seen on the lee bow. Not being able to pass to windward, we were obliged to wear ship, and in doing so, passed within the ship's length of destruction, for we were certainly within that distance of the rocks. The islet was covered with snow, and but for some very dark points showing through, it could not be distinguished from ice. On the 11th the weather improved, and in the evening we came to our present anchorage. From a hill we can watch an opportunity to enter Godhavn. Notwithstanding the blowing weather, some natives came about five miles off to us. The water washed over their little kayaks, and kept the occupants' sealskin dresses streaming with wet up to their shoulders. This part of their dress seems rather part of the kayak, as it is attached to it round the hole in which the kayaker sits, so that no water can enter. It is wonderful to see how closely a man can assimilate his habits to those of a fish. The Danish cooper in charge of this outstation tells us there are thirteen English whalers out, and some of them have been up to the northern end of Disco. Two vessels are in sight. The world, it appears, is at peace. Peterson was at one time in charge of this station. He is now seeking out his old acquaintances. Fourteenth. Summer has suddenly burst upon us, thermometer up to forty degrees. Moreover, we are enjoying English newspapers and have dined off roast beef and vegetables. Two days ago I sent a note off to a whaler by a kayak, requesting her captain to lend me some newspapers. The note reached Captain J. Walker of the Jane, and yesterday his ship, accompanied by the heroine, Captain J. Simpson, approached us and they both came in to call upon me, each of them bringing the very acceptable present of some newspapers, besides a quarter of beef with vegetables. Nothing could exceed their sincere good feeling and kindness. They offered to supply me with anything their ships could afford. The account they give of last season is as follows. The whalers reached Devil's Point near Melville Bay as early as the 21st of May. Southerly winds then set in and blew incessantly for six weeks, during all which time they were closely beset, and the ships Gypsy and Undaunted were crushed. When able to move, the fleet returned southward along the pack edge, which was everywhere found to be impenetrable. They sailed southward of Disco, and about the middle of July the earliest ships rounded the southern extremity of Middle Ice in latitude 68.5 degrees, and found no difficulty in their further passage to Ponds Bay. Captain Walker says ships could not have reached Lancaster Sound, as there was much ice north of Ponds Bay, which he thought extended quite across the Melville Bay. The position of the ice last season was considered to be most unusual. The long prevalence of southerly winds appear to have separated the tail of the pack from the main body, the former lying against the west land about Cape Searle, whilst the latter was forced northward and pressed closely into Melville Bay. The ships sailed freely between these two great divisions, and found the west water unusually extensive. Had I been able to collect a sufficient number of sledge dogs at Godhaven last year, it was my intention to have sailed across to the west side if possible, instead of pursuing the usual route through Melville Bay. But the opinions of the captains of the lost whalers were in favour of a Melville Bay passage, and the necessity for obtaining dogs left me no choice as to whether I should proceed west or north to Proven and Upernivik. I have already recorded what were my opinions at the time, so need only to observe now that although i failed i believe my decision was justified by all former experience even independently of the circumstances which obliged me to adopt it nevertheless it is mortifying to find that ships had reached as far as ponds bay and with but little difficulty sir edward parry upon his third voyage did not reach the west water until very late in the season although some of the whalers met with better success by following up another route there is nothing more uncertain than ice navigation dependent as it is upon winds, temperatures and currents. One can only calculate upon the chances, and how nearly we succeeded we have already seen. In the preceding year, 1856, some of the whalers got through Melville Bay as early as the 15th of June, only a few days after the commencement of the summer's thaw. Captain Walker tells me there are many years in which the whalers can pass up the western shore late in the season, but not always so far as Ponds Bay. Of Melville Bay after the 10th or 15th of July they know nothing, but the voyages of discovery afford us ample details, whilst of the southern route almost nothing has been made publicly known. There are many intelligent whaling captains who possess much valuable knowledge of these lands and seas, and even in the terra incognita of Frobisher Straits whalers have wintered, whilst our charts scarcely afford even a vague idea of the configuration of these extensive islands. The so-called Home Bay has been penetrated for 50 miles, and is supposed to be a strait leading to Fox's furthest, Scott's Inlet is also said to be a strait leading into a western arm of the same sea. A surveying vessel would be usefully employed for a couple of summers in tracing the general outline of these possessions of Her Majesty, more particularly as they are rather thickly inhabited by Eskimo, most eager to barter their produce for rifles, saws, files, knives, needles, and such like articles. 
Good coal has been found upon Durbin Island, near Cape Searle, in a convenient little cove upon its southern side, and as the old sailing whalers are being fast replaced by steamers, this place may become of great importance to them. We are refitting, shooting, and devouring quantities of excellent mussels. Eider ducks are very abundant, but extremely shy. Poor puss has been killed. Tempted on deck by the unusually warm weather, she was pounced upon by the dogs. 17th. Yesterday our attempt to enter the port of Godhaven failed. It is still filled with ice. This evening, Young and I examined a narrow rocky cove, Upanivik Bay of the natives. Finding it suitable for our purpose, the ship was brought in and moored to the rocks. We were received with much kindness by our friends Mr. and Mrs. Ulrich, and were presented with a file of late English papers. A considerable supply of beer was ordered to be brewed for us. I found Mrs. Ulrich without a fire in her sitting room. It was unnecessary. The windows looked to the south, and the sun shone brightly in upon a profusion of geraniums and European flowers, at once reminding one of home, and refreshing the senses by their perfume and beauty. The merry voices of the children were also a most pleasing novelty. Mr. Ulrich says the past winter has not been in any way remarkable, except for the prevalence of strong winds. April and the early part of May have been unusually cold. 24th. We did honour to Her Majesty's birthday by dressing the fox in all her flags and regaling her crew with plum pudding and grog. The ice having moved off, we have come into the harbour of Godhaven, as being more convenient and safe. The day has been a busy one. We have completed our small purchases and closed our letters. I have added another Eskimo lad to our crew, taking with him his rifle, kayak and sledge. This evening there has been a brisk interchange of presents between us and our Danish friends. I have been given an eider-down coverlet by the Governor, Mr. Anderson, and by Mrs. Ulrich some delicious preserve of Greenland cranberries, a tin of preserved ptarmigan, and a jar of pickled whale skin. My table is decked with European flowers, including roses, mignonette, and violets. With good reason shall we remember Godhaven. We have certainly been treated as his special favourites. 26th. Left Godhaven early yesterday morning, and anchored this afternoon in our old position off the coal cliffs in the Waigat. A party of seal hunters from Atten Eckerdluck came off to us, and their hunting having terminated successfully, they will assist us in coaling. From these men I obtained much information about this part of the coast. Within a range of twenty miles upon the Disco shore there are four distinct coaling places, but at this early season two of them are deeply covered with snow. There is also very good coal at the southeast end of Hare Island, where it can be easily obtained. The ice in this strait broke up as long ago as the 3rd of April. It has all drifted out to the northward. Only a few icebergs now remain. 28th. Again hastening northward. The business of coaling was very speedily and satisfactorily completed, but the quality of the coal is very inferior. Upon the green slopes, our sportsmen found nothing but a few ptarmigan and a hare. Shortly after running close past the deserted settlement of Noorsoak, we arrived off a small bay, and were startled by finding the water had suddenly changed from transparent blue to a thick muddy colour, but there was no change in its depth. We were crossing the stream of Macax Elvin, or Clay River, which empties itself into the bay after running through a broad and extensive valley said to abound with reindeer. This river has its origin in lakes and glaciers in the interior, and the discoloration of the water is probably the chief cause of success in white whale fishing which is carried on here in the autumn, as those timid animals will not permit boats to approach them in clear water. This evening we are crossing Omenax Fjord, and the land wind, which here and all along the coast northwards blows from the northeast, has come off to us. 31st. Lying fast to an iceberg off Upanivik. The whalers are all within a dozen miles of us, unable to penetrate further north. The season appears forward, and the ice much decayed, but southerly winds prevail, retarding its disruption and removal. Captain Parker, of the Emma, tells me he does not expect to make a north passage this year, and as his experience extends over a period of at least thirty years, I give his reason. It is simply this, that as during the months of February, March and April, northerly winds prevail to an unusual degree, therefore southerly winds may now be expected to continue. If he prove a profit, it will be to a serious hindrance at this critical season. Governor Fleischer says the winter has been mild, there has been but little wind, and that chiefly from the southward. 4th June. We have received much kindness from our friends Captains Parker and J. Simpson, as well as from others of the whaling fleet. The former has generously supplied us with many things we were rather short of, not only in ship's stores, but provisions and coals, and in return I have of course furnished him with a receipt for his owners. 
Captain Simpson has most handsomely presented the fox with a sail and yards, which, after some slight alterations, will enable us to add a main topsail to our spread of canvas. For the two days we lay at the iceberg, alongside of the Emma, I made furious attacks upon Captain Parker's beefsteaks and porter. We amply availed ourselves of his hearty welcome. By the arrival of the fine steam whaler Tay from Scotland, we have received papers up to 17th April. This morning we slowly steamed away from Upernivik, threading our way betwixt islands and ice for about 30 miles, and now await further ice movement before it will be possible to proceed. These are called the Woman Islands, so named by the celebrated Arctic explorer John Davis, who visited them in Queen Elizabeth's reign. He found here only a few old women, their frightened lords and more active juniors having effected their escape. Upon one of these islands a stone was picked up some 30 years ago, bearing a runic inscription, it was sent home to Copenhagen as a most interesting relic of the early Scandinavian voyagers, but nothing was on it except the names of those men who cleared this place, or formed a settlement, and the date, 1135. In all probability their sojourn was extremely short, perhaps only for a single summer. The Eskimo did not make their appearance for nearly two centuries later. After a year of settlement at Godharp in 1721, the Danish trading establishments gradually extended along the coast, and Upernivik was one of them, but it appears to have been soon abandoned. During Napoleon's wars, all the Danish posts were withdrawn, as the British fleet effectually cut off communication with Europe. But after peace was restored in 1815, the trading posts were again resorted to, and a new settlement formed near the ruins of the old one at Upernivik. It enjoys pre-eminence as the most northern abode of civilised man. End of chapter 7《ハッタ8》of《インディアクティックシーズ》。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.《インディアクティックシーズ》by Captain F. L. McClintock。Chapter 8. June 8th. Yesterday morning we passed close outside Buchan Island. It is small but lofty. Its north side is almost precipitous. Yet notwithstanding this strong indication of deep water, a reef of rocks lies about a mile off it. I happened to be aloft with the lookout man at half past eight o'clock, as we were steaming through a narrow lead in the ice, when I saw a rock close ahead. It was capped with ice, therefore was hardly distinguishable from the floating masses around. The engines were stopped and reversed, but there was neither time nor room to avoid the reef, which now extended on each side of us, and upon which the ship's bow stuck fast whilst her stern remained in thirty-six feet water. The tide had just commenced to fall, and all our efforts to haul off from the rocks were ineffectual. The floes lay within thirty yards of us upon each side. I feared their drifting down upon the ship and turning her over, but fortunately it was perfectly calm, and as the tide fell, points of the reef held them fast. The ship continued to fall over to starboard. At dead low water, her inclination was thirty-five degrees. The water covered the starboard gunwale from the mainmast aft, and reached almost up to the after hatchway. At this time the slightest shake must have caused her to fall over upon her side, when she would have instantly filled and sunk. The dogs, after repeated ineffectual attempts to lie upon the deck, quietly coiled themselves up upon such parts of the lee gunwale as remained above water, and went to sleep. To me the moment seemed lengthened out beyond anything I could have imagined, but at length the water began to rise and the ship to resume her upright position. Boats, anchors, hawsers, etc. were got on board again with the utmost alacrity, and the ship floated off unhurt after having been eleven hours upon the reef. We had grounded during the day-tide, and were floated off by the night-tide, which upon this coast occasions a much greater rise and fall. So far we were favoured, but the poor little fox had a very narrow escape. As for ourselves, there was not the slightest cause for apprehension, three steam whalers being within signal distance. Today we are steaming along after the three vessels which passed us last evening and disappeared round Cape Shackleton during the night. The contrast between our prospects yesterday and today fills one with delight. To be afloat and advancing unobstructively once more is indeed charming. 11th. On the afternoon of the 8th we joined the steamers Tay, Captain Dukas, Chase, Captain Gravel Sr., and Diana, Gravel Jr. After repeated ice detentions we have reached Duck Island. Captain Dukas says there is every prospect of an early north passage. We have had several conversations about the Ponds Bay natives and their reports of ships, wrecks and Europeans. There appears to be not only great difficulty, but also uncertainty in arriving at their meaning. To form an idea of the time elapsed since an event, all the distance to the spot where it occurred is a still harder task. I look forward to our visit at Ponds Bay with greatly increased interest. 
In August 1855, when Captain Dukas was crossing through the middle ice in latitude 70 degrees, he found part of a steamer's topmast embedded in heavy ice. He also saw the moulded form of a ship's side, and thinks the latter must have sunk. The portion of the topmast visible was sawed off and taken to England. It is most probable that the vessel was either HMS Intrepid or Pioneer, as two months later, and 250 miles further south, the Resolute was picked up. About two or three years ago, Captain Duke has lost his ship, Princess Charlotte, in Melville Bay. It was a beautiful morning, they had almost reached the North Water, and were anticipating a very successful voyage. The steward had just reported breakfast ready, when Captain Dukas, seeing the floes closing together ahead of the ship, remained on deck to see her pass safely between them. But they closed too quickly. The vessel was almost through, when the points of ice caught her sides abreast of the mizzenmast, and, passing through, held up the wreck for a few minutes, barely long enough for the crew to escape and save their boats. Poor Dukas thus suddenly lost his breakfast and his ship. Within ten minutes her royal yards disappeared beneath the surface. How closely danger besets the Arctic cruiser, yet how insidiously! Everything looks so bright, so calm, so still, that it requires positive experience to convince one that ice, only a very few inches, perhaps only three or four inches, above water, perfectly level, and moving extremely slow, could possibly endanger a strong vessel. The Princess Charlotte was a very fine strong ship, and her captain one of the most experienced Arctic seamen. He now commands the finest whaler in the fleet. 14th. We have only advanced a few miles to the northward. The steamer Inuit has joined our small steam squadron. Captain Souter left Scotland only a month ago. He has very kindly and promptly sent us a present of newspapers and potatoes. Captain Dukas has also been good enough to supply us with some potatoes and porter, perhaps the most serviceable present he could have made us after our long subsistence upon salt and preserved meats. 10th. Once more alone in Melville Bay. The Inuit and Chase steamed much too fast for us, and the last of the four vessels, the Tay, parted from us in a thick fog yesterday. We have come close along the edge of the fixed ice, passing about six miles outside of the Sabine Islands, and are advancing as opportunities offer. This morning the man who was stationed to watch a nip about a quarter of a mile ahead of the ship came running back, pursued by three bears, a mother with her half-grown cubs. I suppose they followed him chiefly because he ran from them, and at all events they were very close up before he reached the ship. Another bear was seen about the same time, but none of them came within shot. Rotchies, or little orcs, are very abundant. Seals are occasionally shot. I ate some boiled seal today and found it good. This is the first time I have eaten positive blubber. All scruples respecting it henceforth vanish. 25th. The land ice broke away inshore of the fox on the 19th or the 20th, and we found ourselves drifting southward amongst extensive fields of ice. Sad experience has already shown us how absolutely powerless our small craft is under such circumstances. But after many attempts we regained the edge of the fast ice this morning and steamed merrily along it towards Bushnan Island. When within a few miles a nip brought us to a standstill. Here five or six icebergs lie encompassed by land ice and apparently aground. One of them juts out and has caught the point of an immense field of ice. There is some slight movement in the latter, but not enough to let us pass through. Twelve or eighteen miles to the south there is a cluster of bergs, in all probability aground upon our seventy-fathom bank of last September. The ice field appears to rest against them, as both to the east and west there is much clear water. Exactly at this spot Captain Penny was similarly detained by a nip in August 1850. Although progress is denied to us at present, yet it is an unspeakable relief to have got out of the drifting ice. I have passed many anxious days in Melville Bay, but hardly any of them weighed so heavily upon me as yesterday. There was the broad, clear land water within a third of a mile of me, clear weather and a fair breeze blowing. The intervening nip worked sufficiently with wind and tide to keep one in suspense. It nearly opened at high water, but closed again with the ebb tide. I thought of the week already spent in struggling amongst drifting floes, and was haunted by visions of everything horrible, gales, ice crushing, etc. Nor was it consoling to reflect that all the sailing ships, as well as the steamers might have actually slipped past us. In fact, I must acknowledge that anxiety and weariness had worked me up into a state of burning impatience and of bitter chagrin had been so repeatedly baffled in all my efforts by the varying yet continual perplexities of our position. The only difference in favour of our prospects over those of the past year consisted in our having arrived here two months earlier, but the importance of this difference is incalculable. The opportunities afforded by the delays to which we have been subjected were turned, however, to some account. Nearly 1,000 rochies were shot. They are excellent eating. 
Their average weight is four ounces and a half, but when prepared for the table they probably do not yield more than three ounces each. A young bear imprudently swam up to the ship and was shot. His skin fell to the sportsman and carcass to the dogs. Several others have been seen. We watched one fellow surprise a seal upon the ice and carry it about in his mouth as a cat does a mouse. 27th. Lying fast to the ice off the crimson cliffs of Sir John Ross. Yesterday we succeeded in passing through the nip, and by evening reached Cape York. Seeing natives running out upon the land ice, the ship was made fast for an hour in order to communicate with them. A party of eight men came on board. They immediately recognised Peterson, for they lived at Etar in Smith Sound when he was there with the American expedition. They asked for Dr. Kane, and told us Hans was married and living in Wales Sound. They all said he was most anxious to return to Greenland, but had neither sledge dogs nor kayak. Hunger had compelled him to eat the seal skin which covered the framework of the latter. Peterson gave them messages for Hans from his Greenland friends, and advice that he should fix his residence here, where he might see the whalers and perhaps be taken back to Greenland. The natives did not seem badly off for anything except dogs, some distemper having carried off most of these indispensable animals. I was therefore unable to procure any from them. These people spent the winter here. They seem healthy, well-clad, and happy little fellows. One of them is brother-in-law to Erasmus York, who voluntarily came to England in the assistance in 1851. This man is an angekok, or magician. He has a still flatter face than the rest of his countrymen, but appears more thoughtful and intelligent. Peterson pointed out to me a stout old fellow with a tolerable sprinkling of beard and moustache. This worthy perpetrated the only murder which has taken place for several years in the tribe. He disliked his victim and stood in need of his dogs, therefore he killed the owner and appropriated his property. Such motives and passions usually govern the unsophisticated children of nature, yet as savages the Eskimo may be considered exceedingly harmless. Of late years these Arctic Highlanders have become alarmed by the rapid diminution of their numbers through famine and disease, and have been less violent towards each other in their feuds and quarrels. The appearance of these men, as they danced and rolled about in frantic delight at our approach, was wild and strange, and their costume uniform and picturesque. Their long, coarse black hair hung loosely over the sealskin frock, which in its turn overlapped their loose, shaggy bearskin breeches, and these again came down over the tops of their sealskin boots. Most of them carried a spear formed out of the horn of a narwhal. Having distributed presents of knives and needles, and explained to them that we did so because they had behaved well to the white people, as we learned from Dr. Kane's narrative of their treatment of him and his crew, we pursued our voyage, not doubting but that we should soon reach the North Water, an extensive sea through which we could sail uninterruptedly to Pond's Bay. During the night we advanced through loose ice, but fog and a rising southeast gale delayed us, and today the pack has pressed in against the land, so that our wings are most unexpectedly clipped. A walrus was shot through the head by a minie bullet. None other will penetrate such a massive skull. Unfortunately for my collection of specimens, and for the dogs, the animals sank. 2nd July. For five days we have been almost beset amongst loose ice and grounded bergs. The winds were generally from the southeast and accompanied by fog. To avoid being squeezed, we had to constantly shift our position. Once we were caught and rather severely nipped, the ship was heeled over about ten degrees and lifted a couple of feet. The ice was three feet thick but broke readily under her weight. Unfortunately, there was not time to unship the rudder, so it suffered very severely. Upon a previous occasion, the screw shaft was bent and a portion of the screw broken off. Landed to obtain a good view of the sea in the offing. From the hills we could see nothing but pack to seaward. There was no land ice. We stepped out of the boat upon a narrow ice foot which fringed the coast. Immediately above it we trod over a velvet sward of soft bright green moss. The turf beneath was of considerable depth. Here and there under this noble range of cliffs, which are composed of primary rock, there exists much vegetation for so high a latitude. From the fact of thick layers of turf descending quite down to the sea, it is evident that the land has been gradually sinking. Steep slopes of rocky debris, which screen the bases of the most precipitous cliffs, form secure nurseries for the little orc. These localities were literally alive with them. They popped in and out of every crevice, or sat in groups of dozens upon every large rock. I have nowhere seen such countless myriads of birds. The rochi, or little orc, lays its single egg upon the bare rock, far within a crevice beyond the reach of fox, owl, or burgomaster gull. We shot a couple of hundred during our short stay on shore, and by removing the stones, gathered several dozen of their eggs. The huge predatory gulls, long ago named burgomasters by Dutch seamen, because they lord it over their neighbours and appropriate everything good to themselves, have established themselves in the cliffs, where their nests are generally inaccessible. 
We were a month too late for their eggs. The young birds were as large as spring chickens. Of course we obtained specimens of the red snow, but had to seek rather diligently for it. Its colour was a dirty red, very like the stain of port wine. Very few patches of it were found. Last night a westerly wind blew freshly and dispersed the ice outside of us, so much so that this evening we have got out into almost clear water. Farewell Greenland, hurrah for the west. Fifth. After getting free from the ice off the Crimson Cliffs, we soon lost sight of the last fragment and steered for Ponds Bay. And now we all set to work in zealous haste to write our last letters for England by the whalers which we hoped soon to meet there. After running sixty miles the ice reappeared, and we sailed through a vast deal of it, but it became more closely packed, and a thick fog detained us for a day. When the weather became clear, the main pack was seen to the west, south, and southeast. In the hope of rounding its northern extreme, we ran along it to the northwest. Today it has led us to the north and northeast, so that this evening Wollstonehume Sound is in sight. To the north the pack appears impenetrable, and there is a strong ice brink over it. All the ice we have lately sailed through is loose and much decayed. It seems but recently to have broken away from the land, is not water-washed, neither has it been exposed to a swell, the fractured edges remaining sharp. 6th. Midnight. Last evening I persevered to the north until every hope of progress in that direction vanished. To the west the pack appeared tolerably loose, the wind was fresh at east-south-east, so I determined once more to push into it and endeavour to battle our way through. I hoped it would prove to be merely a belt of thirty or forty miles in width. We found the ice to lie for the most part in streams at right angles to the wind, and therefore much more open than it had appeared. There was seldom any difficulty in winding through it from one water space to another. The wind greatly increased, bringing much rain, but fortunately no fog. The dread of this hung over me like a nightmare. Our progress depended on the vigilance of the lookout kept in the crow's nest. By noon we had made good sixty miles. Throughout the day the wind has gradually moderated. The rain gave place to snow, which in its turn was succeeded by mist. The evening was fine eventually and clear, but we still find the ice is all around. Just before midnight the termination of our lead was discovered, whilst the ice through which we had passed was closing together, and a dense fog came rolling down. Under these circumstances the ship was made fast, as near to the nip as safety permitted, to await some favourable change. 10th. All the 7th we remained in our small basin, there being no outlet from it, and but little water anywhere visible. To pass away the dull hours, and get rid of unwelcome reflections upon the similarity of our present position and that in August last, I commenced an attack upon all the feathered denizens of the pack. They seemed so provokingly contented with it, but they soon became wary and deserted our vicinity, so I shot only a dozen fulmar petrels, three ivory gulls, two looms, and a lestus parasiticus. Some of them were useful as specimens, and such as were not destined for our table were given to the dogs. Although Coburg Island was forty-five miles distant from us, its lofty rounded outlines were very distinct and much covered with snow. On the 8th we squeezed through nips for four or five miles, and on the ninth, reaching a large space of water, steamed towards Coburg Island until again stopped by the pack at an early hour this morning, when within five or six leagues of it. This evening we are endeavouring to steam in towards the westland, and fancy we can trace with the crow's nest telescope a practicable route through the intervening ice mazes to a faint streak of water along the shore. This sort of navigation is not only anxious but wearying. To me it seems as if several months instead of only eight days had elapsed since we left Cape York. We are constantly wondering what our whaling friends are about and where they are. 14th. The faint streak of water seen on the night of the 10th proved to be an extensive sheet to leeward of Coburg Island. We reached it next morning. Jones Sound appeared open, and a slight swell reached us from it, but all along the shore there was close pack. Although but little water was visible to the southward, we persevered in that direction, and as the ice was rapidly moving offshore under the combined influence of wind and tide, we were only occasionally detained. 242 years ago, to a day I believe, William Baffin sailed without hindrance along this coast and discovered Lancaster Sound. What a very different season he must have experienced. Passing near Cape Horsburgh, we approached De Ross Inlet at midnight. The air being very calm and still, the shouting of some natives was heard, although we could scarcely distinguish them upon the land ice. The ship was made fast, and the shouting party, consisting of three men, three women and two children, eagerly came on board. Only four individuals remained on shore. The old chief Karlek is remarkable amongst Eskimo for having a bald head. 
he inquired by name for his friend Captain Inglefield. These three families have spent the last two years upon this coast between Cape Horsburgh and Croker Bay. Their knowledge does not extend further in either direction. They are natives of more southern lands, and cross the ice in Lancaster Sound with dog sledges. Since the visit of the Phoenix in 54 they have seen no ships, nor have any wrecks drifted upon their shores. They seemed very fat and healthy, but complained that all the reindeer had gone away, and asked if we could tell them where they went to. Our presents of wood, knives and needles were eagerly received. They assured us that Lancaster Sound was still frozen over, and that all the sea was covered with pack. After half an hour's delay we steamed onward, and on reaching a larger space of water our hopes, somewhat depressed by the native intelligence, began to revive. But we soon found that our clear water terminated near Cape Warrender. Lancaster Sound, although not frozen over, was crammed full of floes and icebergs. The wind increased to a strong gale from the east and pressed in more ice. At length the ship was with difficulty made fast to a strip of land ice a few miles westward of Point Osborne. Gradually the gale subsided, but not until the pack was close in against the land. The tides kept sweeping it to and fro to our great discomfort. The land is composed of gneiss and the gravelly shore is low. A few ducks only have been shot and traces of reindeer and hares seen. Our Melville Bay friends, the Rochies, are very rare visitors upon this side of Baffin's Bay. Part of a ship's timber has been found upon the beach. It measures seven inches by eight inches, is of American oak, and although sound, has long been exposed to the weather. End of chapter 8 Chapter 9 of In the Arctic Seas This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. In the Arctic Seas by Captain F. L. McClintock Chapter 9 16th July To borrow a whaling phrase, we are dodging about in a hole of water, off Cape Warrender. I recognise the little bay just to the west of the Cape where Parry landed in September 1824. The immense mass of snow and ice containing strata of muddy-looking soil is there still, and I should think, had considerably increased. Here his party shot three reindeer out of a small herd. We have narrowly scanned the steep hillsides with our glasses, but without discovering any such inducement to land. No cairns are visible upon Cape Warrender. The natives have probably removed them. Dense pack prevents us from approaching Port Dundas or crossing to the southern shore. We all find these vexatious delays are by no means conducive to sleep. The mind is busy with a sort of magic lantern representation of the past, the present and the future, and resists for weary hours the necessary repose. 17th. Last night's calm has allowed the pack to expand so much that today we have steamed through it until within three miles of the noble cliffs of Cape Hay, and now we are drifting eastward with the ice precisely as did the Enterprise and Investigator in September 49. Upon that occasion we were set free off Ponds Bay. There is a very extensive loomery at Cape Hay. We regret the circumstances which prevent our levying attacks upon it. Here, if anywhere, I expected to find a clear sea, but east winds have prevailed for twenty days out of the last twenty-five, and this accounts for the present state of the sea. The next succession of west winds will probably effect a prodigious clearance of ice. 21st. The Tay was seen today in loose ice and much further off the land. She gradually steamed through it to the southward, and by night was almost out of sight. Her appearance surprised us, as we supposed she must have reached Ponds Bay long ago. Ten hours struggling with steam and sails at the most favourable intervals has only advanced us five miles. The weather is remarkably warm, bright and pleasant. A very large bear came within 150 yards and was shot by Peterson, the minier bullet passing through his body. This beast measured eight feet three inches in length. His fat carcass was hoisted on board with great satisfaction, as our dog's food was nearly expended. 24th. Last night the ice became slack enough to afford some prospect of release, so we charged the nips vigorously and steamed away through devious openings towards Cape Fanshawe. For several hours but little progress was made, but this morning the ice became more open. Clear water was seen ahead and reached by noon. Although it is calm, I prefer waiting for a breeze to expending more coals. We are only ten miles from Possession Bay. The air is so very clear that the land appears quite close to us. All that is not mountainous is well cleared of snow. There is immense refraction, only a single iceberg in sight. The sea water is light green, as remarked by Parry in 1819. 
26th. A vessel was seen yesterday morning. The day continuing calm, we steamed through some loose ice, and joined her off Cape Walter Bathurst in the evening. It proved to be the Diana. She parted from us on the 16th of June in Melville Bay, has everywhere been obstructed by the pack, as we have been, and only reached Cape Warrender three days before us. From thence to Possession Bay she met with no obstruction. The subsequent east winds brought in all the ice which has so much retarded us. The Diana has already captured twelve whales. Taking the hint from Captain Gravel, we have made fast to a loose floe, and are drifting very nearly a mile an hour to the southward along the edge of very formidable land ice, which is seven or eight miles broad. All to seaward of us is packed ice. The old whaling seamen of the Diana are astonished at the unusual and unaccountable abundance of ice which everywhere fills up Baffin's Bay. All the Diana's steaming coals, her spare spars, wood, and even a boat, have been burnt in the protracted struggle through the middle ice. 27th. After putting our letter bag on board the Diana this morning, we steamed on for Ponds Bay, and at noon made fast near Button Point to the land ice, which still extends across it. For four hours Peterson and I have been bargaining with an old woman and a boy, not for the sake of their seal skins, but in order to keep them in good humour whilst we extracted information from them. They said they knew nothing of ships or white people ever having been in this inlet, nor of any wrecked ships. They knew of the depot of provisions left at Navy Board Inlet by the North Star, but had none of them. The woman has traced on paper the shores of the inlet as far as her knowledge extends, and has given me the name of every point. She says the ice will break up with the first fresh wind. These two individuals are alone here. They remained on purpose to barter with the whalers, and cannot now rejoin their friends, who are only twenty-five miles up the inlet, because the ice is unsafe to travel over, and the land precipitous and impracticable. This afternoon the Tay stood in towards us, and Captain Duke has kindly sent his boat on board with an offer to take charge of our letters. The Tay reached this coast only a few days ago, having met with the same difficulties which we experienced. The Inuit was last seen at nearly a month ago, beset off Jones Sound. The remaining steamer, the Chase, has not been seen or heard of. 29th. The old woman's denial of all knowledge of the wrecks or castaway men was very unsatisfactory. I determined to visit her countrymen at their summer village of Kaparoktolik, which she described as being only a short day's journey up the inlet. Peterson and one man accompanied me. We started yesterday morning with a sledge and a halkit boat. Although the ice over which we purposed travelling broke away from the land soon after setting out, yet we managed to get halfway to the village before encamping. This morning we learnt the truth of the old woman's account. A range of precipitous cliffs rising from the sea cut us off by land from Kaparoktolik, so we were obliged to return to the ship. Our walk afforded the opportunity of examining some native encampments and caches. We found innumerable scraps of seal skins, bird skins, walrus and other bones, whalebone, blubber, and a small sledge. The latter was very old and composed of pieces of wood and of large bones ingeniously secured together with strips of whalebone. Five preserved meat tins were found, some of them retaining their original coating of red paint. Doubtless these were part of the spoils from Navy Board Inlet Depot. The total absence of fresh wood or iron was strongly in favour of the old woman's veracity. Since yesterday, ice, about sixteen miles in extent, has broken up in the inlet and is drifting out into Baffin's Bay. During my absence our shooting parties have twice visited a loomery upon Cape Graham Moor, and each time have brought on board three hundred looms. Very few birds and no other animals were seen during our walk over the rich mossy slopes today. I saw a pair of Canadian brown cranes, the first of the species I have ever seen so far north, though Sir Robert McClure found them, I know, on Banksland. The lands enjoying a southern aspect, even to the summit of hills 700 or 800 feet in height, were tinged with green, but these hills were protected by a still loftier range to the north. Upon many well-sheltered slopes we found much rich grass. All the little plants were in full flower, some of them familiar to us at home, such as the buttercup, sorrel, and dandelion. I have never found the latter to the north of 69 degrees before. The old woman is much less excited today. She says there was a wreck upon the coast when she was a little girl. It lies a day and a half's journey, about 45 miles to the north, and came there without masts and very much crushed. The little which now remains is almost buried in the sand. A piece of this wreck was found near her abode. She has neither hut nor tent, but a sort of lair constructed of a few stones and a sealskin spread over them, so that she can crawl underneath. This fragment is part of a floor timber, English oak, seven and a half inches thick. It has been brought on board. 30th. 
A gale of wind and deluge of rain has detained the ship until this evening. We are now steaming up the inlet, having the old lady and the boy on board as our pilots. They are delighted at the prospect of rejoining their friends, from whom they were effectively cut off until the return of winter should freeze a safe pathway for them. They had, however, abundance of looms stored up on cash for their subsistence. She has drawn me another chart, much more neatly than the former, but so like it as to prove that her geographical knowledge, and not her powers of invention, have been taxed. She is a widow. Her daughter is married and lives at a place called Igloolik, which is six or seven days' journey from here, three days up the inlet, then about three days overland to the southward, and then a day over the ice. Thinking it not quite impossible that this Igloolik might be the place where Parry wintered in 1822-23, to I told Peterson to ask whether the ships had ever been there. She answered, yes, a ship stopped there all one winter, but it is a long time ago. All she could distinctly recollect having been told about it was that one of the crew died and was buried there, and his name was Alla or Elle. On referring to Parry's narrative, I found that the ice mate, Mr. Elder, died at Igloolik. This is a very remarkable confirmation of the locality, for there are several places called Igloolik. She also told us it was an island, and near a strait between two seas. The Eskimo take considerable pains to learn and remember names. This woman knows the names of several of the whaling captains, and the old chief at De Ross Islet remembered Captain Inglefield's name, and tried hard to pronounce mine. She now told us of another wreck upon the coast, but many days' journey to the south of Ponds Bay. It came there before her first child was born. Her age is not less than forty-five. August 4th. Our Eskimo friends have departed from us with every demonstration of friendship to return to their village. We have had free communication with them for four days, not only through Mr. Peterson, but also through our two Greenlanders. The result is that they have no knowledge whatever of either the missing or the abandoned searching ships. Neither wrecked people nor wrecked ships have reached their shores. They seem to be much in want of wood. Most of what they have consists of staves of casks, probably from the Navy Board Inlet Depot. In their bartering with us, saws were most eagerly sought for in exchange for narwhals' horns. They are used by them in cutting up the long strips of the bones of whales with which they shoe the runners of their sledges, also the ivory and bone used to protect the more exposed parts of their kayaks and the edges of their paddles from the ice. Files were also in great demand, and I found were required to convert pieces of iron hoop into arrow and spearheads. If any suspicion existed of their having a secret supply of wood such as a wreck or even a boat would afford, it was removed by their refusing to barter the most trifling things for axes or hatchets but I must relate the events of the last few days as they occurred. When seventeen miles within the inlet, we reached the unbroken ice and made the ship fast. Here, the strait, originally named Ponds Bay, and more recently Eclipse Sound, appears to be most contracted, its width not exceeding seven or eight miles. Both its shores are very bold and lofty, often forming noble precipices. The prevailing rock is grey nice, generally dipping at an angle of thirty-five degrees to the west. Early on the 1st of August I set out for the native village with Hobson, Peterson, two men, and the two natives from Button Point. Eight miles of wet and weary ice travelling, which occupied as many hours, terminated our journey. The surface of the ice was everywhere deeply channelled and abundantly flooded by the summer's thaw. We were almost constantly launching our small boats over the slippery ridges which separated pools or channellings through which it was generally necessary to wade. After toiling round the base of a precipice, we came rather suddenly in view of a small semicircular bay. The cliffs on either side were 800 or 900 feet high, remarkably forbidding and desolate. The mouth of a valley or wide mountain gorge opens out into its head. Here, in the depth of the bay, upon a low flat strip of land, stood seven tents, the summer village of Kaparoktolik. I never saw a locality more characteristic of the Eskimo than that which they have here selected for their abode. It is widely picturesque in the true Arctic application of the term. Although August had arrived and the summer had been a warm one, the bay was still frozen over, and if there was an ice-covered sea in front, there was also abundance of ice-covered land in the rear. A glacier occupied the whole valley behind and to within 300 yards of the chosen spot. The glacier's height appeared to be from 150 to 200 feet. Its sea face extending across the valley, a probable width of 300 or 400 yards, was quite perpendicular and fully 100 feet high. All last winter's snow had thawed away from off it, and exposed a surface of mud and stones. 
fissured by innumerable small rivulets which threw themselves over the glacier cliffs in pretty cascades or shot far out in strong jets from their deeply serried channels in its face whilst other streamlets near the base burst out through subglacial tunnels of their own forming what a strange people to confine themselves to such a mere strip of beach upon each side they have towering rocky hills rising so abruptly from the sea that to pass along their bases or ascend over their summits is equally impossible whilst a threatening glacier immediately behind bears onward a sufficient amount of rock and earth from the mountains whence it issues to convince even the unreflecting savage of its progressive motion the land is devoid of game although lemmings and ermines are tolerably numerous it only supplies the moss which the natives burn with blubber in their lamps and the dry grass which they put in their boots even the soft stone lapis oleris out of which their lamps and cooking vessels are made and the iron pyrites with which they strike fire are obtained by barter from the people inhabiting the land to the west of navy board inlet but the sea compensates for every deficiency the assembled population amounted to only twenty-five souls nine men the rest women and children all of them evinced extreme delight at seeing us as we approached the huts the women and children held up their arms in the air and shouted pilete give me incessantly the men were more quiet and dignified yet lost no opportunity either when we declined to barter or when they had performed any little service to repeat pilete in a beseeching tone of voice we walked everywhere about the tents and entered some of them carefully examining every chip or piece of metal our visit was quite unexpected they had only two sledges both were made of two and a half inch oak planks devoid of bolt holes or tree nails and having but very few nail holes these sledges had evidently been constructed for several years the parts not exposed to friction were covered with green fungus one of them measured fourteen feet long the other about nine feet we were told the wood came from a wreck to the southward of ponds bay most of the sledge crossbars were ordinary staves of casks amongst the poles and large bones which supported the tents we noticed a painted fur oar some pieces of iron hoop and a few preserved meat tins one of which was stamped goldner completed their stock of european articles peterson questioned all the men separately as to their knowledge of ships or wrecks but their accounts only served to confirm the old woman's story none of them had ever heard of ships or wrecks anywhere to the westward both individually and collectively we got them to draw charts of the various coasts known to them and to mark upon them the positions of the wrecks the two chiefs nuluk and awala soon made themselves known to me and when we desired to go to sleep sent away the people who were eagerly pressing around our tent all these natives were better looking cleaner and more robust than i expected to find them awala has been to igloolik one of his wives for each chief has two has a brother living there i spread a large roll of paper upon a rock and got him to draw the route over land and also round by the coast to it this novel proceeding attracted the whole population about us awala constantly referred to others when his memory failed him at length it was completed to the satisfaction of all parties when i gave him the knife i had promised him as a reward and added another for his wives he sprang up on the rock flourished the knives in his hands shouted and danced with extravagant demonstrations of joy he is a very fine specimen of his race powerful impulsive full of energy and animal spirits and moreover an admirable mimic the men were all about the same height five feet five inches they eagerly answered our questions and imparted to us all the geographical knowledge although at first they hesitated when we asked them about navy board inlet in consequence of the depot placed there having been plundered but we soon found that they were easily tired under cross-examination and often said they knew no more it was necessary to humour them according to their account the depot was discovered and robbed by people living further west this is probably true as so few relics were to be seen here which would not be the case if such active fellows as awala and nuluk had received the first information of its proximity these people of kaparoktolik are the only inhabitants of the land lying eastward of navy board inlet and live entirely upon its southern shore in a similar manner it is only the southern coast of the land to the west of navy board inlet that is inhabited after distributing presents to all the women and children and making a few trifling purchases from the men we returned next day to the ship during my absence more ice had broken away involving the ship and almost forcing her on shore it required every exertion to save her for two hours she continued in imminent danger and was only saved by the warping and ice blasting by which at last she got clear of the drifting masses four minutes only before these were crushed up against the rocks four eskimo came off to the ship in their kayaks bringing whalebone narwhals horns etc to barter next to hand saws and files they attached the greatest value to knives and large needles 
These men remained on board for nearly two days, and drew several charts for us. Newlock explained that seven or eight days' journey to the southward there are two wrecks a short day's journey apart. The southern is in an inlet or strait which contains several islands, but here his knowledge of the coast terminates. The man Araneet said he visited these wrecks five winters ago. All of them agreed it is a very long time since the wrecks arrived upon the coast, and Newlock, who appears to be about forty-five years of age, showed us how tall he was at the time. In the narrative of Parry's second voyage, at page 437, mention is made of the arrival at Igloolik of a sledge constructed of ship timber and staves of casks, also of two ships that had been driven on shore, and the crews of which went away in boats. In August 1821, nearly two years previous to the arrival of this report through the Eskimo to Igloolik, the whalers Dexterity and Aurora were wrecked upon the west coast of Davis Strait, in latitude 72 degrees, 70 or 80 miles southward of Ponds Bay. The old man Awangnoot drew the coastline northwards from Cape Graham Moor to Navy Board Inlet, and pointed out the position of the northern wreck a few miles east of Cape Hay. Had it been conspicuous, we must have seen it when we slowly drifted along that coast. These people usually winter in snow huts at Green Point, a mile or two within the northern entrance of Ponds Bay. They hunt the seal and narwhal, but when the sea becomes too open, they retire to Kaparoktolik, and when the remaining ice breaks up, usually about the middle of August, a further migration takes place across the inlet to the southwest, where reindeer abound and large salmon are numerous in the rivers. Every winter they communicate with the Igloo Lick people. Two winters ago, 1856 to 57, some people who lived far beyond Igloo Lick, in a country called Akani, probably the Akku Lee of Parry, brought from there the information of white people having come in two boats and passed a winter in snow huts at a place called by the following names Ami Lee Oki. Awilik, Nettilik. Our friends pointed to our whale boat and said the boats of the white people were like it but larger. These whites had tents inside their snow huts. They killed and ate reindeer and narwhal and smoked pipes. They bought dresses from the natives. None died. In summer they all went away, taking with them two natives, a father and his son. We could not ascertain the name of the white chief, nor the interval of time since they wintered amongst the Eskimo, as our friends could not recollect these particulars. The name of the locality, Awilik, spelt as written down at the moment, may be considered identical with Awilik, the name of the land about Repulse Bay in the chart of the Eskimo woman Ilig Liuk, Parry's Second Voyage, page 197. We were, of course, greatly surprised to find that Dr. Ray's visit to Repulse Bay was known to this distant tribe, and also disappointed to find they had heard nothing of Franklin's back river parties through the same channel of communication. They were anxiously and repeatedly questioned, but evidently had not heard of any other white people to the westward, nor of their having perished there. Awangnoot lived at Igloolik in his early days, and made a chart of the lands adjacent, but said he was so young at the time that it seemed like a dream to him. He was acquainted with Inu Luapik, the Eskimo who once accompanied Captain Penny to Aberdeen, and told us he had died, lately I think, at a place to the southward called Kree Merk Sumalek, but that his sister still lives at Igloolik. Although they told us the Igloolik people were worse off for wood than they were themselves, yet it was evident that here also it is very scarce. We could not spare them light poles or oars such as they were most desirous to obtain for harpoon and lance staves and tent poles and they would have willingly bartered their kayaks to us for rifles, having already obtained some from the whaling ships, but that they had no other means of getting back to their homes, nor wood to make the light framework of others. They collect whalebone and narwhal's horns in sufficient quantity to carry on a small barter with the whalers. A whaler showed us about thirty horns in his tent, and said he had many more at other stations. A few years ago, when first this bartering sprang up, an Eskimo took such a fancy to a fiddle that he offered a large quantity of whalebone in exchange for it. The bargain was soon made, and subsequently this whalebone was sold for upwards of a hundred pounds. Each successive year, when the same ship returns to Ponds Bay, this native comes on board to visit his friends, and goes on shore with many presents in remembrance of the memorable transaction. It is much better for him thus to receive annual gifts than to have received a large quantity at first, as the improvidence of these men surpasses belief. Of the rod of iron about four feet long, supposed to have been at one time galvanised, which was brought home in 1856 by Captain Patterson, and forwarded to the Admiralty, I could obtain no information. The natives were shown galvanised iron, and said they had never seen any before. If their countrymen had any, it must have come from the whalers. None like it was found in the wrecks. 
Rod iron is very valuable to Eskimo for spears and lances, and narwhal's horns very tempting to the seamen, not only as valuable curiosities, but the ivory is worth half a crown a pound, and I have but little doubt that many of the things said to have been stolen by the natives were fraudulently bartered away by the sailors. That there was no galvanized iron on board any of the government searching ships, nor in the missing expedition which sailed from England as far back as 1845, I am almost certain. But is it certain that this rod was galvanized? The natives gave Captain Patterson to understand that they got it from the wreck to the north. In July 1854, Captain Dukas was at Ponds Bay, and many natives visited his ship, coming over the ice on twelve or fourteen sledges made of ship's planking. Now at this time, Sir Edward Belcher's ships were still frozen up in Barrow Strait. My own impression is that the natives whom Captain Dukas communicated with in 1854 were visitors at Ponds Bay, certainly from the southward, and probably attracted by the barter recently grown up at that whaling rendezvous. Having discovered the use of the saws obtained by barter from our whalers, they had successfully applied them to the stout planking of the old wrecks, which they could not have stripped off with any tools previously in their possession. That the various tribes, or rather groups of families, occasionally visit each other, sometimes for change of hunting grounds, but more frequently for barter, is well known. Captain Parker told me that a native whom he had met one summer at Durbin Island came on board his ship at Ponds Bay the following year. The distance between the two places, as travelled by this man in a single winter, is scarcely short of 500 miles, and the information given us of Ray's wintering at Repulse Bay, information which must have travelled here in two winters, shows that these natives communicate at still greater distances. Did other wrecks exist nearer at hand, our Ponds Bay friends would be much better supplied with wood. If the Eskimo knew of any within 300, 400, or even 500 miles, the Ponds Bay natives would at least have heard of them, and could have had no reason from concealing it from us. I only regret that we had not the good fortune to see more than a few natives, and but two sledges of ships planking, otherwise our own information might have been more copious, and the origin of the fresh supply of planking decisively ascertained. End of chapter 9「10 of In the Arctic Seas. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. In the Arctic Seas by Captain F. L. McClintock. Chapter 10. 6th August. Continued calms have delayed us. This evening we steamed from Ponds Bay northward, although our coals had been sadly reduced by the almost constant necessity for steam power since leaving the Waigat. The three steam whalers have gone southward. None others have arrived. They appear to us to be leaving the whales behind them. We saw many whilst up in the strait and at the edge of the remaining ice. The natives said that they would remain as long as the ice remained, but when it all broke up they would return into Baffin's Bay and go southward, and that these animals arrive in early spring and do not pass through the strait into any other sea beyond. Monday evening, 9th. On the night of the 6th, a pleasant fair breeze sprang up, and enabled us to dispense with the engine. An immense bear was shot, he measured 8 feet 7 inches in length, and is destined for the museum of the Royal Dublin Society. On the 7th, the wind gradually freshened, and frustrated my intention of examining the wreck spoken of near Cape Hay. At night it increased to a very heavy gale. Although past Navy Board Inlet, very little ice had yet been met with. The weather and fear of ice to leeward obliged us to heave the vessel to, under main trysail and fore staysail. The squalls were extremely violent, and seas unusually high. All Sunday the 8th the gale continued, although not with such extreme force. The deep rolling of the ship and moaning of the half-drowned dogs amidst the pelting sleet and rain was anything but agreeable. Notwithstanding that I had been up all the previous night, I felt too anxious to sleep. The wind blew directly up Barrow Strait, drifting us about two miles an hour. Occasionally she drifted to leeward of masses of ice, reminding us that if any of the dense pack which covered this sea only three weeks ago remained to leeward of us, we must be rapidly setting down upon its weather edge. The only expedient in such a case is to endeavour to run into it. Once well within its outer margin, a ship is comparatively safe. The danger lies in the attempt to penetrate. To escape out of the pack afterwards is also a doubtful matter. In the evening we were very glad to see the land, and find ourselves off the north shore near Cape Bullen, for the violent motion of the ship and very weak horizontal magnetic force had rendered our compasses useless. This morning, the ninth, the gale broke and the sea began to subside rapidly. By noon it was almost calm, 
but a thick gloom prevailed, ominous, it might be, of more mischief. All along the land is ice, but broken up into harmless atoms. We have carried away a main gaff and jib stay, but have come remarkably well through such a gale with such trifling damage. 11th. Before noon today we anchored inside Cape Riley, and immediately commenced preparations for embarking coals. I visited Beachy Island House and found the door open. It must have been blown in by an easterly gale long ago, for much ice had accumulated immediately inside it. Most of the biscuit in bags was damaged, but everything else was in perfect order. Upon the north and west sides of the house, where a wall had been constructed, there was a vast accumulation of ice, in which the lower tier of casks between the two were embedded, and its surface thawed into pools. Neither casks nor wall should have been allowed to stand near the house. The southern and eastern sides were clear and perfectly dry. The Mary decked boat and two thirty-feet lifeboats were in excellent order, and their paint appeared fresh, but oars and bare wood were bleached white. The gutter percher boat was useless when left here, and remains in the same state. Two small sledge travelling boats were damaged. One of them had been blown over and over along the beach until finally arrested by the other. The bears and foxes do not appear to have touched anything. I have taken on board all letters left here for Franklin's or Collinson's expeditions, and also a twenty-feet sledge boat for our own travelling purposes. Last night we steamed very close round Cape Heard in a dense fog, and crept along the land as our only guide. We were thus led into Rigby Bay, and discovered a shoal off its entrance by grounding upon it. After a quarter of an hour we floated off unhurt. In lowering a boat to pursue a bear, Robert Hampton fell overboard. Fortunately he could swim and was very soon picked up, but the intense cold of the water had almost paralysed his limbs. The bear was shot and taken on board. Sunday 15th, 9pm. Our coaling was completed yesterday, and the ship brought over and anchored off the house in Erebus and Terror Bay. A small proportion of provisions and winter clothing has been embarked to complete our deficiencies. The ice has been scraped out of the house and its roof thoroughly repaired, a record deposited, and door securely closed. I found lying at Godhaven a marble tablet which had been sent out by Lady Franklin in the American expedition of 1855 under Captain Hartstein, for the purpose of being erected at Beachy Island. Circumstances prevented the Americans executing this kindly service, and it fell to my lot to convey it to the site originally intended. The tablet was constructed in New York under the direction of Mr. Grinnell, at the request of Lady Franklin, in order that the only opportunity which then offered of sending it to the Arctic regions might not be lost. I placed the monument upon the raised flagged square in the centre of which stands the cenotaph recording the names of those who perished in the government expedition under Sir Edward Belcher. Here also is placed a small tablet to the memory of Lieutenant Bellow. I could not have selected for Lady Franklin's memorial a more appropriate or conspicuous site. The inscription runs as follows. To the memory of Franklin, Crozier, Fitzjames, and all their gallant brother officers and faithful companions who have suffered and perished in the cause of science and the service of their country. This tablet is erected near the spot where they passed their first Arctic winter, and whence they issued forth to conquer difficulties or to die. It commemorates the grief of their admiring countrymen and friends, and the anguish, subdued by faith, of her who has lost, in the heroic leader of the expedition, the most devoted and affectionate of husbands. And so he bringeth them unto the haven where they would be. 1855 This stone has been entrusted to be affixed in its place by the officers and crew on the American expedition commanded by Lieutenant H. J. Hartstein in search of Dr. Kane and his companions. This tablet, having been left at Disco by the American expedition, which was unable to reach Beachy Island in 1855, was put on board the Discovery Yacht Fox, and is now set up here by Captain McClintock, R.N., commanding the final expedition of search for ascertaining the fate of Sir John Franklin and his companions, 1858. We are now ready to proceed upon our voyage from Beachy Island, and there is no ice in sight, but having worked almost unceasingly since our arrival up to the present hour, the men require a night's rest. Nearly 40 tons of fuel have been embarked. The total absence of ice in Barrow Strait is astonishing. No less so are the changes and chances of this singular navigation. Twelve days later than this, in 1850, when I belonged to Her Majesty's ship Assistance, with considerable difficulty we came within sight of Beachy Island. A cairn on its summit attracted notice. Captain O'Manny managed to land, and discovered the first traces of the missing expedition. Next day the United States schooner Rescue arrived. The day after, Captain Penny joined us, and subsequently Captain Austin, Sir John Ross, and Captain Forsyth. In all, ten vessels were assembled here. 
This day, six years, when in command of the Intrepid, we sailed from here for Melville Island, in company with the Resolute. Again I was here at this time in 1854, still frozen up in the North Star, and doubts were entertained of the possibility of escape. To come down to a later period, it was this day fortnight only that I set out for the native village in Ponds Inlet, under the guidance of an old woman. The trip was interesting, but we failed to obtain the slightest clue to the whereabouts of the missing ships. Moreover, our own little vessel had a most providential escape from being crushed against the cliffs, and this day week was spent in contending with a furious gale, during which the ship had been nearly driven to leeward and dashed to pieces by the sea-beaten pack. Yet these are only preliminaries. We are only now about to commence the interesting part of our voyage. It is to be hoped the poor fox has many more lives to spare. Monday night, 16th August. Sailed from Beachy Island this morning, and in the evening landed at Cape Hotham. A small depot of provisions and three boats were left there by former expeditions. Of the depot, all has been destroyed, with the exception of two casks, landed in 1850. The boats were sound, but several of their oars, which had been secured upright, were found broken down by bears, those inquisitive animals having a decided antipathy to anything stuck up, stuck up things in general being, in this country, unnatural. Fragments of the depot and the broken oars were tossed about in every direction. Numerous records were found. To the most recent, a few lines were added, stating that we had removed the two whale boats, one to be left at Port Leopold, the other to replace our own, crushed by the ice. 17th. Last night, battling against a strong foul wind with sea in rain and fog. Today, much loose ice is seen southward of Griffith's Island. The weather improved this afternoon and we shot gallantly past Limestone Island and are now steering down Peel Strait, all of us in a wild state of excitement and mingling of anxious hopes and fears. 18th. For twenty-five miles last evening we ran unobstructedly down Peel Strait, but then came in sight of unbroken ice extending across it from shore to shore. It was much decayed, and of one year's growth only, yet as the strait continues to contract for sixty miles further, and it appeared to me to afford so little hope of becoming navigable in the short remainder of the season, I immediately turned about for Bellow Strait, as affording a better prospect of a passage into the western sea discovered by Sir James Ross from Fall River Point in 1849. Our disappointment at the interruption of our progress was as sudden as it was severe. We did not linger in hope of a change, but steered out again into the broad waters of Barrow Strait. However, should Bellow Strait prove hopeless, I intend to return hither to make one more effort before the close of the season. We are now approaching Port Leopold, where it is necessary to stop for a few hours to examine the state of the steam launch, provisions and stores left there in 1849, as adverse circumstances may oblige me to fall back upon it as a point of support. 19th. At anchor in Port Leopold. It is perfectly clear of ice. We arrived here in the night. How astonishingly bare the land looks. It is more barren than Beachy Island, whilst the rock contains far fewer fossils. On this day, nine years ago, the harbour and sea continued covered with ice, and the ships, Enterprise and Investigator, were unable to escape. At some period since then the ice has been pressed in upon the low shingle point. It has forced the launch up before it and left her broadside onto the beach, with both bows stove in and in want of considerable repairs. But the means are all at hand for executing them. We tried to haul her further up, but she was firmly embedded and frozen into the ground. Many things appear to have been covered with the loose shingle, bags of coal and coke just appearing through it scarcely above high water mark. Amongst the missing articles is the steam engine. Although the flagstaff upon the summit of North East Cape is still standing, the one erected upon this point, and almost the whole of the framing of the house lies prostrate. The provisions appear to be sound, but were not generally examined. The whale boat we removed from Cape Hotham was landed here, and a record of our proceedings added to the many which have accumulated here during the last ten years. Some coke and a few things useful to us and merely decaying here were taken on board, and by evening we were again speeding onward with augmented resources, and the confidence inspired by a secure depot in our rear buoyed up, moreover, by the joyful anticipation of soon reaching the goal of our long-deferred hopes. 20th. Noon. Exactly off Fury Point. There is one large iceberg far off in the southeast. No other ice in sight. I would have landed at Fury Beach to examine the remaining supplies there, but a snow shower prevented our distinguishing anything, and a strong tide carried us past, before we were aware of it. We feel that the crisis of our voyage is near at hand. Does Bellow Strait really exist? If so, is it free from ice? 
A depôt of provisions is being got ready to be landed, should it be practicable for us to push through and proceed to the southward. 21st. On approaching Brentford Bay last evening, packed ice was seen streaming out of it, also much ice in the southeast. The northern point of entrance was landed upon by Sir John Ross in 1829, and named Possession Point. We rounded it closely, and could distinguish a few stones piled up upon a large rock near its highest point. This is his cairn. As we passed westward, between the point and Brown's Island, through a channel a mile in width, a close pack was discovered a few miles ahead, and it being past ten o'clock and almost dark, the ship was anchored in a convenient bay, three or four miles within possession point. Here our depot is to be landed, therefore we shall name this for the present Depot Bay. A very narrow isthmus between its head and hazard inlet unites the low limestone peninsula, of which possession point is the extreme, to the mainland. Today an unsparing use of steam and canvas forced the ship eight miles further west. We were then about halfway through Bellow Strait. Its western capes are lofty bluffs, such as may be distinguished fifty miles distant in clear weather. Between them there was a clear broad channel, but five or six miles of close heavy pack intervened, the sole obstacle to our progress. Of course this pack will speedily disperse. It is no wonder that we should feel elated at such a glorious prospect, and continue to bide our time in the security of Depot Bay. A feeling of tranquillity, of earnest, hearty satisfaction has come over us. There is no appearance amongst us of anything boastful. We have all experienced too keenly the vicissitudes of Arctic voyaging to admit of such a feeling. At the turn of tide we perceived that we were being carried, together with the pack, back to the eastward. Every moment our velocity was increased, and presently we were dismayed at seeing grounded ice near us, but were very quickly swept past it at a rate of nearly six miles an hour, though within two hundred yards of the rocks and of instant destruction. As soon as we possibly could, we got clear of the packed ice, and left it to be wildly hurled about by various whirlpools and rushes of the tide, until finally carried out into Brentford Bay. The ice masses were large and dashed violently against each other, and the rocks lay at some distance off the southern shore. We had a fortunate escape from such dangerous company. After anchoring again in Depot Bay, a large stock of provisions and a record of our proceedings were landed, as there seems every probability of advancing into the Western Sea in a very few days. The appearance of Bellow Strait is precisely that of a Greenland fjord. It is about twenty miles long, and scarcely a mile wide in the narrowest part, and there, within a quarter of a mile of the north shore, the depth was ascertained to be four hundred feet. Its granitic shores are bold and lofty, with a very respectable sprinkling of vegetation for latitude 72 degrees. Some of the hill ranges rise to about 1500 or 1600 feet above the sea. The lowland eastward of Depot Bay is composed of limestone, destitute alike of fossils and vegetation. The granite commences upon the west shore of Depot Bay, and is at once bold and rugged. Many seals have been seen. A young bear was shot, and Walker took a photograph of him as he lay upon our deck, the dogs creeping near to lick up the blood. The great rapidity of the tides in Bellow Strait fully accounts for the spaces of open water seen by Mr. Kennedy when he travelled through early in April. The strait runs very nearly east and west, but its eastern entrance is well masked by Long Island. When halfway through, both seas are visible. As in Greenland, the night tides are much higher than the day tides. Last night it was high water at about half-past eleven, as nearly as we can estimate, the tide runs through to the west from two hours before high water until four hours after it. That is, the flood tide comes from the west. Such is also the case in Hecla and Fury Strait. In both places the tide from the west is much the strongest. I am not sufficiently informed to discuss the subject, but infer the existence of a channel between Victoria and Prince of Wales land. The rise and fall is much less upon the western side of the Isthmus of Boothia than upon the east, and it likewise decreases, we know, in Barrow Strait as we advance westward. 23rd. Yesterday, Bellow Strait was again examined, but the five miles of close pack occupied precisely the same position as if heaped together by contending tides. Considerable augmentations were, moreover, seen drifting in from the western sea. Finding nothing could be effected in Bellow Strait, we sought in vain for the more southern channel which should exist to form Levesque Island. We did, however, find a beautiful harbour, and are now securely anchored in its northwest arm. I have named it after the gentleman whose former island I have thus reluctantly converted into the northern extreme of the Boothian Peninsula, and, consequently, of the American continent. The southwestern angle of Brentford Bay is still covered with unbroken ice. This evening we all landed to explore our new ground. Young and Peterson shot some Brent geese. Walker saw two deer, but he was botanizing and had no gun. Others were seen by some of the men and followed, but without success. 
I enjoyed a delightfully refreshing ramble, a mile or two inland through a gently ascending valley, then two miles along the narrow margin of a pretty little lake between mountains, beyond which lay a much larger one, four or five miles in diameter. This farther lake was only partially divested of its winter ice. Here the scenery was not only grand but beautiful. There was enough of vegetation to tinge the craggy hillsides and to make the sheltered hollows absolutely green. Deer tracks and the footprints of wildfowl were everywhere numerous along the waterside. I saw two decayed skulls of musk oxen and circles of stone by the little lake, doubtless at some remote period the summer residence of wandering Eskimo. Hence I infer that fish abound in the lake and that this valley is a favourite deer pass. But the contemplation of these objects, although agreeable, was not the object of my solitary ramble. I came on shore to cogitate undisturbed in a leisurely and philosophic manner. We hoped very soon to enter an unknown sea. Discoveries were to be made, contingencies provided for, and plans prepared to meet them. Yesterday Peterson shot an immense bearded seal. It sank, but floated up an hour afterwards. This animal measured eight feet long and weighed about five hundred pounds. We prefer its flesh to that of the small seals, and its blubber will afford a valuable addition to our stock of lamp oil for the coming winter. 25th. In Depot Bay. We remained but twenty-four hours in Levesque Harbour. A change of wind led us to hope for a removal of the ice in Bellow Strait, therefore I determined to make another attempt. When off the table land, where the depth is not more than from six to ten fathoms, and the tides run strongest, the ship hardly moved over the ground, although going six and a half knots through the water. Thus delayed, darkness overtook us, and we anchored at midnight in a small indentation of the north shore, christened by the men Fox's Hole, rather more than halfway through. For several hours we had been coquetting with huge rampant ice masses that wildly surged about in the tideway, or we dashed through boiling eddies and sometimes almost grazed the tall cliffs. We were therefore naturally glad of a couple or three hours' rest, even in such a very unsafe position. At early dawn we again proceeded west, but for three miles only. The pack again stopped us, and we could perceive that the western sea was covered with ice. The east wind, which could alone remove it, now gave place to a hard-hearted westerly one. All the straits to the eastward of us, and the eastern sea, as far as could be seen from the hilltops, is perfectly free from ice, whereas in the direction we wish to proceed, there is nothing but packed ice or water which cannot be reached. Bitterly disappointed we are, of course, yet there is reasonable ground for hope. Grim winter will not ratify the obstinate proceedings of the western ice for nearly four weeks. Last evening's amusement was most exciting, nor was it without its peculiar perils. With cunning and activity worthy of her name, our little craft warily avoided a tilting match with the stout blue masses which whirled about, as if with willful impetuosity, through the narrow channel. Some of them were so large as to ground even in six or seven fathoms water. Many were drawn into the eddies, and acquiring considerable velocity in a contrary direction, suddenly broke bounds, charging out into the stream and entering into mighty conflict with their fellows. After such a frolic the masses would revolve peaceably, or unite with the pack, and quietly await their certain dissolution. May the day of that wished-for dissolution be near at hand. Nothing but strong hope of success induced me to encounter such dangerous opposition. I not only hoped, but almost felt that we deserved to succeed. Two plans were now occupying my thoughts, both of them resulting from the conviction that we should probably be compelled to winter to the eastward of Bellow Strait. The most important of these plans is that of finding some series of valleys, chains of lakes, or continuous low land, practicable as an overland sledge route to the western coast, along which we may transport depots of provisions this autumn, for it is certain that the strong tides will prevent Bellow Strait from being frozen over till winter is far advanced, and its surface will afford us no means of passing westward with our sledges. The other plan, and that which we are now about to execute, is to land a small depot of provisions sixty or seventy miles to the southward, and down Prince Regent's Inlet, in order to facilitate communication with the Eskimo either this autumn or in early spring. This precautionary step became so necessary in the event of the west coast presenting unusual difficulties that I determined to carry it at once into execution. Quitting the Fox's Hole and resting for one night in Depot Bay, we sailed thence on the 26th. A fine breeze carried us rapidly southward along the coast of Regent Inlet. There was but little obstruction. Occasionally it was necessary to pass through a stream of loose ice, but we saw little of any kind compared to the experiences of Sir John Ross in 1829. About dusk, nine o'clock, much loose ice to the southward prevented our making any attempt at further progress. We therefore anchored off the coast, in Stillwell Bay, I think, about 45 miles from the depot bay. Here the depot, consisting of 120 rations, was landed. 
I observe that it has only been on penetrating into Brentford Bay that we have found the primary rocks washed by the sea. The coastline both north and south, as far as, and beyond our present position, is a low shore of pale limestone, destitute of fossils. We can, however, see granitic hill ranges far into the interior. On the 27th we commenced beating back to the northward, tacking between the land and the ice which lay about fifteen miles off shore. Towards night the wind greatly increased, and the ship, under reefed sail, plunged violently into the short, swift, high seas. We also felt quite as uneasy and restless as the ship, in our great anxiety to get back and ascertain what changes were likely to be affected by the gale. 28th. Tonight the weather is more pleasant. The keen and contrary wind has given place to a gentle fair breeze. The swell has almost subsided. No ice has been seen today, and the night is dark and unusually mild. I can hardly fancy that the sea which gently rocks us is not the ocean, and the soft air the breath of our own temperate region. The delusion is charming. 30th. Yesterday, after anchoring in Depot Bay, I walked over to Possession Point to visit Ross's cairn. I found a few stones piled up on two large boulders, and under each a halfpenny, one of which I pocketed. Upon the ground lay the fragments of a bottle which once contained the record, and near it a staff about four feet long. Having calculated upon finding the bottle sound, I was obliged to make an impromptu record case of its long neck, into which I thrust my brief document, and consigned it to the safe custody of a small heap of stones, the staff being erected over it. It was dark before I got on board again. The strait had been reconnoitred from the hills, and was reported to be perfectly clear of ice. This morning we made a fourth attempt to pass through, but Bellow Strait was by no means clear. The same obstruction existed which defeated our last attempt, and in precisely the same place. Returning eastward, we entered a narrow arm of the sea nearly a couple of miles to the west of Depot Bay, and anchored in a small creek perfectly sheltered and landlocked, at the foot of a sugar-loaf hill. The temperature is falling. Last night it stood at 24 degrees. End of chapter 10「Eleven of In the Arctic Seas. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. In the Arctic Seas by Captain F. L. McClintock. Chapter 11. Most anxious to know the real state of the ice in the Western Sea, upon which our hopes so entirely depend, I intend starting this evening by boat, as far through Bellows Strait as the ice will permit, then land and ascend the western coast hills. 1st September. My boat party consisted of four men and the doctor, who came with me for the novelty of the cruise, bringing his camera to fasten upon anything picturesque. We landed near Halfway Island and pitched our tent for the night. Early next morning I commenced the rather formidable undertaking of ascending the hills, for it is not possible to pass under the cliffs, and at last I gained the summit of the loftiest, overlooking Cape Bird at a distance of three or four miles, and affording a splendid view to the westward, as well as glimpses between the hills of the blue eastern sea. Long and anxiously did I survey the western sea, ice and lands, and could not but feel that in all probability we should not be permitted to pass beyond our present position. To the northward, Four River Point, Sir James Ross's farthest in 1849, was at once recognised. Rather more than nine years ago I stood upon it with him, and gazed almost as anxiously in this direction. My present view confirmed the impression then received of a wide channel leading southward. The outline of the western land is very distant. It is of considerable but uniform elevation, and slopes gradually down to the strait, which is between 30 and 40 miles wide. This western land appears to be limestone, and without off-lying islands. Our side of the strait or sea, on the contrary, is primary rock, and fringed with islets and rocks. Its southern extreme bears south-south-west, and is probably thirty miles distant. Now for the ice. Although broken up, it lies against this shore in immense fields. There is but little water or room for ice movement. Along the west shore I can distinguish long, faint streaks of water. There is no appearance of disruption about Four River Point, or in the contracted part of Peel Strait. We have nothing to hope for in that quarter. Neither is there any evidence of current or pressure. The ice appears much decayed, but as I am surveying it from a height of about 1,600 feet, I may be deceived. The strong contrast between the eastern and western seas and lands is very unfavourable to the latter. Apart from the ice, I was fortunate, however, in discovering a long, narrow lake, occupying a valley which lies between a small inlet near Cape Bird and Hazard Inlet, 
in fact a sort of echo of Bellow Strait, and I look upon it as our sledge route for the autumn, since it appears probable we shall winter in our present position. This is a wondrous rough country to scramble over. One never ceases to wonder how such huge blocks of rock can have got into such strange positions. I noticed two masses in particular, each of them perched upon three small stones. The rock is nice, there is also much granite. Even upon the hilltops, pieces of limestone are occasionally met with. My walk occupied eleven hours, and although everywhere I saw traces of animals, the only living thing seen was a grey falcon. During my absence from the tent, the men rambled all over the hills, but saw no game. Our encampment was therefore shifted to a better position near the eastern termination of the tableland. This morning we explored the neighbouring valleys, saw three deer, and shot one, before returning on board the fox in time for dinner. Many deer had been seen not far from the ship, and Hobson had shot a bearded seal. I have organised another boat party. Young will start with it tomorrow morning to seek a sledge route from the southern angle of Brentford Bay to the western sea. 5th. Young returned this morning. He reports the southwest angle of the bay not to run in so far as we expected, and to be environed by very high land, impracticable for sledges. Our Eskimo, Samuel, shot a fawn today. Strong northerly winds have latterly prevailed. Bellow Strait is quite clear of ice. Tomorrow morning, therefore, we shall make our fifth attempt to get the fox through. Sixth. Steamed through the clear waters of Bellow Strait this morning, and made fast to the ice across its western outlet at a distance of two miles from the shore, and close to a small islet which we have already dubbed Pemmican Rock, having landed upon it a large supply of that substantial traveller's fare, with other provisions for our future sledging parties. This ice is in large, stout fields, of more than one winter's growth, apparently immovable in consequence of the numerous islets and rocks which rise through and hold it fast. If the weather permits, we shall remain here for a few days, and watch the effect of winds and tides upon it. That the ship will get any further seems improbable. 10th. I have explored a small inlet near Cape Bird, which we have named False Strait, from its striking resemblance to the true one, and find it is only separated from the Long Lake by half a mile of low land. The lake we have ascertained to be about 12 miles long, and from it valleys extend eastward and southward, so that we are sure of a good sledge route, an important matter as the hills rise to 1600 feet above the sea. Cape Bird is 500 feet high. From its summit we carefully observe the ice. This granite coast presents a jagged appearance. It is deeply indented and studded with islets. The ice in the Western Sea, or Peel Strait, is much more broken up than it was upon the 31st Ultimo. There is no longer any fixed ice except within the grasp of the islets. Birds and animals have become very scarce. Three seals have been shot and a bear seen. Tomorrow we shall return to our harbour and endeavour to procure a few more reindeer before they migrate southward. Twelfth. Yesterday we anchored within the entrance of our creek, being a more convenient position than up at its head. We are already in our wintering position, and, being without occupation, one day seems remarkably like another. Although the fondly cherished hope of pushing farther in our ship can no longer be entertained, yet as long as the season continues navigable, it is our duty to be in readiness to avail ourselves of any opportunity, however improbable, of being able to do so. Once firmly frozen in, our autumn travelling will commence and afford welcome occupation. Almost all on board have guns, ammunition is supplied, and a sailor with a musket is a very contented and zealous sportsman, if not always a successful one. It is a powerful incentive to exercise. Today the ramblers saw only two hares, an ermine, and an owl. Some peregrine falcons have lately been shot. Peterson declares they are the best beef in the country, and the young birds tender and white as chicken. A few days ago a large cask of biscuit was opened, and a living mouse discovered therein. It was small, but mature in years. The cask, a strong watertight one, was packed on shore at Aberdeen in June 1857, and remained ever afterwards unopened. There was no hole by which the mouse could have got in or out. Besides, it is the only one ever seen on board. Ship's biscuit is certainly dry feeding, but who dares assert, after the experience of our mouse, that it is not wonderfully nutritious? Fifteenth. Two nights ago a comet was observed just beneath the constellation of the Great Bear. A series of measurements were commenced for determining its path. Yesterday I walked through the most promising valleys for eight hours, but did not see a living creature. 
yet there is a very fair show of vegetation, much more than at Melville Island, where the game is abundant. To the east there is not a speck of ice, excepting only a huge iceberg, probably the same we saw off Fury Point, a very unusual visitor from Baffin's Bay, whence it must have been driven by those long-continued east winds of painful memory in June and July. Hobson and two men encamped out for three days in order to scour the country. They have only seen one hare and one lemming. Walker geologizes. Amongst other things, he finds much iron pyrites. The dredge has been used, but with very little success. The thermometer ranges between 20 degrees and 30 degrees. Fresh water pools are frozen over. Sea ice forms in every sheltered angle of the creeks. There is no snow upon the land, and this is one cause of the difficulty of finding game. I have determined upon naming this beautiful little anchorage Port Kennedy, after my predecessor, the discoverer of Bellow Strait, of which it is decidedly the port. This is not a compliment to him, but an agreeable duty to me, and nowhere could Mr. Kennedy's name be more appropriately affixed than in close proximity with his interesting discovery. And now having made this acknowledgement, I may venture to confer our little vessel's name upon the islets which protect its entrance. The island upon which Mr. Kennedy and Lieutenant Bellow encamped was Long Island, about three miles further to the southeast. 17th. Of late we have been preparing provisions and equipments for our travelling parties. My scheme of sledge search comprehends three separate routes and parties of four men. To each party a dog sledge and driver will be attached. Hobson, Young and I will lead them. My journey will be to the Great Fish River, examining the shores of King William's Land in going and returning. Peterson will be with me. Hobson will explore the western coast of Boothia as far as the Magnetic Pole, this autumn I hope, and from Gateshead Island westward next spring. Young will trace the shore of Prince of Wales Land from Lieutenant Brown's farthest to the southwestward to Osborne's farthest if possible, and also examine between Four River Point and Cape Bird. Our probable absence will be 60 or 70 days, commencing from about the 20th of March. In this way I trust we shall complete the Franklin search and the geographical discovery of Arctic America, both left unfinished by the former expeditions, and in doing so we can hardly fail to obtain some trace, some relic, or, it may be, important records of those whose mysterious fate it is the great object of our labours to discover. But previous to setting forth upon these important journeys, I must communicate with the Boothians, if possible, either upon the west or east coast in November or February. Sir John Ross's narrative informs us that they sometimes winter as far north upon the east coast as the Agnew River, and we know that upon the west, at the Magnetic Pole, their abandoned snow huts were occupied in June by Sir James Ross. 19th. Yesterday we steamed once more through Bellow Strait, and took up our former position at the ice edge, off its western entrance. The ice hemmed in by islets, has not moved. From the summit of Cape Bird I had a very extensive view this morning. There is now much water in the offing, only separated from us by the belt of islet girt ice scarcely four miles in width. My conviction is that a strong east wind would remove this remaining barrier. It is not yet too late. The water runs parallel to this coast and is four or five miles broad. Beyond it there is ice, but it appears to be all broken up. Yesterday, Young went upon a dog sledge to the nearest southwestern island, distant seven or eight miles. He reports the intervening ice cracked and weak in some places, but practicable for loaded sledges. The far side of the island is washed by a clear sea, and a bear which he shot plunged into it, and drifting away, was lost. Young is in favour of carrying out the depot's provisions to or beyond this island by boat, but as the temperature fell to 18 degrees last night, and new ice forms wherever it is calm, I prefer the safer, although more laborious, mode of sledging. Accordingly, today our dogs carried out two sledge loads of the provisions intended for the use of our parties hereafter. 22nd. All the provisions have now been carried out to the nearest island, which I shall temporarily name Separation, as there our spring parties will divide, and a portion intended for Hobson's party and my own has been carried on to the next island, seven or eight miles further. Our travelling boat and small reserve depot have been placed upon Pemmican Rock, so already something has been done. Animal life is very scarce. A few seals, an occasional gull, and three brown falcons are the only creatures we have seen for several days past. Last evening at eight o'clock a very vivid flash of lightning was observed. Its appearance in these latitudes is very rare. Once only have I seen it before, in September 1850. 25th. 
Saturday night. Furious gales from north and southwest, but our barrier of coast ice remains undiminished. This morning Hobson set off upon a journey of fourteen or fifteen days' duration, with seven men and fourteen dogs. He is to advance the depots along shore to the south, and if successful will reach latitude seventy-one degrees. The temperature is mild, plus seventeen, but it is snowy and disagreeable weather. There is already enough snow upon the old ice to make walking laborious, and the land has also assumed its wintry complexion. 28th. The ship was kept available for prosecuting her voyage up to the latest hour. It was only yesterday that we left the western ice, and in consequence of the vast accumulation of young ice in Bellow Strait, we had considerable difficulty in reaching the entrance of Port Kennedy. All within was so firmly frozen over that after three hours steaming and working we only penetrated one hundred yards. However, we are in an excellent position, although our wintering place will be farther out by a quarter of a mile than I intended. Today we are unbending sails and laying up the engines. Uncertainty no longer exists. Here we are compelled to remain, and if we had not been as successful in our voyaging as a month ago we had good reason to expect, we may still hope that fortune will smile upon our more humble yet more arduous pedestrian explorations. Hope on, hope ever. In the meantime, the sudden transition from mental and physical wear and tear to the security and quiet of winter quarters is an immense relief. 2nd October Mr. Peterson has shot two very fine bucks. One is a magnificent fellow weighing 354 pounds, minus the paunch. Several deer have been seen. They come from the north along the slopes of the eastern hills. An ermine came on board a few nights ago and kept the dogs in a violent state of excitement, being much too wary to come out from under the boat to be caught by them. At length one of the men secured it. This beautiful little animal does not appear to be full grown. Its extreme length is 13 inches. Two others came off to the ship, and to our great amusement eluded the men who gave chase by darting into the soft snow, which is now a foot deep, and reappearing several yards off. The weather is too mild to satisfy us. We wish for severe frost to seal us up securely, and make the ice strong enough to bear the sledge loads of provisions, etc., which are to be landed for the purpose of making more room in the ship. 6th. A herd of a dozen reindeer crossed the harbour today. Last night Hobson and his companions returned all well. They were stopped by the sea washing against the cliffs in latitude 71 and a half degrees, and to that point they have advanced the depots. Although the weather has been stormy here, they have been able to travel every day. They found the coast still fringed with islets and deeply indented. Upon every point, moss-grown circles of stones indicated the abodes of Eskimo in times long since gone by. One night they muzzled a dog, as she was in the habit of gnawing her harness. In this defenceless state, unable even to bark and arouse the men, her amiable sisterhood attacked her so fiercely that she died the next day. In honour of so important and successful a commencement of our travelling, as that accomplished by Hobson, we had a feast of good venison, plum pudding and grog. It is quite evident that no more travelling can be accomplished until the ice forms a pathway along shore. In this, as in some other respects, we anxiously await the advance of the season. The weather is mild. Bellow Strait is almost covered with ice, which drifts freely with every tide. Reindeer are seen almost daily. They too are awaiting the freezing over of the sea to continue their southern travels. Our harbour ice is weak and covered a foot deep with a sludgy compound of snow and water. 8th. Yesterday an ermine was caught in a trap. Hitherto these most active little skirmishers have successfully robbed our fox traps of their baits as fast as they could be renewed. Today Peterson shot another reindeer. It weighs 130 pounds. Many others were seen, also a wolf. Sometimes ptarmigan are met with, but hares very rarely. 12th. Fine weather generally prevails. We have landed about 100 casks, all our boats, and much lumber, so we shall have abundance of room on board. I enjoyed a long and exhilarating ramble upon snowshoes today. Without them I could not have gone over half the distance. The snow lies so deep and soft, but I only saw one reindeer. 14th. One of our magnetic observatories has been built. It stands upon the ice, 210 yards south, magnetic, from the ship, and is built of ice sawed into blocks, there not being any suitable snow. It is just large enough to hold the declinometer for hourly observations, to be noted throughout the winter. The housings have been put over the ship already, as Hobson will leave us again in a few days to advance his depot and my own to the vicinity of the magnetic pole if possible. 
I would also send Young upon a similar duty, but the Western Sea cannot have frozen over yet. 19th. All the 17th a northwest gale blew with fearful violence. Yesterday it abated, but not sufficiently to allow our party to start. This morning Hobson got away with his nine men and ten dogs. His absence may be from 18 to 20 days. Autumn travelling is most disagreeable. There is so much wind and snow, the latter being soft, deep and often wet. The sun is almost always obscured by mist, and is powerless for warmth or drying purposes, and the temperature is very variable. Moreover, there are now only eight hours of misty daylight. Today the morning was fine, and temperature plus eight degrees. Having completed the preliminary observations of the times of horizontal and vertical vibrations, also of the magnetic intensity, I set up today the declinometer, and commence the hourly series of observations on the diurnal variation. I trust it may continue unbroken until we all set out upon our spring travels in March. A hare has been shot, but no other animals seen. 29th. It generally blows a gale of wind here. The only advantage in return for so much discomfort is that the snow is the more quickly packed hard. As we have only three working men and an Eskimo left on board for ship's duties, I was assisted a few days ago by the doctor, the engineer and the interpreter in building another observatory, intended for certain monthly magnetic observations. This edifice is constructed of snow. Whenever we have a calm night we can hear the crushing sound of the drift ice in Bellow Strait, which continues open to within 500 yards of the Fox Islands, and emits dark chilling clouds of hateful, pestilent, abominable mist. The last two days have been very fine and calm. The men visited their fox and ermine traps, which are secreted amongst the rocks in a most mysterious manner. One ermine only has been taken. Seven or eight reindeer and some ptarmigan were seen. Two of the latter and a hare were shot. We have commenced brewing sugar beer. 2nd November. Very dull times. No amount of ingenuity could make a diary worth the paper it is written on. An occasional raven flies past. A couple more ptarmigan have been shot. Another northwest gale is blowing, with temperature down to minus 12 degrees. 6th. Saturday night. The northwest gale blew without intermission for 70 hours, the temperature being about minus 15 degrees. We hoped that our absent shipmates might be housed safely in snow huts. This afternoon all doubts respecting them were dispelled by their arrival in good health, but they evidently have suffered from cold and exposure during their absence of nineteen days. For the first six days they journeyed outward successfully. On that night they encamped upon the ice. It was at spring tide. A northeast gale sprang up, and blowing off shore, detached the ice and drifted them off. The sea froze over on the secession of the gale, and two days afterwards they fortunately regained the land near the position from which they were blown off. They have indeed experienced much unusual danger and suffering from cold. As soon as they discovered that the ice was drifting off shore with them, they packed their sledges, harnessed their dogs, and passed the night in anxious watching for some chance to escape. When the ice got a little distance off shore, it broke up under the influence of the wind and sea, until the piece they were on was scarce twenty yards in diameter. This drifted across the mouth of a wide inlet until brought up against the opposite shore. The gale was quickly followed by an intense frost, which in a single night formed ice sufficiently strong to bear them in safety to the land, although it bent fearfully beneath their weight. The depots were eventually established in latitude 71 degrees. Beyond this, Lieutenant Hobson did not attempt to advance, not only because their remaining provisions would not have warranted a longer absence, but because the open sea was seen to beat against the next headland. They have lived in tents only, and have not experienced the heavy gales so frequent here, and which are probably due mainly to our position in Bellow Strait, which performs the part of a funnel for both winds and tides between the two seas. That the western sea should still remain open argues a vast space southward for the escape of the ice, and prevents our western party from carrying across their depot. The attempt to do so would be extremely hazardous. We must only be stirring earlier in the spring. I am truly thankful for the safe return of our travellers. All this toil and exposure of ten persons and ten dogs has only advanced the depots thirty miles further i.e. from sixty to ninety miles distant from the ship. Hardly a particle of snow remains upon the harbour ice, the recent gales having swept it away, and the porch of my snow hut has been fretted away to a mere cobweb by the attrition of the snowdrift. The doctor and I rebuilt it today. Three reindeer and a wolf have been seen. End of chapter 11
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. In the Arctic Seas by Captain F. L. McClintock Chapter 12 November 7th, Sunday evening Brief as is the interval since my last entry, yet how awful, and, to one of our small company, how fatal it has been. Yesterday Mr. Brand was out shooting as usual, and in robust health. In the evening Hobson sat with him for a little time. Mr. Brand turned the conversation upon our position and employments last year. He called to remembrance poor Robert Scott, then in sound health, and the fact of his having carried our Guy Fawkes round the ship on the preceding day twelvemonth, and added mournfully, Poor fellow, no one knows whose turn it may be to go next. He finished his evening pipe, and shut his cabin door shortly after nine o'clock. This morning, at seven o'clock, his servant found him lying upon the deck, a corpse, having been several hours dead. Apoplexy appears to have been the cause. He was a steady, serious man, under forty years of age, and leaves a widow and three or four children. What their circumstances are, I am not aware. 10th. This morning the remains of Mr. Brand, enclosed in a neat coffin, were buried in a grave on shore. A suitable headboard and inscription will be placed over it. From all that I have gathered, it appears that his mind had been somewhat gloomy for the last few days, dwelling much upon poor Scott's sudden death. Whether he really saw three reindeer on Saturday, watched their movements and fired his Minier rifle at them when 700 yards distant, or whether it was the creation of a disordered brain, none can tell. On his first return on board, he said he had seen deer tracks only. We are now without either engineer or engine driver. We have only two stokers, and they know nothing about the machinery. Our numbers are reduced to 24, including our interpreter and two Greenland Eskimo. 15th. We have enjoyed 10 days of moderate winds and calms, but the temperature has fallen as low as minus 31 degrees. This causes frost cracks in the ice across the harbour. They will freeze over, and others will form and gape and freeze at intervals, so that by next spring we shall probably be moved several inches, perhaps feet, offshore. Mists have obscured the sun of late, and now it does not rise at all. We are indifferent. Its departure has become to us a matter of course. The usual winter covering of snow has been spread upon deck rather more than a foot thick. Its utility in preventing the escape of heat became at once strikingly apparent. Nothing has been seen but a few ptarmigan and one reindeer, which trotted off towards the ship. Our bullets missed him, and the dogs unfortunately caught sight and chased him away. I do not think any dogs could overtake a reindeer in this rough country. The rocks would speedily lame them, and the snow, in many places, is quite deep enough to fatigue them greatly whereas it offers but slight impediment to the deer, furnished as he is with long legs and spreading hoofs. 29th. Animals have become very scarce. A few ptarmigan and willow grouse have been seen, and three shot. Two days ago I saw two reindeer. The eastern sea is frozen over, and our old acquaintance, the iceberg in Prince Regent's Inlet, is still visible on a clear day. We brew sugar beer, and we set nets for seals, but catch none. The nets have been made and set in favourable positions under the ice by the Greenlanders, so we suppose the seals have migrated elsewhere. If so, the Eskimo could not winter here. We have no regular school this winter, but five of the men study navigation every evening under the guidance of Young. Hobson and I are doing all we can to make the ship dry, warm and comfortable. Our large snow porches over the hatchways are a great improvement. 5th December cold windy weather with chilling mists from the open water in Bellow Strait. We can seldom leave the shelter of the ship for a walk on shore, and when we do, rarely see even a ptarmigan. 12th. Very cold weather, thermometer down to minus 41 degrees, and the breeze comes to us loaded with mist from the open water, causing the air to feel colder than it otherwise would. Bellow Strait has become a nuisance, not only from this cause, but from the strong winds, purely local, which seldom cease to blow through it. The seal nets have produced nothing, and, as there are no seals, we no longer wonder at not seeing bears. Three foxes have been trapped, and a hare seen. Our canine force numbers 24 serviceable dogs and six puppies, but these, I fear, will not be strong enough for sledging by March. 
the monotony of our lives is vastly increased by want of occupation and confinement by severe gales to the ship for five days out of every seven the general health is good but there is a natural craving for fresh meat and fresh vegetables in great measure perhaps because they cannot be obtained but a well-filled letter-bag would be more welcome than anything i know of twenty sixth upon four days only during the last fourteen has the weather permitted us to walk i allude to the wind as the obstacle to our exercise for the temperature when the air is still is no bar to any reasonable amount of it three or four coveys of ptarmigan have been seen and of these i shot one brace the cold increases thermometer has fallen to minus forty seven and a half degrees although blowing a moderate gale at the time and the atmosphere dense with mist our christmas has been spent with a degree of loyalty to the old english custom at once spirited and refreshing all the good things which could possibly be collected together appeared upon the snow-white deal tables of the men as the officers and myself walked by invitation round the lower deck venison beer and a fresh stock of clay pipes appeared to be the most prized luxuries but the variety and abundance of the eatables tastefully laid out was such as might well support the delusion which all seemed desirous of imposing upon themselves that they were in a land of plenty in fact all but at home we contributed a large cheese and some preserves and candles superseded the ordinary smoky lamps with so many comforts and the existence of so much genuine good feeling their evening was a joyous one enlivened also by songs and music whilst all was order and merriment within the ship the scene without was widely different a fierce northwester howled loudly through the rigging the snowdrift rushed swiftly past no star appeared through the oppressive gloom and the thermometer varied between seventy six degrees and eighty degrees below the freezing point at one time it was impossible to visit the magnetic observatory although only two hundred and ten yards distant and with a rope stretched along breast high upon poles the whole way the officers discharged this duty for the quartermasters of the watches during the day and night first january eighteen fifty nine this being saturday night as well as new year's day sweethearts and wives were remembered with even more than the ordinary feeling new year's eve was celebrated with all the joyfulness which ardent hope can inspire and we have reasonable ground for strong hope at midnight the expiration of the old year and commencement of the new one was announced to me by the band flutes accordion and gong striking up at my door some songs were sung and the performance concluded with god save the queen the few who could find space in our mess room sang the chorus but this by no means satisfied all the others who were without and unable to show themselves to the officers so they echoed the chorus and the effect was very pleasing our new year's day has been commemorated with all the substantials of christmas fare but without so much display less tailoring in pastry not quite so much clipping of dough into roses and anchors and nondescript animals etc etc the past week has been cold and stormy it now blows strong and the temperature is minus forty four degrees on the twenty ninth a few fresh tracks of animals and a ptarmigan were seen yesterday i saw three ptarmigan december proved to be an unusually cold month its mean temperature being minus thirty three degrees and it was rendered more than ordinarily dark and gloomy by continual mists from bellow strait this open water adds seriously to the drawbacks of a spot already sufficiently cheerless gameless and wind-loved ninth another week of uniform temperature of minus forty degrees and confinement to the ship by strong winds the atmosphere is loaded with enveloping mists which impart a raw and surprisingly keen edge to the chilling blasts blasts that no human nose can endure without blanching be its proportions what they may it is wonderful how the dogs stand it and without apparent inconvenience unless their fur happen to be thin they lie upon the snow under the lee of the ship with no other protection from the weather Today, the winds being light and temperature up to minus thirty degrees, we enjoyed walks on shore, although the mist continued so dense as to limit our view to a couple of hundred yards. I learned from Peterson that the natives of Smith Sound are well acquainted with the continuation of its shores considerably beyond the farthest point reached by Kane's exploring parties, but unfortunately no one thought of getting them to delineate their local knowledge upon paper. They spoke of a much larger island near the west coast called Umingmak muskox island where there was much open water abounding with walrus and where some of their people formerly lived eskimo exist upon the east coast of greenland as far north as latitude seventy six degrees 
they are separated from the south greenlanders by hundreds of miles of ice-bound coasts and impassable glaciers many centuries ago a milder climate may and probably did exist and the corresponding modification of glacier and a sea less ice encumbered might have rendered the migration of these poor people from the south to their present isolated abodes practicable but to me it appears much more easy to suppose that they migrated eastward from the northern outlet of smith sound twenty first more pleasant weather since my last entry and although last night the temperature fell to minus forty seven degrees yet it has generally been mild once it rose to minus fourteen degrees but amply made amends by falling to minus thirty eight degrees within twelve hours we have enjoyed much of the moon's presence for the last ten days but she is now waning and hastening away to the south daylight increases in strength and duration consequently we walk more and see more and the winter's gloom gives place to activity and cheerfulness several ptarmigan three or four hares a snowy owl and a bear track have at various times been seen young has shot four ptarmigan and i have shot a couple more and a hare and the men have trapped two foxes on board the ship the preparations for travelling take precedence of all other occupations twenty sixth part of the sun's disk loomed above the horizon to-day somewhat swollen and disfigured by the misty atmosphere but looking benevolent withal i happened to be diligently traversing the rocky hillsides in the hope of finding some solitary hare dozing in fancied security when the sun thus appeared in view and halted to feast my eyes upon the glorious sight and scan the features of our returning friend hope and promise mingled in his bright beams again i moved upward and with more elastic step for now the sun of eighteen fifty nine was shining upon all nature around me second february a lovely calm bright day and beautifully clear except over the water space in bellow strait where rests a densely black mist very strongly resembling the west indian rain squall as it looms upon the distant horizon the increasing sunlight is cheering but void of heat and the mercury is often frozen a few more ptarmigan have been shot our remaining serviceable dogs twenty-two in number have been divided with great care into three teams of seven each the odd dog is added to my team as my journey is expected to be the longest the different sledge parties will now feed up their dogs without limit so the utmost degree of work may be got out of them hereafter january has been slightly colder than december mean temperature being minus thirty three and a half degrees but there has been rather less wind eighth all will be ready for the departure of young and myself upon our respective journeys upon the morning of the fourteenth mr peterson and alexander thompson accompany me with two dog sledges and fifteen dogs dragging twenty-four days provisions my object is to communicate with the boothians in the vicinity of the magnetic pole young takes his party of four men and his dog sledge he will carry forward provisions for his spring exploration of the shores of prince of wales land between the extreme points reached by lieutenants osborne and brown in eighteen fifty one on the third i walked for seven and a half hours and saw two reindeer but could not approach within shot young examined the water space in the strait and finds it washes both shores but extends east and west only about one mile the doctor has seen a seal and a dove key sporting in it for the last four days strong winds and intense cold have prevented us from rambling over the hills besides which the minor preparations for travelling have given us more occupation on board james pitcher has got a slight touch of scurvy his gums are inflamed and now it comes out that he dislikes preserved meats and has not eaten any since he has been in the ship he has lived upon salt meat and preserved vegetables except for the very short periods in summer when birds could be obtained he is rather a used up old fellow too much so for our severe sledge work therefore is one of the few who will remain to take care of the ship that he should have retained his health for seventeen months under the circumstances speaks well for the wholesomeness and quality of our provisions and the ventilation and cleanliness of the ship tenth extremely cold with dense mists from the open water yesterday eight ptarmigan and a sooty fox were seen we have consumed the last of our venison it supplied us for three days we are drinking out of a cask of sugar beer which is a very mild but agreeable beverage we make it on board sunday night thirteenth tomorrow morning if fine young and i set off upon our travels 
he has advanced a portion of his sledge load to the west side of the water in bellow strait having been obliged to carry it over land for about a mile in order to get there i have explored the route to the long lake and find we can reach it without crossing elevated or uncovered land i saw two reindeer and young saw about twenty ptarmigan the mean temperature of february up to this date is minus thirty three point two degrees being an exact continuation of january i confess to some anxiety upon this point as hitherto the winter has been unusually severe and the journeys to be performed will occupy more than twenty days besides we shall be earlier in motion than any of the previous travellers unless we are to make an exception in favour of mr kennedy's trip of thirty miles from batty bay to fury beach between the fifth and tenth january during which time the lowest temperature registered was only minus twenty five degrees should either young or myself remain absent beyond the period for which we carry provisions hobson is to send a party in search of us a sooty fox has been captured lately fifteenth a strong northwest wind with a temperature of minus forty degrees confines us on board one cannot face these winds therefore it is fortunate that we did not start the ship being much more comfortable than a snow hut twentieth march already i have been a week on board and so difficult is it to settle down to anything like sedentary occupation after a period of continued vigorous action that even now i can scarcely sit still to scribble a brief outline of my trip to cape victoria on the morning of the seventeenth february the weather moderated sufficiently for us to set out the temperature throughout the day varied between minus thirty one degrees and minus forty two and a half degrees leaving young's party to pass on through the strait i proceeded by the way of the long lake which i found to be ten and a half geographical miles in length with an average width of half a mile we built our snow hut upon the west coast near pemmican rock after a march of nineteen or twenty geographical miles we always speak of geographical miles with reference to our marches six geographical are equal to seven english miles on the following day the old northwest wind sprang up with renewed vigour and the temperature fell to minus forty eight degrees the cold was therefore intense on the third day our dogs went lame in consequence of sore feet the intense cold seems to be the principal if not the only cause having hardened the surface snow beyond what their feet can endure i was obliged to throw off a part of the provisions still we could not make more than twelve or eighteen miles daily we of course walked so that the dogs had only the remaining provisions and clothing to drag yet several of them repeatedly fell down in fits for several days this severe weather continued the mercury of my artificial horizon remaining frozen its freezing point is minus thirty nine degrees and our rum at first thick like treacle required thawing latterly when the more fluid and stronger part had been used we travelled each day until dusk and then were occupied for a couple of hours in building our snow hut the four walls were run up until five and a half feet high inclining inwards as much as possible over these our tent was laid to form a roof we could not afford the time necessary to construct a dome of snow our equipment consisted of a very small brown holland tent mackintosh floor cloth and felt robes besides this each man had a bag of double blanketing and a pair of fur boots to sleep in we wore moccasins over the pieces of blanket in which our feet were wrapped up and with the exception of a change of this footgear carried no spare clothes the daily routine was as follows i led the way peterson and thompson followed conducting their sledges and in this manner we trudged on for eight or ten hours without halting except when necessary to disentangle the dog harness when we halted for the night thompson and i usually sawed out the blocks of compact snow and carried them to peterson who acted as the master mason in building the snow hut the hour and a half or two hours usually employed in erecting the edifice was the most disagreeable of the day's labour for in addition to being already well tired and desiring repose we became thoroughly chilled while standing about when the hut was finished the dogs were fed and here the great difficulty was to ensure the weaker ones their full share in the scramble for supper then commenced the operation of unpacking the sledge and carrying into our hut everything necessary for ourselves such as provision and sleeping gear as well as all boots fur mittens and even the sledge dog harness to prevent the dogs from eating them during our sleeping hours the door was now blocked up with snow the cooking lamp lighted foot gear changed diary written up watches wound sleeping bags wriggled into pipes lighted and the merits of various dogs discussed until supper was ready 
the supper swallowed the upper robe or coverlet was pulled over and then to sleep next morning came breakfast a struggle to get into frozen moccasins after which the sledges were packed and another day's march commenced in these little huts we usually slept warm enough although latterly when our blankets and clothes became loaded with ice we felt the cold severely when our low doorway was carefully blocked up with snow and the cooking lamp alight the temperature quickly rose so that the walls became glazed and our bedding thawed but the cooking over or the doorway partially opened it as quickly fell again so that it was impossible to sleep or even to hold one's pannikin of tea without putting our mitts on so intense was the cold on the twenty first i visited our main depot laid out last october it was safe but unfortunately had been carried far into rottersley inlet and only forty miles south of bellow strait on the twenty second an easterly gale prevented our marching but we had the good fortune to shoot a bear so consoled ourselves with fresh steaks and the dogs with an ample feed of unfrozen flesh a treat they had not enjoyed for many months we coasted along a granitic land deeply indented and fringed with islands and found it to be the general characteristic of the boothian shore from bellow strait until we had accomplished half the distance to the magnetic pole limestone then appeared and the remainder of our journey was performed along a low straight shore which afforded us much greater facility for sledging throughout the whole distance we found a mixture of heavy old ice and light ice of last autumn in many places squeezed up into pack but as we advanced southward aged flows were less frequently seen on the first of march we halted to encamp about the position of the magnetic pole for no cairn remains to mark the spot i had almost concluded that my journey would prove to be a work of labour in vain because hitherto no traces of eskimo had been met with and in consequence of the reduced state of our provisions and the wrecked condition of the poor dogs six out of the fifteen being quite useless i could only advance one more march but we had done nothing more than look ahead when we halted and turned around great indeed was my surprise and joy to see four men walking after us peterson and i immediately buckled on our revolvers and advanced to meet them the natives halted made fast their dogs laid down their spears and received us without any evidence of surprise they told us they had been out upon a seal hunt on the ice and were returning home we proposed to join them and were all soon in motion again but another hour brought sunset and we learned that their snow village of eight huts was still a long way off so we hired them at the rate of a needle for each eskimo to build us a hut which they completed in an hour it was eight feet in diameter five and a half feet high and in it we all passed the night perhaps the records of architecture do not furnish another instance of a dwelling-house so cheaply constructed we gave them to understand that we were anxious to barter with them and very cautiously approached the real object of our visit a naval button upon one of their dresses afforded the opportunity it came they said from some white people who were starved upon an island where there are salmon that is in a river and that the iron of which their knives were made came from the same place one of these men said he had been to the island to obtain wood and iron but none of them had seen the white men another man had been to ewillick repulse bay and counted on his fingers seven individuals of ray's party whom he remembered having seen these eskimo had nothing to eat and no other clothing than their ordinary double dresses of fur they would not eat our biscuit or salt pork but took a small quantity of bear's blubber and some water they slept in a sitting posture with their heads leaning forward on their breasts next morning we travelled about ten miles further by which time we were close to cape victoria beyond this i would not go much as they wished to lead us on we therefore landed and they built us a commodious snow hut in half an hour this done we displayed to them our articles for barter knives files needles scissors beads etc expressed our desire to trade with them and promised to purchase everything that belonged to the starved white men if they would come to us on the morrow notwithstanding that the weather was stormy and bitterly cold two of the natives stripped off their outer coats of reindeer skin and bartered them for a knife each despite the gale which howled outside we spent a comfortable night in our roomy hut next morning the entire village population arrived amounting to about forty-five souls from aged people to infants in arms and bartering commenced very briskly first of all we purchased all the relics of the lost expedition consisting of six silver spoons and forks a silver medal the property of mr a macdonald assistant surgeon part of a gold chain several buttons and knives made of the iron and wood of the wreck 
also bows and arrows constructed of materials obtained from the same source. Having secured these, we purchased a few frozen salmon, some seal's blubber and venison, but could not prevail upon them to part with more than one of their fine dogs. One of their sledges was made of two stout pieces of wood, which might have been a boat's keel. All the old people recollected the visit of the victory. An old man told me his name was Ubloria. I recollected that Sir James Ross had employed a man of that name as a guide, and reminded him of it. He was in fact the same individual, and he inquired after Sir James by his Eskimo name of Ag Luga. I inquired after the man who was furnished with a wooden leg by the carpenter of the victory. No direct answer was given, but his daughter was pointed out to me. Peterson explained to me that they do not like alluding in any way to the dead, and that, as my question was not answered, it was certain the man was no longer amongst the living. None of the people had seen the whites. One man said he had seen their bones upon the island where they died, but some were buried. Peterson also understood him to say that the boat was crushed by the ice. Almost all of them had part of the plunder. They said they will be here when we return, and will trade more with us. Also that we shall find natives upon Montreal Island at the time of our arriving there. Next morning, 4th March, several natives came to us again. I bought a spear six and a half feet long from a man who told Peterson distinctly that a ship having three masts had been crushed by the ice out in the sea to the west of King William's Island, but that all the people landed safely. He was not one of those who were eyewitnesses of it. The ship sunk, so nothing was obtained by the natives from her. All that they have got, he said, came from the island in the river. The spear staff appears to have been part of the gunwale of a light boat. One old man, Unali, made a rough sketch of the coastline with his spear upon the snow, and said it was eight journeys to where the ship sank, pointing in the direction of Cape Felix. I can make nothing out of his rude chart. The information we obtained bears out the principal statements of Dr. Ray, and also accounts for the disappearance of one of his ships, but it gives no clue to the whereabouts of the other, nor the direction whence the ships come. One thing is tolerably certain, the crews did not at any time land upon the Boothian shore. These Eskimo were all well clothed in reindeer dresses, and looked clean. They appeared to have abundance of provisions, but scarcely a scrap of wood was seen amongst them which had not come from the lost expedition. Their sledges, with the exception of the one already spoken of, were wretched little affairs, consisting of two frozen rolls of sealskins coated with ice, and attached to each other by bones which served as the crossbars. The men were stout, hearty fellows, and the women arrant thieves, but all were good-humoured and friendly. The women were decidedly plain. In fact, this term would have been flattering to most of them. Yet there was a degree of vivacity and gentleness in the manners of some that soon reconciled us to these arctic specimens of the fair sex. They had fine eyes and teeth, as well as very small hands, and the young girls had a fresh, rosy hue not often seen in combination with olive complexions. Eskimo mothers carry their infants on their backs within their large fur dresses, and where the babes can only be got at by pulling them out over their shoulder. Whilst intent upon my bargaining for silver spoons and forks belonging to Franklin's expedition, at the rate of a few needles or a knife for each relic, one pertinacious old dame, having obtained all she was likely to get from me for herself, pulled out her infant by the arm, and quietly held the poor little creature, for it was perfectly naked, before me in the breeze, the temperature at the time being sixty degrees below freezing point. Peterson informed me that she was begging for a needle for her child. I need not say I gave it one as expeditiously as possible, yet sufficient time elapsed before the infant was again put out of sight to alarm me considerably for its safety in such a temperature. The natives, however, seemed to think nothing of what looked to me like the cruel exposure of a naked baby. We now returned to the ship with all the speed we could command, but stormy weather occasioned a two days' delay, so that we did not arrive on board until the 14th of March. Though considerably reduced in flesh, I and my companions were in excellent health, and blessed with insatiable appetites. On washing our faces, which had become perfectly black from the soot of our blubber lamp, Sundry scars, relics of frostbites, appeared, and the tips of our fingers, from constant frostbites, had become as callous as if seared with hot iron. In this journey of twenty-five days we travelled three hundred and sixty geographical miles, four hundred and twenty English, and completed the discovery of the coastline of continental America, thereby adding about one hundred and twenty miles to our charts. 
The mean temperature throughout of the journey was 30 degrees below zero of Fahrenheit, or 62 degrees below the freezing point of water. On reaching the ship, I at once assembled my small crew and told them of the information we had obtained, pointing out that there still remained one of the ships unaccounted for, and therefore it was necessary to carry out all our projected lines of search. During this journey I acquired the arctic accomplishment of eating frozen blubber in delicate little slices, and vastly preferred it to frozen pork. At the present moment I do not think I could even taste it, but the same privation and hunger which induced me to eat of such food would doubtless enable me again to partake of it very kindly. I shot a couple of foxes which came playing about the dogs. Conscious of their superior speed, they were very impudent, snapping at the dogs' tails and passing almost under their noses. I shot these foxes, intending to eat them, but the dogs anticipated me with respect to one. The other we feasted off at our mess table, and thought it by no means bad. It was insipid, but decidedly better to our tastes than preserved meat. Captain Allen Young and his party had returned on board on the 3rd of March, having placed their depot upon the shore of Prince of Wales Land, about 70 miles southwest of the ship. Young found the ice in Bellow Strait so rough as to be impassable, and was obliged to adopt the lake route. Prince of Wales land was found to be composed of limestone. The shore was low and fringed for a distance of ten miles to seaward with an ancient land flow. The remaining width of the strait between this land, North Somerset, and Prince of Wales land was about fifteen miles, and this space was composed of ice formed since September last. This was the water we looked at so anxiously last autumn from Cape Bird and Pemmican Rock. His party lived in their tent, protected from the wind by snow walls, and, like ourselves, escaped with a few trivial frostbites. So far, all was very satisfactory, the general health good, and the eagerness of my crew to commence travelling quite charming. Young proposed carrying out another depot to the northwest in order to explore well up Peel Strait, and would have started on the 17th, but the weather was too severe. The day was spent in a fruitless search for three casks of sugar, a serious and unaccountable deficiency, but as it was important to replace them with as little delay as possible, Young set off on the 18th, although it blew a northwest gale at the time, with two men and eighteen dogs for Fury Beach. Failing to find the requisite quantity there, he will go on to Port Leopold. End of chapter 12「Thirteen of In the Arctic Seas. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. In the Arctic Seas by Captain F. L. McClintock. Chapter 13 Dr. Walker's zeal for travelling was not to be restrained. I therefore gladly availed myself of his willingness to go with a party to Cape Airy and bring back the depot of provisions left there in August last. These trips will delay our spring journey for a few days. During my absence from the Fox, the weather was often stormy, and temperature unusually low. The mean for the month of February was minus 36 degrees, showing it to be one of the coldest on record. When possible, the men were allowed to go out shooting, and obtain fifty or sixty ptarmigan and a hare. A few foxes were taken in traps, and two reindeer were seen. Yesterday, two bears came near the ship, but were frightened away by the dogs. Hobson shot two ptarmigan. Today I rambled over the hills, the weather being fine, and saw a hare. 29th. Continued fine weather. A couple more foxes and a lemming in its brown coat have been captured, and a hare and four ptarmigan shot. This fine bright weather seems to have awakened the lemmings and ermines. Their tracks, which were very rarely seen during winter, are now tolerably numerous. Foxes appear in greater numbers, probably following up the ptarmigan from the south. The thermometer ranges between zero and minus twenty degrees. It has once been up to plus thirteen degrees. When exposed to a noonday sun against the ship's side, it rises fifty degrees higher. The earth thermometer, placed two feet two inches beneath the surface, which gradually fell until the tenth of this month, has now begun to ascend. Its minimum was one half of a degree. Much snow also lay over it, six feet deep at this season. On the 25th, Dr. Walker and his party returned, not having been able to find the depot. They found a barrel of flour upon the beach a few miles south of Brentford Bay. It appeared to have lain there for years, just inside a shingle projection, which kept off the ice pressure, so that it had not been forced up high upon the beach. 
the ice which bore it there probably from port leopold had disappeared and the cask was frozen into the shingle the heading has been brought on board but the scribing upon it is very indistinct and unintelligible to us the flower is of the ordinary description used in the navy and known as seconds most of it was good and a plain pudding made of it for our mess could not be distinguished from fresh flour a specimen has been preserved with the view of identifying it with the fury beach or port leopold stores of flour with the exception of a solitary bear the party saw no living creatures the shore along which they travelled was a very low shingly limestone last evening i was delighted to see young and his two dog sledges heave into sight he brought about eight hundred weight of sugar from fury beach but not without much difficulty owing to the roughness of the pack in creswell bay and also to the breaking down of one of his sledges to avoid this pack he found it necessary to travel nearly all round creswell bay cape garry he describes as a gradually curved extent of flat land and not the decided cape it appears to be upon the chart two reindeer were seen near it and during the journey four bears no other animals were met with his labours had been very severe one sledge broke down and all the sugar had to be piled upon the other the consequence was that the sledge was so heavily loaded that it would only run freely after the dogs on smooth ice and directly any hummocks were encountered the dogs with their usual instinct not to drag a sledge unless it does run freely would lie down and oblige captain young and his two men to unload and carry the packages over the obstacle upon their own backs after this snow blindness came on young and one of his men became blind as kittens the third man had to load lead and unload them when these portages occurred young's eskimo dog driver samuel was quite blind when the party reached the ship two dogs not choosing to allow themselves to be caught and put in harness had been still left behind at the last encampment there still remains at fury beach an immense stack of preserved vegetables and soups the party supped off them and found them good young brought me back two specimen tins of carrots plain and carrots and gravy all small casks and packages were covered with snow of the large ones which appeared through it he saw thirty-four casks of flour five of split peas five of tobacco and four of sugar only a very few tons of coals remained there were two boats a short four-oared gig and a large cutter the former required nothing but caulking to make her serviceable but the latter had a large portion of one bow and side cut out as if for making or repairing flat sledges no record was found we now have enough sugar to last us for seven or eight months but by the survey of provisions which has just been completed we find a deficiency of many other articles including three casks of salt beef fortunately this is of no consequence as we have abundance of both salt and preserved meat but it shows the alarming extent to which a negligent steward may mislead one this unfortunate man has now got scurvy want of exercise and fresh air is the apparent cause combined with irregular living the spirits have hitherto been in his charge the bustle of preparation for the extended searching journeys has been exciting hobson's party and my own are now all prepared and young having returned we propose setting out on the second of april god willing young's new sledge will be ready and he will also start a few days after us all our winter defences of snow our porches our deck layer and our external embankment have been removed dr walker of necessity remains in charge of the ship with two stewards a cook a carpenter and a stoker my party as well as hobson's will be provisioned including the depots for an absence of about eighty-four days but not being able to afford auxiliary or supporting sledge parties much time will be occupied in transporting our depots further out in order that we may start with as much as we can possibly carry from the magnetic pole besides leaving there a depot for our return the declinometer was taken on board two days ago hourly observations have been made with it for more than five months we can no longer spare any one for this interesting duty twenty fourth june one thing is certain the wild sort of tent life we lead in arctic exploration quite unfits one for such tame work as writing up a journal my present attempt will illustrate the fact yet with such ample materials what a deeply interesting volume might be written since i last opened this familiar old diary the repository alike of dry facts and the most trivial notes winter has passed away summer is far advanced and the glorious sun is again returning southward we too have endeavoured to move on with the times and seasons as for myself i have visited montreal island completed the exploration and circuit of king william's island 
passing on foot through the only feasible northwest passage but all this is as nothing to the interest attached to the franklin records picked up by hobson and now safe in my possession we now know the fate of the erebus and terror the sole object of our voyage has at length been completed and we anxiously await the time when escape from these bleak regions will become practicable the morning of april second was inauspicious but as the day advanced the weather improved so that hobson and i were able to set out upon our journeys we each had a sledge drawn by four men besides a dog sledge and a dog driver mr peterson having volunteered his services to drive my dogs an offer too valuable to be declined managed my dog sledge throughout our five starveling puppies were harnessed for the first time in their lives to a small sledge which i drove myself intending to sell them to the eskimo if i could get them to drag their own supply of provisions so far the procession looked imposing it certainly was deeply interesting there were five sledges twelve men and seventeen dogs the latter of all sizes and shapes the ship hoisted the royal harwich yacht flag and our sledges displayed their gay silk banners mine was a very beautiful one given me by lady franklin it bears her name in white letters upon a red ground and is margined with white embroidery it was worked by the sisters of captain collinson the equipment of my sledge party and the weights were as follows those of hobson and young were almost precisely similar two sledges and fitting complete one hundred and ten pounds tent waterproof blanket floor cloth two sleeping robes and six blanket sleeping bags ninety pounds cooking utensils shovel saw snow knife and sundry small articles forty pounds sledge gun and ammunition twenty pounds magnetic and astronomical instruments sixty pounds six knapsacks containing spare clothing sixty pounds various tins and bags in which provision and fuel were stored fifty pounds articles for barter forty pounds provisions nine hundred and thirty pounds total one thousand four hundred pounds the load for each man to drag was fixed at two hundred pounds and for each dog one hundred pounds our provisions consisted mainly of pemmican biscuit and tea with a small addition of boiled pork rum and some tobacco the men being untrained to the work and sledges heavily laden our march was fatiguing and slow we encamped that night upon the long lake on the second day we reached the western sea and upon the third aided by our sledge sails we advanced some miles beyond arsidecny island the various depots carried out with so much difficulty and danger in autumn were now gathered up as we advanced until at length we were so loaded as to be compelled to proceed with one half at a time going three times over the same ground for six days this tedious mode of progression was persevered in by which time fifteenth april we reached the low limestone shore in latitude seventy one degrees seven minutes north and which continues thence in an almost straight line southward for sixty or seventy miles we now commenced laying down provisions for our consumption upon the return journey and the snow being unusually level we were able to advance with the whole of our remaining provisions amounting to nearly sixty days allowance hitherto the temperature continued low often nearly thirty degrees below zero and at times with cutting north winds bright sun and intensely strong snow glare although we wore coloured spectacles yet almost all suffered great inconvenience and considerable pain from inflamed eyes our faces were blistered lips and hands cracked never were men more disfigured by the combined effects of bright sun and bitterly cold winds fortunately no serious frostbites occurred but frostbitten faces and fingers were universal on twentieth of april in latitude seventy and a half degrees north we met two families of natives comprising twelve individuals their snow huts were upon the ice three quarters of a mile off shore and their occupation was seal hunting they were the same people with whom i had communicated at cape victoria in february old una lee laid his hands on peterson's shoulders to measure their width and said he is fatter now true enough the february temperature and sharp marching had caused both of us at that time to shrink considerably their snow huts were built in the above form the common entrance and both passages being just sufficiently high to get in without having to crawl upon our hands and knees a slab of ice in the roof admitted sufficient light a snow bank or bench two feet high and occupying half the area of each hut was covered with reindeer skins and formed the family place of repose 
an angular snow bench served as the kitchen table and immediately beside it sat the lady of the establishment attending the stone lamp which stood thereon and the stone cooking vessel suspended over it the lamp was a shallow open vessel the fuel seal oil and the wick dried moss her tinder box was a little sealskin bag of soft dry moss and with a lump of iron pyrites and a broken file she struck fire upon it i purchased the file because it was marked with the government broad arrow we saw two large snow shovels made of mahogany board some long spear handles a bow of english wood two preserved meat tins and a deal case which might have once contained a large telescope or a barometer it measured three feet one inch in length by nine inches wide and three and a half inches deep there was no lid but part of the brass hinges remained i also purchased a knife which had some indistinct markings upon it such as ships cutlasses or swords usually have the man told us it had been picked up on the shore near where a ship lay stranded that it was then about the length of his arm but his countryman who picked it up broke it into lengths to make knives after much anxious inquiry we learned that two ships had been seen by the natives of king william's island one of them was seen to sink in deep water and nothing was obtained from her a circumstance at which they expressed much regret but the other was forced on shore by the ice where they suppose she still remains but is much broken from this ship they have obtained most of their wood etc and utlulik is the name of the place where she grounded formerly many natives lived there now very few remain all of the natives have obtained plenty of the wood the most of this information was given us by the young man who sold the knife old unali who drew the rough chart for me in march to show where the ship sank now answered our questions respecting the one force on shore not a syllable about her did he mention on the former occasion although we asked whether they knew of only one ship i think he would have willingly kept us in ignorance of the wreck being upon their coasts and that the young man unwittingly made it known to us the latter also told us that the body of a man was found on board the ship that he must have been a very large man and had long teeth this is all he recollected having been told for he was quite a child at the time they both told us it was in the fall of the year that is august or september when the ships were destroyed that all the white people went away to the large river taking a boat or boats with them and that in the following winter their bones were found there these two eskimo families had been up as far north as the tasmania group in latitude seventy one and a quarter degrees north and were returning to nayat chile hunting seals by the way those we met at cape victoria had already gone there the nearest natives to us at present they said were residing at the island of amitoki ten days distant from here can this amitoki be matty island we purchased some seals blubber and flesh as well as their two only dogs but next morning unali repented of his bargain or feigned to do so but as he came without the knife to exchange back we retained his dog he tried to steal a tin vessel off one of the sledges and perhaps it was for the purpose of regaining our favour that he made known to us just as we were starting that his countrymen had followed my homeward track in march discovering my depot of blubber articles for barter and two revolvers and carried them all off to nayat chile by no means pleasant intelligence their dogs must have enabled them to find the blubber by scenting it for it was buried under four feet of snow and strong winds obliterated all traces upon the surface i was now glad we had purchased both the dogs of the men as it would probably prevent their seeking for our depots to the northward the knowledge of the insecurity of all depots amongst these people will keep us on our guard for the future i regretted the loss of the pistols as it left my party with no other arms than two guns una lee told us when we first met him that one of his countrymen was very sick not seeing a sick man in their huts we forgot all about it until after starting when peterson interpreted to me una lee's parting information and told me how he described that the breech of the revolver turned round it then occurred to me that one of the men might have been wounded they had discovered how to cock the locks and the pistols were loaded and capped una lee was well acquainted with the coastline up to bellow strait and had different names for the different headlands although he had never been so far north he made many inquiries about the position of our ship her size and the number of men had he been able to travel so far with his wife and several young children and without sledge or dogs i think he would certainly have gone up to port kennedy we did not give him any encouragement to do so his wife was one of the most importune of the many women we saw at cape victoria in march she was the woman who plucked out an infant by its arm from inside her dress and exposed it regardless of minus thirty degrees and a fresh wind as i have previously told the information respecting both the missing ships was most important and it remained for us to discover if possible the stranded ship 
Continuing our journey, we crossed a wide bay upon level ice, and the most perfectly smooth hard snow I ever saw. There must have been much open water here late last autumn. Seven or eight snow huts, recently abandoned, were found near the magnetic pole. During the 25th, 26th, and 27th, we were confined to our tents by a very heavy southeast gale, with severe cold. Early on the 28th we reached Cape Victoria. Here Hobson and I separated. He marched direct for Cape Felix, King William's Land, whilst I kept a more southerly course. Not daring to leave depots upon this coast, we carried on our whole supply, intending to deposit a small portion upon the Clarence Islands. Hobson was unwell when we parted, complaining of stiffness and pain in his legs. Neither of us then suspected the cause. I gave him directions to search the west coast of King William's Island for the stranded ship, and for records, and to act upon such information as he might obtain in this way, or from the natives. But should that shore prove destitute of traces, to carry out if possible our original plan for the completion of discovery and search upon Victoria land, comprising the blank space between the extremes visited by Captain Collinson and Mr. Winniot. I soon found that my party had to labour across a rough pack, nor was it until the third day that we completed the traverse of the strait, and encamped near to the entrance of Port Parry, in King William's Island. Although the weather was clear, and that by our reckoning we passed directly over the assigned position of the two southern of the Clarence Islands, yet we saw nothing of them. A day was devoted to securing a depot in a huge mass of grounded ice, and in repairing and drying equipment, or, to speak more correctly, in getting rid of the ice which encumbered our sleeping bags and gear. This we effected by beating them well and exposing them to the direct rays of the sun. Magnetic and other observations gave me ample employment, the only immediate result of which was my being almost snow-blind for the following two days. On May 2nd we set off again briskly, our load being diminished to thirty days' provisions, and the sledge sail set, we soon reached the land and travelled along it for Cape Sabine. It was very thick weather, and we were unable to see any distance in consequence of the mist and snowdrift. The following day was no better, and the shore, which we dared not leave to cross the bays, was extremely low. We soon discovered that we had strayed inland, but guided by the wind continued our course. Upon May 4th we descended into Wellington Strait, and the weather being tolerably clear, crossed over to the southwest extreme of Matty Island, in the hope of meeting with natives, no traces of them having been met with since leaving Cape Victoria. Off this southwest point we found a deserted village of nearly twenty snow huts, besides several others within a few miles upon either side of it. In all of them I found shavings or chips of different kinds of wood from the lost expedition. They appear to have been abandoned only within a fortnight or three weeks. Abundance of blubber was gathered up to increase our stock of fuel, and had we encamped here, the dogs would have feeded sumptuously off the scraps and bones of seals strewed about. The runners or sides of some old sledges left here were very ingeniously formed out of rolls of sealskin, about three and a half feet long, and flattened so as to be two or three inches wide and five inches high. The sealskins appeared to have been well soaked and then rolled up, flattened into the required form and allowed to freeze. The underneath part was coated with a mixture of moss and ice laid smoothly on by hand before being allowed to freeze. The moss, I suppose, answering the purpose of hair in mortar to make the compound adhere more firmly. From this spot the shoreline of Matty Island turned sharply to the north-northeast. There were some considerable islands to the east, but thinking the most southerly of this group, named Owatta by the Eskimo, the most likely place to find the natives, I pushed on in that direction until we encamped. Thick fog enveloped us for the next two days. We could not find the island, but found a very small islet near it, off which was another snow village very recently abandoned, the sledge tracks plainly showing that the inhabitants had gone to the east-northeast, which is straight for near Chile. It was now evident that these places of winter resort were deserted, and that here at least we should not find any natives. I was the more sorry at having missed them, as from the quantity of wood chips about the huts, they had probably visited the stranded ship alluded to by the last Eskimo we had met, and the route to which lies up an inlet visible from here, and then overland three or four journeys to the westward, until the opposite coast of King William's Land is reached. The largest huts measured twelve feet in diameter, by six or seven feet high. The greater part were constructed in pairs, having a passage twenty or twenty-five feet long, serving as the common entrance. Where the passage divides into two branches, there was a small hut, which served as a sort of antechamber for the reception of such articles as were intended to remain frozen. 
End of chapter 13. Chapter 14 of In the Arctic Seas. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. In the Arctic Seas by Captain F. L. McClintock. Chapter 14 7th May. To avoid snow blindness, we commenced night marching. Crossing over from Matty Island towards the King William Island shore, we continued our march southward until midnight, when we had the good fortune to arrive at an inhabited snow village. We found here ten or twelve huts and thirty or forty natives of King William's Island. I do not think any of them had ever seen white people alive before, but they evidently knew us to be friends. We halted at a little distance and pitched our tent, the better to secure small articles from being stolen whilst we bartered with them. I purchased from them six pieces of silver plate, bearing the crests or initials of Franklin, Crozier, Fairholme and MacDonald. They also sold us bows and arrows of English woods, uniform and other buttons, and offered us a heavy sledge made of two short, stout pieces of curved wood, which no mere boat could have furnished them with, but this, of course, we could not take away. The silver spoons and forks were readily sold for four needles each. They were most obliging and peaceably disposed, but could not resist the temptation to steal, and were importunate to barter everything they possessed. There was not a trace of fear, every countenance was lighted up with joy, even the children were not shy nor backward either in crowding about us and poking in everywhere. One man got hold of our saw and tried to retain it, holding it behind his back and presenting his knife in exchange. We might have had some trouble in getting it from him, had not one of my men mistaken his object in presenting the knife towards me, and run out of the tent with a gun in his hand. The saw was instantly returned, and these poor people seemed to think they could never do enough to convince us of their friendliness. They repeatedly tapped me gently on the breast, repeating the words, Kamik to me, we are friends. Having obtained all the relics they possessed, I purchased some seal's flesh, blubber, frozen venison, dried and frozen salmon, and sold some of my puppies. They told us it was five days' journey to the wreck, one day up the inlet still in sight, and four days over land. This would carry them to the western coast of King William Land. They added that but little now remained of the wreck which was accessible, their countrymen having carried almost everything away. In answer to an inquiry, they said she was without masts. The question gave rise to some laughter amongst them, and they spoke to each other about fire, from which Peterson thought they had burnt the masts through close to the deck in order to get them down. There had been many books, they said, but all have long ago been destroyed by the weather. The ship was forced on shore in the fall of the year by the ice. She had not been visited during this past winter, and an old woman and a boy were shown to us, who were the last to visit the wreck. They said they had been at it during the winter of 1857-58. to 58. Peterson questioned the woman closely, and she seemed anxious to give all the information in her power. She said many of the white men dropped by the way as they went to the great river, that some were buried and some were not. They did not themselves witness this, but discovered their bodies during the winter following. We could not arrive at any approximation to the numbers of the white men, nor of the years elapsed since they were lost. This was all the information we could obtain, and it was with great difficulty so much could be gleaned the dialect being strange to Peterson, and the natives far more inclined to ask questions than to answer them. They assured us we should find natives upon the south shore of King William's Island only three days' journey from here, and also at Montreal Island. Moreover, they said we might find some at the wreck. For these reasons I did not prolong my stay with them beyond a couple of hours. They seemed to have but little intercourse with other communities, not having heard of our visit to the Boothians two months before. One man even asked Peterson if he had seen his brother, who lived in Boothia, not having heard of him since last summer. It was quite a relief to get away from these good-humoured, noisy thieves, and rather difficult too, as some of them accompanied us for miles. They had abundance of food, were well clothed, and are a finer race than those who inhabit North Greenland, or Ponds Inlet. The men had their hair cropped short, with the exception of one long straggling lock hanging down on each side of the face. Like the Boothians, the women had lines tattooed upon their cheeks and chins. 
We now proceeded round a bay which I named La Trobe, in honour of the late Governor of Victoria, and of his brother, the head of the Moravian Church in London, both esteemed friends of Franklin. Finding the Matheson Island of Ray to be a flat-topped hill, we crossed over low land to the west of it, and upon the morning of the 10th of May reached a single snow hut off Point Booth. I was quite astonished at the number of poles and various articles of wood lying about it, also at the huge pile of walrus and reindeer's flesh, seal's blubber, and skins of various sorts. We had abundance of leisure to examine these exterior articles before the inmates would venture out. They were evidently much alarmed by our sudden appearance. A remarkably fine old dog was tied at the entrance, the line being made fast within the long passage, and although he wagged his tail and received us as old acquaintances, we did not like to attempt an entrance. At length an old man and an old woman appeared. They trembled with fear, and could not, or would not, say anything except, Kamik to me. We tried every means of allaying their fears, but their wits seemed paralysed, and we could get no information. We asked where they got the wood. They purchased it from their countrymen. Did they know the great river? Yes, but it was a long way off. Were the natives there now? Yes. They even denied all knowledge of white people having died upon their shores. A fine young man came out of the hut, but we could learn nothing of him. They said they had nothing to barter except what we saw, although we tempted them by displaying our store of knives and needles. The wind was strong and fair, and the morning intensely cold, and as I could not hope to overcome the fears of these poor people without encamping and staying perhaps a day with them, I determined to push on, and presented the old lady with a needle as a parting gift. The principal articles which caught my attention here were eight or ten fir poles, varying in length from five to ten feet, and up to two and a half inches in diameter. These were converted into spear handles and tent poles. A kayak paddle constructed out of the blade of two ash oars, and two large snow shovels, four feet long, made of thin plank, painted white or pale yellow. These might have been the bottom boards of a boat. There were many smaller articles of wood. Half a mile further on we found seven or eight deserted snow huts. Bad weather had now fairly set in, accompanied by a most unseasonable degree of cold. On the morning of the 12th of May we crossed Point Ogle, and encamped upon the ice in the Great Fish River the same evening. The cold and darkness of our more southern latitude having obliged us to return to day travelling. All the 13th we were imprisoned in our tent by a most furious gale, nor was it until late on the morning of the 14th that we could proceed. That evening we encamped two miles from some small islands which lie off the north end of Montreal Island. On the morning of the 15th we made only a short march of six miles, as one of the men suffered severely from snow blindness, and I was anxious to recommence night travelling, encamped in a little bay upon the northeast side of Montreal Island. The same evening we again set out, although it was blowing very strongly and snowing for a wager, as the men expressed it, but it was only necessary for us to keep close along the shore of the island. We discovered, however, a narrow and crooked channel which led us through to the west side of the island, and, one of the men appearing seriously ill, we encamped about midnight. Whilst encamped this day, explorations were made about the northeast quarter of the island. Islets and rocks were seen to abound in all directions. Eventually it proved to be a separate island upon which we had encamped. The only traces or relics of Europeans found were the following articles, discovered by Peterson beside a native mark, one large stone set upright on the top of another, at the east side of the main, or Montreal Island, a piece of preserved meat tin, two pieces of iron hoop, some scraps of copper, and an iron hoop bolt. These are probably part of the plunder obtained from the boat, and were left here until a more favourable opportunity should offer, or perhaps necessity should compel the depositor to return for them. All the 16th we were unable to move, not only because Hampton was ill, but the weather was extremely bad, and snow thickly falling with temperature at zero. Certainly strange weather for the middle of May. We have not had a single clear day since the first of the month. On the 17th, the weather, though dull, was clear. So Mr. Peterson, Thompson and I set off with the dog sledge to complete the examination of Montreal Island, leaving the other three men with the tent. We also hoped to find natives, but had not seen any recent traces of them since passing Point Booth. Peterson drove the dog sledge close along shore round the island to the south, and as far up the east side as to meet our previously explored portion of it, whilst Thompson and I walked along on the land, the one close down to the beach and the other higher up, examining the more conspicuous parts. In this order we traversed the remaining portion of the island. 
Although the snow served to conceal from us any traces which might exist in hollows or sheltered situations, yet it rendered all objects intended to serve as marks proportionably conspicuous. And we may remember that it was in its winter garb that the retreating crews saw Montreal Island, precisely as we ourselves saw it. The island was almost covered with native marks, usually of one stone standing upright upon another, sometimes consisting of three stones, but very rarely of a greater number no trace of a cairn could be found. In examining, with pickaxe and shovel, a collection of stones which appeared to be arranged artificially, we found a quantity of seal's blubber buried beneath. This old Eskimo cache was near the southeast point of the island. The interior of the island and the principal islets adjacent were also examined without success, nor was there the slightest evidence of natives having been here during the winter. It is not to be wondered at that we returned in the evening to our tent somewhat dispirited. The total absence of natives was a bitter disappointment. Circles of stones, indicating the sites of their tenting places in summer, were common enough. Montreal Island is of primary rock, chiefly grey gneiss, traversed with whitish vertical bands in a north and south direction. By them, I often directed my route when crossing the island. It is of considerable elevation and extremely rugged. The low beaches and grassy hollows were covered with a foot or two of hard snow, whilst all the level, the elevated or exposed parts were swept perfectly bare. Had a cairn or even a grave existed, raised as it must be, the earth being frozen hard as rock, we must at once have seen it. If any were constructed, they must have been levelled by the natives. Every doubtful appearance was examined with the pickaxe. A remark made by my men struck me as being shrewd. They judged from the washed appearance of the rock upon the east side of Montreal Island that it must be often exposed to a considerable sea, such as would effectively remove everything not placed far above its reach. When looking over the smooth and frozen expanse, one is apt to forget this. Since our first landing upon King William's Island, we have not met with any heavy ice. All along its eastern and southern shore, together with the estuary of this great river, is one vast unbroken sheet formed in the early part of last winter where no ice previously existed. This, I fancy, from the accounts of Back and Anderson, is unusual, and may have caused the Eskimo to vary their seal-hunting localities. Mr. Peterson suggested they might have retired into the various inlets after the seals, and therefore I determined to cross over into Barrow's Inlet as soon as we had examined the Point Ogle Peninsula. Upon Montreal Island I shot a hare and a brace of willow grouse, up to this date we had shot during our journey only one bear and a couple of ptarmigan. The first recent traces of reindeer were met with here. On the 18th May, crossed over to the mainland near Port Duncan, but Hampton again complaining, I was obliged to encamp. When away from my party and exploring along the shore towards Elliot Bay, I saw a herd of eight reindeer and succeeded in shooting one of them. In the evening, Peterson saw another. Some willow grouse were also seen. Here we found much more vegetation than upon King William's Island, or on any other Arctic land I have yet seen. On the evening of the 19th we commenced our return journey, but for the three following weeks our route led us over new ground. Hampton being unable to drag, I made over my puppy team to him, and was thus left free to explore and fully examine every doubtful object along our route. I shall not easily forget the trial my patience underwent during the six weeks that I drove that dog sledge. The leader of my team, named Omar Pasha, was very willing, but very lame. Little Rose was coquettish, and fonder of being caressed than whipped. From some cause or other she ceased growing when only a few months old. She was therefore far too small for heavy work. Darkie and Missy were mere pups, and last of all came the two wretched starvelings, reared in the winter, Foxy and Dolly. Each dog had its own harness, formed of strips of canvas, and was attached to the sledge by a single trace twelve feet long. None of them had ever been yoked before, and the amount of cunning and perversity they displayed to avoid both the whip and the work was quite astonishing. They bit through their traces and hid away under the sledge, or leaped over one another's backs, so as to get into the middle of the team out of the way of my whip, until the traces became plaited up and the dogs were almost knotted together. The consequence was I had to halt every few minutes, pull off my mitts, and at the risk of frozen fingers, disentangle the lines. I persevered, however, and without breaking any of their bones, succeeded in getting a surprising amount of work out of them. Hobson drove his own dog sledge likewise, and as long as we were together we helped each other out of difficulties, and they were frequently occurring, for apart from those I have above mentioned, directly a dog sledge is stopped by hummock, or sticks fast in deep snow, 
the dogs, instead of exerting themselves, lie down, looking perfectly delighted at the circumstance, and the driver has to extricate the sledge with a hearty one, two, three, haul, and apply a little gentle persuasion to set his canine team in motion again. Having searched the east shore of this land for seven or eight miles further north, we crossed over into Barrow's Inlet, and spent a day in its examination, but not a trace of natives was met with. Regaining the shore of Dees and Simpson's Strait, some miles to the west of Point Richardson, we crossed over to King William's Island upon the morning of the 24th, striking in upon it a short distance west of the Peffer River. The south coast was closely examined as we marched along towards Cape Herschel. Upon a conspicuous point to the westward of Point Gladman, a cairn nearly five feet high was seen, which, although it did not appear to be a recent construction, was taken down stone by stone and carefully examined, the ground beneath being broken up with a pickaxe, but nothing was covered. The ground above it was much exposed to the winds, and consequently devoid of snow, so that no trace could have escaped us. Simpson does not mention having landed here, or anywhere upon this island except at Cape Herschel. Yet it seemed to me strange that natives should construct such a mark here, since a huge boulder, which would equally serve their purpose, stood upon the same elevation and within a couple of hundred yards. We had previously examined a similar but smaller cairn a few miles to the eastward. We were now upon the shore along which the retreating crews must have marched. My sledges, of course, travelled upon the sea ice close along the shore, and although the depth of snow which covered the beach deprived us of almost every hope, yet we kept a very sharp lookout for traces, nor were we unsuccessful. Shortly after midnight of the 24th of May, when slowly walking along a gravel ridge near the beach, which the winds kept partially bare of snow, I came upon a human skeleton, partly exposed, with here and there a few fragments of clothing appearing through the snow. The skeleton, now perfectly bleached, was lying upon its face, the limbs and smaller bones either dissevered or gnawed away by small animals. A most careful examination of the spot was of course made, the snow removed, and every scrap of clothing gathered up. A pocket-book afforded strong grounds of hope that some information might be subsequently obtained respecting the unfortunate owner and the calamitous march of the lost crews, but at the time it was frozen hard. The substance of that which we gleaned upon the spot may thus be summed up. This victim was a young man, slightly built and perhaps above the common height. The dress appeared to be that of a steward or officer's servant, the loose bow knot in which his neck handkerchief was tied not being used by seamen or officers. In every particular, the dress confirmed our conjectures as to his rank or office in the late expedition. The blue jacket with slashed sleeves and braided edging, and the pilot cloth greatcoat with plain covered buttons. We found also a clothes brush near, and a horn pocket comb. This poor man seems to have selected the bare ridge top as affording the least tiresome walking, and to have fallen upon his face in the position in which we found him. It was a melancholy truth that the old woman spoke when she said, they fell down and died as they walked along. I do not think the Eskimo had discovered this skeleton, or they would have carried off the brush and comb. Superstition prevents them from disturbing their own dead, but would not keep them from appropriating the property of the white man, if in any way useful to them. Dr. Ray obtained a piece of flannel, marked FDV 1845, from the Eskimo of Boothia or Repulse Bay. It had doubtless been a part of poor Dave Ver's garments. At the time of our interview with the natives of King William's Island, Peterson was inclined to think that the retreat of the crews took place in the fall of the year, some of the men in boats and others walking along the shore, and as only five bodies are said to have been found upon Montreal Island with the boat, this fact favoured his opinion, because so small a number could not have dragged her there over the ice, although they very easily could have taken her there by water. Subsequently, this opinion proved erroneous. I mention it because it shows how vague our information was. Indeed, all Eskimo accounts are naturally so, and how entirely we were dependent upon our own exertions for bringing to light the mystery of their fate. The information obtained by Dr. Ray was mainly derived second-hand from the Fish River Eskimo, and should not be confounded with that received by us from the King Williams Island Eskimo. These people told us they did not find the bodies of the white men, that is, they did not know any had died upon the march until the following winter. This is probably true, as it is only in winter and early spring they can travel overland to the west shore, or that they make a practice of wandering along the shore in search of seals and bears. The remains of those who died in the Fish River may very probably have been discovered in the summer shortly after their decease. 
along the south coast of King William's Land, as upon the mainland, I was sadly disappointed in my expectation of meeting natives. We found only six or eight deserted snow huts, showing that they had recently been here, and consequently there was less chance of meeting with them on our further progress, as the season had now arrived when they seek the rivers and the favourite haunts and passes of the reindeer in their northern migration. Hobson was, however, upon the western coast, and I hoped to find a note left for me at Cape Herschel containing some piece of good news. After minutely examining the intervening coastline, it was with strong and reasonable hope I ascended the slope which is crowned by Simpson's conspicuous cairn. This summit of Cape Herschel is perhaps 150 feet high, and about a quarter of a mile within the low stony point which projects from it, and on which there was considerable ice pressure and a few hummocks heaped up, the first we had seen for three weeks. Close round this point, or by cutting across it as we did, the retreating parties must have passed, and the opportunity afforded by the cairn of depositing in a known position, and that too, where their own discoveries terminated, some record of their own proceedings, or it might be a portion of their scientific journals, would scarcely have been disregarded. Simpson makes no mention of having left a record in this cairn, nor would Franklin's people have taken any trouble to find it if he had left one. But what remained now of this once ponderous cairn was only four feet high. The south side had been pulled down and the central stones removed, as if by persons seeking for something deposited beneath. After removing the snow with which it was filled, and a few loose stones, the men laid bare a large slab of limestone. With difficulty this was removed, then a second, and also a third slab, when they came to the ground. For some time we persevered with a pickaxe in breaking up the frozen earth, but nothing whatever was found, nor any trace of European visitors in its vicinity. There were many old caches and low stone walls, such as natives would use to lurk behind for the purpose of shooting reindeer, and we noticed some recent tracks of those animals which had crossed direct hither from the mainland. End of chapter 14chapter 15 of in the arctic seas this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org in the arctic seas by captain f l mcclintock chapter 15 as the eskimo of this land as well as those of point boothia and pond's inlet have long since given up the practice of building stone dwellings, passing their winters in snow huts, and summers in tents. No other traces of them than those described remain, so that when, or in what numbers they may have been here, one cannot form any opinion, the same caches and hiding places serving for generations. I cannot divest myself of the belief that some record was left here by the retreating crews, and perhaps some most valuable documents which their slow progress and fast-failing strength would have assured them could not be carried much further. If any such were left, they have been discovered by the natives, and carried off or thrown away as worthless. Doubtless the natives, when they ascertained that famine and fatigue had caused many of the white men to fall down and die upon their fearful march, and heard, as they might have done, of its fatal termination upon the mainland, lost no time in following up their traces, examining every spot where they halted, every mark they put up or stone displaced. It is easy to tell whether a cairn has been put up or touched within a moderate period of years. If very old, the outer stones have a weathered appearance, lichens will have grown upon the sheltered portions, and moss in the crevices. But if recently disturbed, even if a single stone is turned upside down, these appearances are altered. If a cairn has been recently built it will be evident, because the stones picked up from the neighbourhood would be bleached on top by the exposure of centuries, whilst underneath they would be coloured by the soil in which they were embedded. To the eye of the native hunter, these marks of a recent cairn are at once apparent, and unless Simpson's cairn, built in 1839, had been disturbed by Crozier, I do not think the Eskimo would have been at the trouble of pulling it down to plunder the cache, but having commenced to do so, would not have left any of it standing, unless they found what they sought. I noticed with great care the appearance of the stones, and came to the conclusion that the cairn itself was of old date, and had been erected many years ago and that it was reduced to the state in which we found it by people having broken down one side of it, the displaced stones from being turned over, looking far more fresh than those in that portion of the cairn which had been left standing. It was with a feeling of deep regret and much disappointment that I left this spot without finding some certain record of those martyrs to their country's fame. Perhaps in all the wide world there will be few spots more hallowed in the recollection of English seamen than this cairn on Cape Herschel. 
A few miles beyond Cape Herschel the land becomes very low. Many islets and shingle ridges lie far off the coast, and as we advance we met with hummocks of unusually heavy ice, showing plainly that we were now travelling upon a far more exposed part of the coastline. We were approaching a spot where a relevation of intense interest was awaiting me. About twelve miles from Cape Herschel I found a small cairn built by Hobson's party, and containing a note for me. He had reached this, his extreme point, six days previously, without having seen anything of the wreck or of natives, but he had found a record, the record so ardently sought for of the Franklin expedition, at Point Victory, on the northwest coast of King William's Land. That record is indeed a sad and touching relic of our lost friends, and to simplify its contents I will point out separately the double story it so briefly tells. In the first place, the record paper was one of the printed forms usually supplied to discovery ships for the purpose of being enclosed in bottles and thrown overboard at sea, in order to ascertain the set of the currents, blanks being left for the date and position. Any person finding one of these records is requested to forward it to the Secretary of the Admiralty with a note of time and place, and this request is printed upon it in six different languages. Upon it was written, apparently by Lieutenant Gore, as follows. 28th of May, 1847. Her Majesty's ships Erebus and Terror wintered in the ice in latitude 70 degrees 05 minutes north, longitude 98 degrees 23 minutes west. Having wintered in 1846-47 to 47 at Beachy Island in latitude 74 degrees 43 minutes 28 seconds north, longitude 91 degrees, 39 minutes, 15 seconds west, after having ascended Wellington Channel to latitude 77 degrees, and returned by the west side of Cornwallis Island. Sir John Franklin commanding the expedition. All well. Party consisting of two officers and six men left the ships on Monday 24th May, 1847. Graham Gore, Lieutenant. Charles F. De Ver, Mate. There is an error in the above document, namely that the Erebus and Terror wintered at Beachy Island in 1846-47. to The correct dates should have been 1845-46. to A glance at the date at the top and the bottom of the record proves this, but in all other respects the tale is told in as few words as possible of their wonderful success up to that date, May 1847. We find that, after the last intelligence of Sir John Franklin was received by us, bearing date of July 1845, from the whalers in Melville Bay, that his expedition passed on to Lancaster Sound, and entered Wellington Channel, of which the southern entrance had been discovered by Sir Edward Parry in 1819. The Erebus and Terror sailed up that strait for 150 miles, and reached in the autumn of 1845 the same latitude as was attained eight years subsequently by HMS Assistance and Pioneer. Whether Franklin intended to pursue this northern course, and was only stopped by ice in that latitude of 77 degrees north, or purposely relinquished a route which seemed to lead away from the known seas off the coast of America, must be a matter of opinion. But this the document assures us of, that Sir John Franklin's expedition, having accomplished this examination, returned southward from latitude 77 degrees north, which is at the head of Wellington Channel, and re-entered Barrows Strait by a new channel between Bathurst and Cornwallis Islands. Seldom has such an amount of success been accorded to an Arctic navigator in a single season. And when the Erebus and Terror were secured at Beachy Island for the coming winter of 1845-46, to the results of their first year's labour must have been most cheering. These results were the exploration of Wellington and Queen's Channel, and the addition to our charts of the extensive lands on either hand. In 1846 they proceeded to the southwest and eventually reached within twelve miles of the north extreme of King William's Land, when their progress was arrested by the approaching winter of 1846-47. to That winter appears to have passed without any serious loss of life, and when in the spring Lieutenant Gore leaves with a party for some especial purpose, and very probably to connect the unknown coastline of King William's Land between Point Victory and Cape Herschel, those on board the Erebus and Terror were all well, and the gallant Franklin still commanded. But alas! round the margin of the paper upon which Lieutenant Gore in 1847 wrote those words of hope and promise, another hand had subsequently written the following words. April 25th, 1848. Her Majesty's ships, Terror and Erebus, were deserted on the 22nd of April, five leagues north-northwest of this, having been beset since 12th September, 1846. The officers and crews, consisting of 105 souls, under the command of Captain F. R. M. Crozier, landed here in latitude 69 degrees, 
37 minutes, 42 seconds north. Longitude, 98 degrees, 41 minutes west. Sir John Franklin died on the 11th of June, 1847, and the total loss by deaths in the expedition has been to this date 9 officers and 15 men. Signed, F. R. M. Crozier, Captain and Senior Officer. Signed, James Fitzjames, Captain, H. M. S. Erebus. And start on tomorrow, 26th, for Bax Fish River. This marginal information was evidently written by Captain Fitzjames, excepting only the note stating when and where they were going, which was added by Captain Crozier. There is some additional marginal information relative to the transfer of the document to its present position, viz. the site of Sir James Ross's pillar, from a spot four miles to the northward, near Point Victory, where it had been originally deposited by the late Commander Gore. This little word, late, shows us that he too, within the twelve month, had passed away. In the short space of twelve months, how mournful had become the history of Franklin's expedition! How changed from the cheerful all well of Graham Gore! The spring of 1847 found them within ninety miles of the known sea off the coast of America, and to men who had already in two seasons sailed over five hundred miles of previously unexplored waters, how confident must they have felt that the forthcoming navigable season of 1847 would see their ships pass over so short an intervening space? It was ruled otherwise. Within a month after Lieutenant Gore placed the record on Point Victory, the much-loved leader of the expedition, Sir John Franklin, was dead, and the following spring found Captain Crozier, upon whom the command had devolved at King William's Land, endeavouring to save his starving men, one hundred and five souls in all, from a terrible death by retreating to the Hudson Bay territories up the Back or Great Fish River. A sad tale was never told in fewer words. There is something deeply touching in their extreme simplicity, and they show in the strongest manner that both the leaders of this retreating party were actuated by the loftiest sense of duty, and met with calmness and decision the fearful alternative of a last bold struggle for life, rather than perish without effort on board their ships for we well know that the Erebus and Terror were only provisioned up to July 1848. Another discrepancy exists in the second part of the record written by Fitzjames. The original number composing the expedition was 138 souls, and the record states the total loss by deaths to have been 9 officers and 15 men, consequently that 114 officers and men remained, but it also states that 105 only landed under Captain Crozier's command, so that nine individuals are unaccounted for. Lieutenant Hobson's note told me that he found quantities of clothing and articles of all kinds lying about the cairn, as if these men, aware that they were retreating for their lives, had there abandoned everything which they considered superfluous. Hobson had experienced extremely bad weather, constant gales and fogs, and thought he might have passed the wreck without seeing her. He hoped to be more successful upon his return journey. Encouraged by this important news, we exerted our utmost vigilance in order that no trace should escape us. Our provisions were running very short, therefore the three remaining puppies were of necessity shot, and their sledge used for fuel. We were also able to lengthen our journeys, as we had very smooth ice to travel over, the off-lying islets keeping the rough pack from pressing in upon the shore. Upon the 29th of May we reached the western extreme of King William's Island in latitude 69 degrees 08 minutes north, and longitude 100 degrees 08 minutes west. I named it after Captain Crozier of the Terror, the gallant leader of that forlorn hope of which we now just obtained tidings. The coast we marched along was extremely low, a mere series of ridges of limestone shingle, almost destitute of fossils. The only tracks of animals seen were those of a bear and a few foxes, the only living creatures a few willow grouse. Traces even of the wandering Eskimo became much less frequent after leaving Cape Herschel. Here were found only a few circles of stones, the sites of tenting places, but so moss-grown as to be of great age. The prospect to seaward was not less forbidding, a rugged surface of crushed-up pack including much heavy ice. In these shallow ice-covered seas, seals are but seldom found, and it is highly probable that all animal life in them is as scarce as upon the land. From Cape Crozier the coastline was found to turn sharply away to the eastward, and early in the morning of the 30th of May we encamped alongside a large boat, another melancholy relic which Hobson had found and examined a few days before, as his note left here informed me, 
but he had failed to discover record, journal, pocket-book, or memorandum of any description. A vast quantity of tattered clothing was lying in her, and this we first examined. Not a single article bore the name of its former owner. The boat was cleared out and carefully swept that nothing might escape us. The snow was then removed from about her, but nothing whatever was found. This boat measured twenty-eight feet long and seven feet three inches wide. She was built with a view to lightness and light draught of water, and evidently equipped with the utmost care for the ascent of the Great Fish River. She had neither oars nor rudder, paddles supplying their place, and as a large remnant of light canvas, commonly known as number eight, was found, and also a small block for reeving a sheet through, I suppose she had been provided with a sail. A sloping canvas roof or rain awning had also formed part of her equipment. She was fitted with a weather cloth nine inches high, battened down all round the gunwale, and supported by twenty-four iron stanchions, so placed as to serve likewise for rowing fowls. There were fifty fathoms of deep sea sounding line near her, as well as an ice grapnel. She appeared to have been originally carvel built, but for the purpose of reducing weight, very thin fir planks had been substituted for her seven upper strakes, and put on clincher fashion. The weight of the boat alone was seven hundred or eight hundred pounds only, but she was mounted upon a sledge of unusual weight and strength. It was constructed of two oak planks, twenty-three feet four inches in length, eight inches in width, and with an average thickness of two and a half inches. These planks formed the sides or runners of the sledge. They were connected by five crossbars of oak, each four feet long, and four inches by three and a half inches thick, and bolted down to the runners. The underneath parts of the latter were shod with iron. Upon the crossbars, five saddles or supporting chocks for the boat were lashed, and the drag ropes by which the crew moved this massive sledge and the weights upon it consisted of two and three quarter inch whale line. I have calculated the weight of this sledge to be 650 pounds. It could not have been less and may have been considerably more. The total weight of boat and sledge may be taken at 1400 pounds, which amounts to a heavy load for seven strong healthy men. The only markings about the boat were those upon her stem, by which we learned that she was built by contract, was received into Woolwich Dockyard in April 1840 blank, and was numbered 61. There may have been a fourth figure to the right hand, as the stem had been reduced in order to lighten the boat. The ground the sledge rested upon was the usual limestone shingle, perfectly flat, and probably overflowed at times every summer, as the stones were embedded in ice. The boat was partially out of her cradle upon the sledge, and lying in such a position as to lead me to suppose it the effect of a violent northwest gale. She was barely, if at all, above the reach of occasional tides. One hundred yards from her, upon the land side, lay the stump of a fir tree, twelve feet long and sixteen inches in diameter, three feet above the roots. Although the ice had used it roughly during its drift to the shore, and rubbed off every vestige of bark, yet the wood was perfectly sound. It may have been, and probably has been, lying there for twenty or thirty years, and during such a period would suffer less decay in this region of frost than in one-sixth of the time at home. Within two yards of it I noticed a few scanty tufts of grass. But all these were after observations. There was that in the boat which transfixed us with awe. It was portions of two human skeletons. One was that of a slight young person, the other of a large, strongly made, middle-aged man. The former was found in the bow of the boat, but in too much disturbed a state to enable Hudson to judge whether the sufferer had died there. Large and powerful animals, probably wolves, had destroyed much of this skeleton, which may have been that of an officer. Near it we found the fragment of a pair of worked slippers, of which I give the pattern, as they may possibly be identified. The lines were white with a black margin, the spaces white, red and yellow. They had originally been eleven inches long, lined with calfskin with the hair left on, and the edges bound with red silk ribbon. Besides these slippers there were a pair of small, strong, shooting half-boots. The other skeleton was in a somewhat more perfect state, and was enveloped with clothes and furs. It lay across the boat, under the afterthwart. Close beside it were found five watches, and there were two double-barrelled guns, one barrel in each, loaded and cocked, standing muzzle upwards against the boat's side. It may be imagined with what deep interest these sad relics were scrutinised, 
and how anxiously every fragment of clothing was turned over in search of pockets and pocket-books, journals, or even names. Five or six small books were found, all of them scriptural or devotional works, except the Vicar of Wakefield. One little book, Christian Melodies, bore an inscription upon the title page from the donor to G. G. Graham Gore, a small Bible contained numerous marginal notes and whole passages underlined. Besides these books, the covers of a New Testament and prayer book were found. Amongst an amazing quantity of clothing, there were seven or eight pairs of boots of various kinds, cloth winter boots, sea boots, heavy ankle boots, and strong shoes. I noted that there were silk handkerchiefs, black, white, and figured, towels, soap, sponge, toothbrush and hair combs, Macintosh gun cover, marked outside with paint A12, and lined with black cloth. Besides these articles we found twine, nails, saws, files, bristles, wax ends, sailmaker's palms, powder, bullets, shot, cartridges, wads, leather cartridge case, knives, clasp and dinner ones, needle and thread cases, slow match, several bayonet scabbards cut down into knife sheaths, two rolls of sheet lead, and in short, a quantity of articles of one description and another truly astonishing in variety, and such as, for the most part, modern sledge travellers in these regions would consider a mere accumulation of dead weight, but slightly useful, and very likely to break down the strength of the sledge crews. The only provisions we could find were tea and chocolate. Of the former, very little remained, but there were very nearly forty pounds of the latter. These articles alone could never support life in such a climate, and we found neither biscuit nor meat of any kind. A portion of tobacco and an empty pemmican tin, capable of containing twenty-two pounds weight, were discovered. The tin was marked with an E. It had probably belonged to the Erebus. None of the fuel originally brought from the ships remained in or about the boat, but there was no lack of it, for a drift tree was lying on the beach close at hand, and had the party been in need of fuel they would have used the paddles and the bottom boards of the boat. In the after part of the boat we discovered eleven large spoons, eleven forks, and four teaspoons, all of silver. Of these twenty-six pieces of plate, eight bore Sir John Franklin's crest. The remainder had the crests or initials of nine different officers, with the exception of a single fork which was not marked. Of these nine officers, five belonged to the Erebus, Gore, Leverskont, Fairholme, Couch, and Goodsir. Three others belonged to the Terror, Crozier, a teaspoon only, Hornby, and Thomas. I do not know to whom the three articles with an owl engraved on them belonged, nor who was the owner of the unmarked fork, but of the owners of those we can identify, the majority belonged to the Erebus. One of the watches bore the crest of Mr. Couch, of the Erebus, and as the pemmican tin also came from that ship, I am inclined to think the boat did also. The authorities at Woolwich could tell, by her number, to which ship she was supplied, and as one of the pocket chronometers found in the boat was marked Parkinson and Frodsham 980, and the other Arnold 2020, it could also be ascertained to which ship they had been issued. Sir John Franklin's plate perhaps was issued to the men for their use, as the only means of saving it, and it seems probable that the officers generally did the same, as not a single iron spoon, such as sailors always use, has been found. Of the many men, probably twenty or thirty, who were attached to this boat, it seemed most strange that the remains of only two individuals were found. Nor were there any graves upon the neighbouring flat land. Indeed, bearing in mind the season at which these poor fellows left their ships, it should be remembered that the soil was then frozen hard, and the labour of cutting a grave very great indeed. I was astonished to find that the sledge was directed to the north-east, exactly for the next point of land for which we ourselves were travelling. The position of this abandoned boat is about fifty miles, as a sledge would travel, from Point Victory, and therefore sixty-five miles from the position of the ships. Also it is seventy miles from the skeleton of the steward, and one hundred and fifty miles from Montreal Island. It is, moreover, in the depth of a wide bay, where by crossing over ten or twelve miles of very low land, a great saving of distance would be effected, the route by the coastline being about forty miles. A little reflection led me to satisfy my own mind at least, that the boat was returning to the ships, 
and in no other way can I account for two men having been left in her, than by supposing the party were unable to drag the boat further, and that these two men, not being able to keep pace with their shipmates, were therefore left by them, supplied with such provisions as could be spared, to last until the return of the others from the ship with a fresh stock. Whether it was the intention of the retroceding party to await the result of another season in the ships, or to follow the track of the main body to the Great Fish River, is now a matter of conjecture. It seems highly probable that they had purposed revisiting the boat, not only on account of the two men left in charge of it, but also to obtain the chocolate, the five watches, and many other articles which would otherwise scarcely have been left in her. The same reasons which may be assigned for the return of this detachment from the main body will also serve to account for their not having come back to their boat. In both instances they appear to have greatly overrated their strength and the distance they could travel in a given time. Taking this view of the case, we can understand why their provisions would not last them for anything like the distance they required to travel, and why they would be obliged to send back to the ships for more, first taking from the detached party all the provisions they could possibly spare. Whether all or any of the remainder of this detached party ever reached their ships is uncertain. All we know is that they did not revisit the boat, and which accounts for the absence of more skeletons in its neighbourhood and the Eskimo report that there was no one alive in the ship when she drifted on shore, and that but one human body was found by them on board of her. After leaving the boat we followed an irregular coastline to the north and northwest, up to a very prominent cape, which is probably the extreme of land seen from Point Victory by Sir James Ross, and named by him Point Franklin, which name, as a cape, it still retains. I need hardly say that throughout my whole journey along the shores of King William's Land I caused a most vigilant lookout to be kept to seaward for any appearance of the stranded ship spoken of by the natives. Our search was, however, fruitless in that respect. End of chapter 15
the cylinder containing this record had not been soldered up again i suppose they had not the means of doing so it was found on the ground amongst a few loose stones which had evidently fallen along with it from the top of the cairn hobson removed every stone from this cairn down to the ground and rebuilt it brief as these records are we must needs be contented with them they are perfect models of official brevity no log-book could be more provokingly laconic yet that any record at all should be deposited after the abandonment of the ships does not seem to have been intended and we should feel the more thankful to captains crozier and fitzjames to whom we are indebted for the invaluable supplement and our gratitude ought to be all the greater when we remember that the ink had to be thawed and that writing in a tent during an april day in the arctic regions is by no means an easy task besides placing a copy of the record taken away by hobson from the cairn we both put records of our own in it and i also buried one under a large stone ten feet true north from it stating the explorations and discoveries we had made a great quantity and variety of things lay strewed about the cairn such as even in their three days march from the ships the retreating crews found it impossible to carry further amongst these were four heavy sets of boats cooking stoves pickaxes shovels iron hoops old canvas a large single block about four feet of a copper lightning conductor long pieces of hollow brass curtain rods a small case of selected medicines containing about twenty-four files the contents in a wonderful state of preservation a deep circle by robinson with two needles bar magnet and light horizontal needle all complete the whole weighing only nine pounds and even a small sextant engraved with the name of frederick hornby lying beside the cairn without its case the coloured eye shades of the sextant had been taken out otherwise it was perfect the movable screws and such parts as come in contact with the observer's hand were neatly covered with thin leather to prevent frostbite in severe weather the clothing left by the retreating crews of the erebus and terror formed a huge heap four feet high every article was searched but the pockets were empty and not one of all these articles were marked indeed sailors warm clothing seldom is two canteens the property of marines were found one marked eighty eight c o william hedges and the other eighty nine c o william heather a small pannikin made out of a two-pound preserved meat tin had scratched on it w mark while continuing my homeward march and as nearly as i could judge two and a half or two and three-quarter miles to the north of point victory i saw a few stones placed in line as if across the head of a tenting place to afford some shelter here it was i think that lieutenant gore deposited the record in may eighteen forty seven which was found in eighteen forty eight by lieutenant irving and finally deposited at point victory some scraps of tin vessels were lying about but whether they had been left by sir james ross's party in may eighteen thirty or by the franklin expedition in eighteen forty seven or eighteen forty eight is uncertain here ended my own search for traces of the lost ones hobson found two other cairns and many relics between this position and cape felix from each place where any trace was discovered the most interesting of the relics were taken away so that the collection we have made is very considerable of these northern cairns i will write a description when i have received hobson's account of his journey but here it is as well to state his opinion as well as my own that no part of the coast between cape felix and cape crozier has been visited by eskimo since the fatal march of the lost crews in april eighteen forty eight none of the cairns or numerous articles strewed about which would be invaluable to the natives or even the driftwood we noticed had been touched by them from this very significant fact it seems quite certain that they had not been discovered by the eskimo whose knowledge of the white men falling down and dying as they walked along must be limited to the shoreline southward and eastward of cape crozier and where of course no traces were permitted to remain for us to find it is not probable that such fearful mortality would have overtaken them so early in their march as within eighty miles by sledge route from the abandoned ships such being their distance from cape crozier nor is it probable that we could have passed the wreck had she existed there as there are no off-lying islands to prevent a ship drifting in upon the beach whilst to the southward they are very numerous so much so that a drifting ship could hardly run the gauntlet between them so as to reach the shore the coast from point victory northward is considerably higher than that upon which we have been so many days the sea also is not so shallow and the ice comes close in to seaward all was heavy close pack consisting of all descriptions of ice but for the most part old and heavy 
from walls bay i crossed overland to the eastern shore and reached my depot near the entrance of port parry on the fifth of june after an absence of thirty-four days hence i purposed travelling along shore to cape sabine in order to avoid the rough ice which we encountered when crossing direct from cape victoria in april and also hoping to obtain a few more observations for the magnetic inclination the weather became foggy as we approached prince george's bay therefore we were obliged to go well into it before attempting to cross we gained the land upon the opposite side as i supposed and which would lead us direct to cape sabine but when the weather cleared up we saw a long low island to seaward of us which puzzled me much eventually i found we had discovered a strait leading from prince george's bay into wellington strait about eight miles south of cape sabine this discovery cost us a day's delay and was therefore unwelcome as we were then in daily expectation and dread of the thaw which renders all travelling so very difficult and we were still two hundred and thirty long miles from our ship in this strait we found a deserted snow village of seventeen huts one of them was unusually large its internal diameter being fourteen feet the men soon scraped together enough blubber to supply us with fuel for our homeward march strewed about on the ice or in every snow hut were shavings and chips of fresh wood in one of them i found a child's toy a miniature sledge made from wood no traces of natives were found upon either shore at this place nor had i met with any since leaving the western coast of the island to the southward of cape crozier having passed through nearly to the eastern edge of the strait we cut off some distance by crossing over land so as to reach the sea coast three or four miles southward of cape sabine a few willow grouse two foxes and a young reindeer were seen there was some vegetation upon the land and animals appeared to resort to this locality in tolerable abundance the contrast between it and the low barren shore we had so recently come from was striking indeed nothing can exceed the gloom and desolation of the western coast of king william's island hobson and myself had some considerable experience of it his sojourn there exceeded a month its climate seems different from that of the eastern coast it is more exposed to northwest winds and the air was almost constantly loaded with chilling fogs everywhere upon the shores of the island i noticed boulders of dark gneiss upon the west coast they were generally small and of a dark grey colour about the north part of the island hobson found a good deal of sandstone the probable result of ice drift from melville island or banks land this land gives one the idea of its having risen within a recent geological period from the sea not suddenly but at regular intervals the numerous terraces or beach marks formed long horizontal lines rising very gradually and in due proportion as their distance increases from the sea near the shore they are of course most distinct upon the west coast some fossils were picked up chiefly impressions of shells king william's island is for the most part extremely barren and its surface clotted over with innumerable ponds and lakes it is not by any means the land abounding with reindeer and musk oxen which we expected to find the natives told us there were none of the latter and very few of the former upon it on the eighth of june the first ducks and brent geese were seen flying northward passing over the extreme point of cape victoria boothia land near which we saw the deserted snow huts of our march acquaintances and shortly afterwards crossing the mouth of the deep bay to the north of it in which sheltered by the island a ship would find security from ice pressure and very tolerable winter quarters we again reached the straight low limestone coast of boothia felix I was unable to make any delay at the magnetic pole, nor could I find a trace of Ross's cairn, but at each of our encampments along the coast the magnetic inclination was carefully observed. Throughout my whole journey I availed myself of every opportunity of obtaining these most interesting observations, often remaining up, after we had encamped for rest, six or seven hours in order to do so. But the instruments supplied for this purpose were not well adapted, and occasioned me a vast deal of labour and loss of time so as to diminish to almost one-third the results i should otherwise have obtained much snow has disappeared off the land and the ridges or ancient beaches being the parts most free from snow showed out strongly in long dark horizontal lines rising above each other until lost to view in the interior here and there a few fossil shells and corals were picked up and four or five willow grouse shot thirteenth june we passed from limestone to granite in latitude seventy one degrees ten minutes north here the land attains to considerable elevation in the hollows of the dark granite rocks we found abundance of water and also in a few places upon the sea ice 
it was quite evident that in another day or two the snow would altogether yield to the warmth of summer birds were now frequently seen we discovered a narrow channel to the eastward of the one between the tasmania group through which we had passed with so much difficulty in april our new channel was covered with smooth ice and was also much shorter at one of our deposits lately visited a note left by hobson informed me of his being six days in advance of me and also of his own serious illness for many days past he had been unable to walk and was consequently conveyed upon the sledge his men were hastening home with all their strength and speed in order to get him under the doctor's care we also were doing our best to push on lest the bursting out of melting snow from the various ravines should render the ice impassable on the fifteenth the snow upon the ice everywhere yielded to the effects of increased temperature i was indeed most thankful at its having remained firm for so long to make any progress at all after this date was of course a very great labour requiring the utmost efforts of both the men and the dogs nor was the freezing mixture through which we trudged by any means agreeable we were often more than knee-deep in it we succeeded in reaching false strait on the morning of the eighteenth of june and pitched our tent just as heavy rain began to descend it lasted throughout the greater part of the day after travelling a few miles upon the long lake further progress was found to be quite impossible and we were obliged to haul our sledges up off the flooded ice and commence a march of sixteen or seventeen miles overland for the ship the poor dogs were so tired and sore-footed that we could not induce them to follow us they remained about the sledges after a very fatiguing scramble across the hills and through the snow valleys we were refreshed with a sight of our poor dear lonely little fox and arrived on board in time for a late breakfast on the nineteenth of june with respect to a navigable northwest passage and to the probability of our having been able last season to make any considerable advance to the southward had the barrier of ice across the western outlet of bellow strait permitted us to reach the open water beyond i think judging from what i have seen of the ice in the franklin strait that the chances were greatly in favour of our reaching cape herschel on the south side of king william's land by passing as i intended to do eastward of that island from bellow strait to cape victoria we found a mixture of old and new ice showing the exact proportion of pack and clear water at the setting in of winter once to the southward of the tasmania group i think our chief difficulty would have been overcome and south of cape victoria i doubt whether any further obstruction would have been experienced as but little if any ice remained the natives told us the ice went away and left a clear sea every year as our discoveries show the victoria strait to be but little more than twenty miles wide the ice pressed southward through so narrow a space could hardly have prevented our crossing to victoria land and cambridge bay the wintering place reached by collinson from the west no one who sees that portion of victoria strait which lies between king william's island and victoria land as we saw it could doubt of there being but one way of getting the ship through it that way being the extremely hazardous one of drift through in the pack the wide channel between prince of wales land and victoria land admits a vast and continuous stream of very heavy ocean formed ice from the northwest which presses upon the western face of king william's island and chokes up victoria strait in the manner i have just described i do not think the northwest passage could ever be sailed through by passing westward that is to windward of king william's island if the season was so favourable for navigation as to open up the northern part of this western sea as for instance in eighteen forty six where sir j franklin sailed down it i think but comparatively little difficulty would be experienced in the more southern portion of it until victoria strait was reached had sir john franklin known that a channel existed eastward of king william's land so named by sir john ross i do not think he would have risked the besetment of his ships in such very heavy ice to the westward of it but had he attempted the northwest passage by the eastern route he would probably have carried his ships safely through to bering strait but franklin was furnished with charts which indicated no passage to the eastward of king william's land and made that land since discovered by ray to be an island a peninsula attached to the continent of north america and he consequently had but one course open to him and that the one he adopted my own preference for the route by the east side of the island is founded upon the observations and experience of ray and collinson in eighteen fifty one fifty two and fifty four i am of the opinion that the barrier of ice off bellow strait some three or four miles wide was the only obstacle to our carrying the fox according to my original intention southward to the great fish river passing east of king william's island and from thence to a wintering position on victoria land perhaps some future voyager 
profiting by the experience so fearfully and fatally acquired by the franklin expedition and the observations of ray collinson and myself may succeed in carrying his ship through from sea to sea at least he will be enabled to direct all his efforts in the true and only direction in the meantime to franklin must be assigned the earliest discovery of the northwest passage though not the actual accomplishment of it in his ships saturday second july upon my arrival on board on the morning of the nineteenth of june my first inquiries were about hobson i found him in a worse state than i expected he reached the ship on the fourteenth unable to walk or even stand without assistance but already he was beginning to amend and was in excellent spirits christian had shot several ducks which with preserved potato milk strong ale and lemon juice completed a very respectable dietary for a scurvy stricken patient all the rest were tolerably well slight traces only of scurvy in two or three of the men the ship was as clean and trim as i could expect and all had well and cheerfully performed their duties during my absence hardly any game had been shot except one bear the doctor now acquainted me with the death of thomas blackwell ship's steward which occurred only five days previously and was occasioned by scurvy this man had scurvy when i left the ship in april and no means were left untried by the doctor to promote the recovery and rally his desponding energies but his mind unstained by hope lost all energy and at last he had to be forcibly taken upon deck for fresh air for months past the ship's spirit had been of necessity removed from under his control when too late his shipmates made it known that he had a dislike to preserved meats and had lived the whole winter upon salt pork he also disliked preserved potato and would not eat it unless watched nor would he put on clean clothes which others in charity prepared for him yet his death was somewhat unexpected he went on deck as usual to walk in the middle of the day and when found there was quite dead his remains were buried beside those of our late shipmate mr brand the news of our success to the southward in tracing the footsteps of the lost expedition greatly revived the spirits of my small crew we wished only for the safe and speedy return of young and his party captain young commenced his spring explorations on the seventh of april with a sledge party of four men and a second sledge drawn by six dogs under the management of our greenlander samuel finding in his progress that a channel existed between prince of wales land and victoria land whereby his discovery and search would be lengthened he sent back one sledge the tent and four men to the ship in order to economize provisions and for forty days journeyed with one man george hobday and the dogs in camping in such snow lodges as they were able to build this great exposure and fatigue together with extremely bad weather and a most difficult coastline to trace greatly injured his health he was compelled to return to the ship on seventh of june for medical aid but proposing at all hazards to renew his explorations almost immediately dr walker met this determination by a strong protest in writing against his leaving the ship again his health being quite unequal to it but after three days young felt himself somewhat better and with a zeal which knew no bounds set off to complete his branch of the search taking with him both his sledge parties from the doctor's account i felt most anxious for his return lest his health or that of his companions should receive permanent injury in fact this was now my only cause of anxiety the season was rather forward here and advancing with unusual rapidity rain and wind dissolving the snow and ice there was much water in bellow strait extending from halfway island eastward to the tableland and thence in a narrow lane to long island after a day or two i could perceive a vast improvement in hobson and my own four men with the exception of hampton who required rest were in sound health so also was my companion peterson on twenty fourth of june christian shot two small reindeer which gave us one hundred and seventy pounds of meat a few days before that he shot a seal which afforded two sumptuous meals for all on board the time having elapsed during which young expected to remain absent and the difficulties of the transit from the western sea having become greatly increased i set off early on the twenty fifth of june with my four men intending to visit pemmican rock but failing to come across him there i resolved to carry on provisions as far as four river point in the hope of meeting with him and of facilitating his return to our surprise the water had all drained off the frozen surface of the long lake and it therefore afforded excellent travelling we found the poor dogs lying quietly beside our sledges they had attacked the pemmican and devoured a small quantity which was not secured in tin also some blubber some leather straps and a gull that i had shot for a specimen but they had not apparently relished the biscuit poor dogs 
they have a hard life of it in these regions even peterson who is generally kind and humane seems to fancy they must have little or no feeling one of his theories is that you may knock an eskimo dog about the head with any article however heavy with perfect impunity to the brutes one of us upbraided him the other day because he broke his whip handle over the head of a dog that was nothing at all he assured us some friend of his in greenland found he could beat his dogs over the head with a heavy hammer it stunned them certainly but by laying them with their mouths open to the wind they soon revived got up and ran about all right we lost no time in giving them a good feed the first for seven days yet they did not seem unusually hungry and soon coiled themselves up to sleep again whilst the men and dogs were employed next day in conveying a sledge to the east end of the lake i walked to cape bird to look out for the absent party but they had not yet returned to pemmican rock when vainly endeavouring with felonious intentions to climb up a steep cliff to the breeding places of some silvery gulls i saw and shot a brent goose seated upon an accessible ledge and made a prize of four eggs it seems strange that this bird should have selected so unusual a breeding place many seals were basking on the ice and the watercourse by which our sledges ascended a week before to the long lake was now a strong and rapid stream a few reindeer were seen on the twenty seventh i sent three of the men back to the ship and with thompson and the dogs went on to pemmican rock where to our great joy we happily met young and his party who had but just returned there after a long and successful journey the particulars of which i will give hereafter young was greatly reduced in flesh and strength so much weakened indeed that for the last few days he had travelled on the dog sledge harvey also far from well could just manage to keep pace with the sledge his malady was scurvy their journeys had been very depressing most dismal weather low dreary limestone shores devoid of game and no traces of the lost expedition the news of our success in the southern journeys greatly cheered them on the following day we were all once more on board and indulging in such rapid consumption of eatables as only those can do who have been much reduced by long continued fatigue and exposure to cold venison ducks beer and lemon juice daily preserved apples and cranberries three times a week and pickled whale skin a famous antiscorbutic ad libitum for all who liked it the weather which for the last week had been wet windy and miserable now set in fair the carpenter's hammer and the men's voices at their work were new and animating sounds end of chapter sixteen chapter seventeen of in the arctic seas this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org in the arctic seas by captain f l mcclintock chapter seventeen today second july i took a long and delightful walk but shot only two ducks peterson went in another direction and got nothing christian after toiling all day in his kayak returned with only two divers and a duck lately he has obtained for us several king and long-tailed ducks no eider ducks have been seen two red-throated divers and two brent geese and caught an ermine in its summer coat yesterday one of the men brought on board a trout weighing two pounds he saw a glaucous gull and a fox disputing for it the former seems to have killed and brought it to land the water now washes the south side of the fox islands and extends to the south point of long island the month of june has been somewhat warmer than usual its mean temperature being plus thirty five and a half degrees ninth the ship has been thoroughly cleaned and restowed remaining provisions examined tanks filled with fresh water twelve tons of stone ballast taken in and everything brought on board that was landed last autumn hobson is the only one upon the sick list but he is able to walk about and does duty very few birds and only one small seal have been obtained during the week an occasional great northern diver is seen and a rare land bird has been shot we cannot discover the nests of either ducks or geese and the breeding cliffs of the gulls being inaccessible we have not got any eggs i am a close prisoner at the corner of my table poring over my observation and angle book and have at length laid down upon paper the west coast of king william's land to my satisfaction tidal observations are commenced and the aneroid and mercurial barometers are again being compared in order to verify the former 
16th, Saturday night. We are now almost ready for sea. There is a much larger space of water in Bellow Strait, reaching within 300 or 400 yards of us. Long cracks or lanes of water have been seen in Prince Regent's Inlet. The decay of the ice continues, though not with equal rapidity, yet with very satisfactory dispatch. Westerly winds and clear weather prevail. Christian has seen two reindeer this week, and has shot a very few birds and seven seals. As these creatures lie basking upon the ice, he crawls up to them behind a small calico screen, fitted upon a miniature sledge about a foot long, on which there is a rest for the muzzle of his rifle, and a slit in the calico through which he fires it. The seals afford an average weight of 30 pounds of excellent fresh meat, which we relish greatly, and consider much better suited to our present condition than such poor venison as reindeer would furnish at this season. A single hare has been shot, the white fur has nearly all disappeared, and left exposed the summer coat of dull lead colour. Several small birds not common to the northward are found here. Insects abound, the doctor is perpetually in chase, unless busily occupied in grubbing up plants. Young is surveying the harbour, Hobson fully occupied in preparing the ship for sea. I have been giving some attention to the engines and boiler, and hope, with the help of the two stokers, to be able to make use of our steam power. The men have received my hearty thanks for their great exertions during the travelling period. I told them I considered every part of our search to have been fully and efficiently performed. Our labours have determined the exact position of the extreme northern promontory of the continent of America. I have affixed to it the name of Murchison, after the distinguished president of the Royal Geographical Society, the strenuous advocate for this further search, and the able champion of Lady Franklin, when she needed all the support which private friendship and public spirit could bestow. 23rd. The ice in Prince Regent's Inlet is broken up into pack, but the prevalence of easterly winds keeps it in close upon the shore. The ice about us is very much decayed, holes through it in many places. No reindeer seen this week, and only two seals procured. One of them shot by Christian, the other was killed by a bear, which ran off before Samuel could come within shot of him. A fox, a gull, a couple of ducks, and one or two lemmings complete our game list for the week, yet our two Eskimo are indefatigable in the pursuit. We eat all the birds and seals we can shoot, as well as mustard and cress as fast as we can grow it, but the quantity is very small. We sometimes refresh ourselves with a salad of sorrel leaves, or roots of the little plant with lilac flowers of snapdragon shape, named Pedicularis hirsuta. The seine has been hauled in the narrow lake at the head of the harbour, but as it was not well managed, only a dozen small trout were taken, though several were seen. We have tried for rock cod, but without success. The relics of the lost expedition have been aired, exhibited to the crew, labelled and packed away. The doctor has been dredging lately. A record detailing our proceedings has been placed in a cairn upon the west point of Depot Bay. 1st August a long continuance of unusually calm, bright and warm weather has been favourable to our painting and cleaning the ship, scraping masts and so forth. The result is that she looks unusually smart and gay, and our impatience to exhibit her and ourselves at home is much increased. With the exception of a few gulls and a duck, our hunters have shot nothing lately, although constantly out, either darting about in their kayaks or ranging over the hills. In fact, there is nothing which they can shoot, the ducks are tolerably numerous, but extremely wild. The valleys are respectably clothed with vegetation, yet only one animal, a hare, has been seen. I was so fortunate as to shoot a snowy owl, the flesh of which was white and tender, but to my palate tasteless, although Peterson considers that owl is the best beef in the country. On Thursday night we found the harbour ice to be quietly drifting out, of course taking us with it. The night was calm, the current in Bellow Strait very strong. We were almost helpless under the circumstances, and therefore felt the danger of our position. To warp the ship along the ice edge, out of the way of the shore of the rocks as it turned around and drifted along the cliffs to the westward, gave us some hours' occupation. At length it stuck fast between Fox Island and the main. At turn of tide on Friday morning it began to drift eastward, and by this time, being much broken up, and a breeze coming to our aid, we managed to extricate ourselves and reach a secure anchorage in Point Kennedy. On Saturday night, some ice that was left came drifting out of the inner harbour, and obliged us to slip our cable, but after a few hours we regained our berth in safety, and have since been undisturbed. 
There is no immediate prospect of escape, but we expect a prodigious smashing up of the ice whenever a strong wind springs up to set it in motion. Today the steam was got up, and with the help of our two stokers I worked the engines for a short time. It is very cheering to know that we will still have steam power at our command, although by the deaths of poor Mr. Brand and Robert Scott we were deprived of our engineer and engine driver. The mean temperature for July has been 40.14 degrees, which is above the average for this region. The July temperatures have usually varied from 36 degrees to 42 degrees. All are now in good health, but Hobson is still a little lame. The issue of lemon juice has been reduced to the ordinary allowance of half an ounce daily, as we have but little that is really good, lest another winter should become inevitable, which, I can devoutly say, may God forbid. Monday night, 8th. Very anxiously awaiting an opportunity to escape. We have constantly watched the ice from the neighbouring hills, including the lofty summit of Mount Walker, named after the doctor, who was the first to ascend it, 1,123 feet, from which Fury Point can be distinguished, but nothing very cheering has been seen. We had a northeast gale, accompanied by rain and a considerable fall of the barometer a few days ago, and as it blew freshly from the westward this morning, I went to a hilltop and saw that much ice had been broken up in Brentford Bay, and that there were streaks of water along the land between Possession Point and Hazard Inlet. This water, however, was not accessible to us. The ice about Pemmican Rock was in much the same position as we found it last year, but Bellow Strait was perfectly clear. All the ice in this harbour, in Depot Bay and Hazard Inlet is gone, by far the greater part having decayed, not drifted away. Later in the day, and from the loftier hilltops, a good deal of water was seen off Cape Garry, and a water sky beyond. It now blows very strongly from the southwest, the most desirable quarter, and as the anxious desire to escape has become oppressive, it is not to be wondered at that now our hopes have become extravagant. We may even make a start to-morrow. On the other hand, a careful examination of our provision store shows that, should we be obliged to spend another winter here, we must curtail our allowance of meat, fresh and salt, to three-quarters of a pound, and have to use but very indifferent lemon juice. The spirits, I rejoice to say, will very shortly be entirely expended. On the morning of the third instant, when the rain ceased and northeast gale sprang up, two claps of thunder were distinctly heard. This occurs but very rarely in these latitudes. There is ample occupation for the men, but not much for the officers. As for myself, I write a great deal, and work occasionally at our chart of discoveries. The only refreshment I indulge in is an occasional dive into packets of old letters. All yesterday the harbour was full of ice set in by southerly and westerly winds, and so closely packed that one might have walked over it to the shore. Today it has nearly all drifted out again. The subjoined list will show what game we have been able to obtain by constant and arduous labour from the resources of these regions during nearly two years' sojourn. Game list. Eight months in the pack, 1857-58. to 58. Bears, 2. Seals, 73. Dove keys, 38. Foxes, 1. Eleven months in Port Kennedy, 1858-59. to 59. Bears, 2. Deer, 8. Hares, 9. Foxes, 19. Ptarmigan, 82. Wild fowl, 98. Seals, 18. At Port Kennedy, several ermines and lemmings were also caught. The ptarmigan all disappeared after 1st April. Only two dovekies were seen, one in winter and one in summer plumage. A few seals were seen as early as the month of February. Ducks, geese and gulls were the usual kind of wild fowl killed. During the four months occupied in sailing from Davis Strait to Bellow Strait, many looms and rochies and five or six bears were shot. Wednesday 10th. The southwest wind proved a good friend to us. By the morning of the 9th it had moved the ice off shore and cleared away a passage for us out of Brentford Bay. We started under steam at 11 o'clock yesterday morning, and passing round Long Island, made sail along the land towards Cape Garry there being a channel about two or three miles wide between the pack and the shore. The wind now failed us, and I experienced some little difficulty in the management of the engines and boiler, the latter primed so violently as to send the water over our top gallant yard, and the tail valve of the condenser by some means had got out of its seat, and admitted air to the condenser, but eventually we got the engines to work well, and steamed across Creswell Bay during the night. 
the pack rested against fury point and an east wind springing up we made fast to a large grounded mass of ice in adelaide bay about quarter of a mile off shore and in three fathoms water at eleven o'clock this morning having managed the engines for twenty-four consecutive hours i was not sorry to get into bed we were hardly out of brentford bay when fulmar petrels and white whales were seen the first we have noticed for eleven and a half months dove keys are likewise abundant and a seal has already been shot creswell bay is perfectly clear of ice but this pale limestone land is the perfection of sterility even with the rugged hills of brentford bay in lively recollection upon the east side of port kennedy the bones of whales were found in two places a mile apart from each other the lowest of them was one hundred and eighty feet above the sea the second was more than three hundred feet high the latter i examined and found a jawbone two ribs a joint of the vertebrae and fragments of other bones all more or less buried in the soil and much heavier than the bones of a recent animal they lay within forty or sixty yards of each other and upon a little flat patch of rather rich earth a rocky hill above and a steep slope below they are also nearly a mile inland of the traces which we have left behind the most considerable are the graves of our two shipmates within the western point of our little harbour they were tastefully sodded round and planted over with the usual arctic flowers there is our record in a conspicuous cairn at the west point of depot or transition bay we left also three cases of pemmican near the east end of the long lake and our travelling boat near its west end at the head of false strait monday fifteenth strong east winds with much rain have imprisoned us here for the last four days and driven the whole pack close in completely filling up creswell bay we remain fast to the grounded ice which shields us from pressure otherwise we should have been driven irretrievably on shore a couple more seals and a white whale have been shot the latter measured thirteen and a half feet long and proved to be a female of ordinary dimensions and of a uniform cream colour the eyes are extremely small and orifices of the ears scarcely large enough to admit a crow quill we dined off steaks of the flesh and prefer it to seal which it very much resembles but is not quite so tender the skin is greatly prized by the greenlanders as an antiscorbutic it is a sort of grisly gelatinous substance nearly half an inch thick and possessing very little taste fried and eaten with fish sauce it reminded me of cod sound though not so good the blubber fills two twenty-gallon casks it produces oil of a quality superior to seal oil not an ounce of the flesh or skin of this huge animal has been thrown away the men having a wholesome dread of scurvy and unbounded confidence in blood meat such as this the doctor has picked up a few fossils very similar to those formerly brought home from port leopold to our great joy the east wind died away this morning and immediately a west wind sprang up which very quickly freshened to a smart gale at four o'clock this afternoon we were able to make sail the ice having moved about three miles off shore passed within a mile of fury beach two hours afterwards and saw the framing of the house the boats and casks very distinctly seventeenth after passing fury beach it fell calm so we steamed up as far as batty bay on tuesday afternoon we were off port leopold running fast when thick fog came on and we got involved in loose ice and seriously damaged our rudder the boats and stores at port leopold appear to remain as we left them last year the flagstaff on the summit of north east cape over whale point is still standing but not erect fog and ice obstructed our progress during the night but this morning when i came on deck at eight o'clock the day was bright clear and charming no ice visible except about leopold island which was now some miles behind us towards evening the wind became contrary sunday evening twenty first at sea out of sight of land on the nineteenth we were somewhat delayed by loose ice off cape hay but by noon yesterday were close off cape burney and whilst almost becalmed there a mother bear swam off to us with two interesting cubs about the size of very large dogs foolish creatures a volley of rifles decided their fate in a very few seconds not finding any whaling vessels off ponds inlet the land ice which shelters the whales having all disappeared we therefore concluded that the whalers had left in consequence so without seeking for them further south at once changed our course for disco to-day only a few icebergs have been seen there is a good deal of swell so we tumble about roast veal has appeared amongst the delicacies of our table since the bature of yesterday and christian has asked for a portion of the old bear to carry home to his mother bear's flesh is really considered a delicacy in greenland 
25th. Be calmed off Hare Island and getting the steam ready. We are only 108 miles from Godhaven, and the anxiety to clutch our letters has become intolerable. No pack ice has been met with in our passage across Baffin's Bay, but many icebergs. This morning the lofty snow-clad land of Norsoak and Disco was beautifully distinct, and at the same time the wind died away, leaving us at least the opportunity to contemplate at our leisure their gloomy grandeur. 26th. Steamed for ten hours last night. Fair winds and calms have alternated since then, but this evening we are within twenty miles, and hope soon to get into port. I have been reading over Young's report of his spring journey. It comprises seventy-eight days of sledge travelling, and certainly under most discouraging circumstances. Leaving the ship on 7th of April, he crossed the western strait to Prince of Wales land, and thence traced its shore to the south and west. On reaching its southern termination, Cape Swinburne, so named in honour of Rear Admiral Swinburne, a much esteemed friend of Sir J. Franklin, and one of the earliest supporters of this final expedition, he describes the land as extremely low and deeply covered with snow, the heavy grounded hummocks which fringe its monotonous coast alone indicating the line of demarcation betwixt land and sea. To the northeast of this terminal cape the sea was covered with level flow formed in the fall of last year, whilst all to the northwestward of the same cape was pack consisting of heavy ice masses, formed perhaps years ago in far distant and wider seas. Young attempted to cross the channel which he discovered between Prince of Wales Island and Victoria Land, but from the rugged nature of the ice found it quite impracticable with the means and time remaining at his disposal. Young expresses his firm conviction that this channel is so constantly choked up with unusually heavy ice as to be quite unnavigable. It is, in fact, a continuous ice stream from the northwest. His opinion coincides with my own and with those of Captains O'Manny and Osborne when those officers explored the northwestern shores of Prince of Wales Land in 1851. Fearing that his provisions might run short, he sent back one sledge with four men and continued his march with only one man and the dogs for forty days. They were obliged to build a snow hut each night to sleep in, as the tent was sent back with the men. But latterly, when the weather became more mild, they preferred sleeping on the sledge, as the constructing of a snow hut usually occupied them for two hours. Young completed the exploration of this coast beyond the point marked upon the charts as Osborne's farthest, up nearly to latitude 73 degrees north, but no cairn was found. Young, however, recognised the remarkably shaped conical hills spoken of by Osborne, when he, at his farthest, in 1851, struck off to the westward. The coastline throughout was extremely low, and in the thick, disagreeable weather which he almost constantly experienced, it was often a matter of great difficulty to prevent straying off the coastline inland. He commenced his return on the 11th of May, and reached the ship on 7th June, in wretched health and depressed in spirits. Directly his health was partially re-established, he, in spite of the doctor's remonstrances, as I have before said, again set out on the 10th with his party of men and the dogs, to complete the exploration of both shores of the continuation of Peel Sound, between the position of the Fox and the points reached by Sir James Ross in 1849 and Lieutenant Brown in 1851. This he accomplished without finding any trace of the lost expedition, and the parties were again on board by 28th of June. The ice travelled over in this last journey was almost all formed last autumn. The extent of coastline explored by Captain Young amounts to 380 miles, whilst that discovered by Hobson and myself amounts to nearly 420 miles, making a total of 800 geographical miles of new coastline which we have laid down. Hobson's report is a minute record of all that occurred during his journey of 74 days, and this includes a list of all the relics brought on board or seen by him. He suffered very severely in health. When only ten days out from the ship, traces of scurvy appeared. When a month absent, he walked lame. Towards the latter end of the journey, he was compelled to allow himself to be dragged upon the sledge, not being able to walk more than a few yards at a time. And on arriving at the ship on the 14th of June, poor Hobson was unable to stand. How strongly this bears upon the last sad march of the lost crews. And yet Hobson's food throughout the whole journey was pemmican of the very best quality, the most nutritious description of food that we know of, and varied occasionally by such game as they were able to shoot. In spite of this fresh meat diet, scurvy advanced with rapid strides. After leaving me at Cape Victoria, he says, no difficulty was experienced in crossing James Ross Strait. The ice appeared to be of but one year's growth, and although it was in many places much crushed up, we easily found smooth leads through the lines of hummocks. 
many very heavy masses of ice evidently of foreign formation have been here arrested in their drift so large are they that in the gloomy weather we experienced they were often taken for islands again at cape felix he observes the pressure of the ice is severe but the ice itself is not remarkably heavy in character the shoalness of the coast keeps the line of pressure at considerable distance from the beach to the northward of the island the ice as far as i could see was very rough and crushed up into large masses here we notice the gradual change in the character of the ice as hobson left the boothian shore and advanced towards victoria strait the very heavy masses of ice evidently of foreign formation had drifted in from the northwest through mcclure strait victoria strait was full of it and hobson's description of the ice he passed over clearly illustrates how franklin leaving clear water behind him pressed his ships into the pack when he attempted to force through victoria strait how very different the result might and probably would have been had he known of the existence of a ship channel sheltered by king william's island from this tremendous polar pack hobson left king william island on the last day of may having spent thirty-one days on its desolate shores during that period one bear and five willow grouse were shot one wolf and five foxes were seen one poor fox was either so desperately hungry or so charmed with the rare sight of animated beings that he played about the party until the dogs snapped him up although in harness and dragging the sledge at the time a few gulls were seen but not until after the first week in june i have already explained how hobson found the records and the boat he exercised his discretionary power with sound judgment and completed his search so well that in coming over the same ground after him i could not discover any trace that had escaped him i quite agree with him that there may be many small articles beneath the snow but that cairns graves or any conspicuous objects could exist upon so low and uniform a shore without our having seen them is almost impossible sunday evening twenty ninth calm warm lovely weather and we are thoroughly enjoying it in the quiet security of lively harbour or godhaven although friday night was dark we managed to find out the harbour's mouth and slowly steamed into it the inhabitants were awoke by peterson demanding our letters but great indeed was our disappointment at finding only a very few letters and two or three papers and these for the officers only it appears that on the arrival of the whalers in early spring the ice prevented their usual communication with the settlement therefore the letters on board of them were unavoidably carried northward some few however which came out in the true love were landed at the neighbouring settlement of norsoak and from thence were sent back to godharm it is a rather nervous thing opening the first letters after a lapse of more than two years we received them in our beds at three o'clock in the morning and when we met at breakfast were able thank god to congratulate each other upon the receipt of cheering home news lady franklin and miss craycroft wrote to me from bournemouth in march last they have travelled more than we have i think having visited almost all the countries bordering the mediterranean and black seas posted through the crimea and steamed up the danube i am much gratified to learn that i have been elected a member of the royal yacht squadron during my absence yesterday morning i called upon the inspector mr ulrich who has been home to denmark since i saw him last spring in the autumn he took mrs ulrich and his family to copenhagen and has but just returned alone he received me with his usual kindness and promised me such supplies as we require it so happens that none of my expected business letters have arrived so that i am not accredited in the slightest degree nor is there any hint thrown out as to where i am to take the fox mr ulrich gave me a large bundle of illustrated london news which was exceedingly acceptable and told us that austria was at war with france and sardinia by the latest news a battle had been fought and won by the latter powers most fortunately a navy list had come out to hobson otherwise i think we should have been utterly broken-hearted we study its pages daily and delight in noticing the advancement of our many friends first september thursday night at sea on the passage and already enjoying by anticipation the pleasures of home five busy days were spent in godhaven supplying our little wants in as far as they could be supplied including one hundred gallons of light beer the natives were very useful the men bringing off water stone ballast and sand and a troop of eskimo girls scrubbing the paintwork and the decks each evening the men went on shore taking with them a very limited quantity of rum punch for the ladies and danced for several hours in a large store whilst the officers and myself spent time with mr ulrich or the other danish gentlemen messrs anderson bullbrew and tyner nothing could exceed their kindness to us whilst their good humour and their anecdotes sometimes expressed in quaint english greatly amused us 
we shall always retain very agreeable recollections of godhavn twice has it been to us an arctic home mr peterson's nieces the bells of the place came on board miss sophia with scented cambric handkerchief and gloves in other respects she adheres to the eskimo costume they were pleased with the organ although it is out of repair and they sang together very sweetly for us our eskimo shipmates christian and samuel were discharged and by their own request their wages were given in charge to mr ulrich and mr bullbrew they seemed to understand the importance of husbanding their wealth christian said he thought it would not all be spent under three years first of all he intended buying a rifle for his brother and then some wood to build a house for himself i was gratified very much when i heard them say that the men had treated them very well all the same as brothers and they really seemed sorry to leave the ship they would come on board and look gravely about at everything as if regretting the coming separation even our poor dogs seemed to think the ship their natural abode although landed at the settlement they soon ran round the harbour to the point nearest the ship and there upon the rocks spent the whole period of our stay on tuesday night we set off some fireworks on shore to amuse the natives for i intended sailing next day but the wind prevented my doing so the last day was spent in the interchange of presents between our danish friends and ourselves indeed the sincere hearty good feeling which existed between every individual in the fox and the inhabitants of the settlement was as gratifying as apparent almost the only fresh supplies obtained here were rock cod and salmon trout from disco fjord during our stay the weather was delightful indeed it was the first really fine weather they had experienced at godhavn during the present season the summer having been cold and wet tenth september saturday night to-day we passed to the eastward of cape farewell but about one hundred miles to the south of it the last iceberg was seen to-day and now we are running along swiftly before a pleasant north-west breeze hitherto we have had every variety of wind and weather from a calm to a gale but generally the wind has been favourable the change of temperature is already perceptible saturday night seventeenth september a week of favourable gales has brought us from cape farewell to within four hundred miles of land's end or about eleven hundred miles of distance but such rough weather is not pleasant in so small a vessel however much like a duck she may be and our two years sojourn in the still waters of the frozen north has made us very susceptible of the change end of chapter seventeen conclusion of in the arctic seas this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. In the Arctic Seas by Captain F. L. McClintock Conclusion We sailed all the way home from Greenland, yet the fox made the passage in only nineteen days, arriving in the English Channel on the 20th of September. On the evening of the 21st I reached London, having landed at portsmouth and made known to the admiralty the results of my voyage on the twenty third september the fox was taken into dock at blackwall and through the kindness and promptitude of the lords of the admiralty i was enabled on the twenty seventh when the crew were assembled for the last time to present the arctic medal to such of my companions who had not already received it for previous arctic service and also to inform lieutenant hobson that his promotion to the rank of commander would speedily take place I will not intrude upon the reader who has followed me through the pages of this simple narrative any description of my feelings on finding the enthusiasm with which we were all received on landing upon our native shores the blessing of providence had attended our efforts and more than a full measure of approval from our friends and countrymen has been our reward for myself the testimonial given me by the officers and crew of the fox has touched me perhaps more than all the purchase of a gold chronometer for presentation to me was the first use the men made of their earnings and as long as i live it will remind me of that perfect harmony that mutual esteem and good will which made our ship's company a happy little community and contributed materially to the success of the expedition the names i have given to my discoveries are with the exception of those by which i have endeavoured to honour the members of the lost expedition the names of active supporters of the recent search and friends of franklin and his companions though such names are far from exhausting the number of those who have the highest claims to distinction on both grounds it will be observed that i have refrained from repeating names which have already been commemorated by preceding commanders and which therefore are already in our charts besides the individuals already mentioned in the narrative 
sir thomas d ackland one of the most zealous promoters of the search both in and out of the house of commons monsieur de la roquette vice president of the geographical society of paris and author of an interesting biography of franklin rear admiral fitzroy and major general pasley r e stand high amongst those whom it has been my privilege to honour although much talent has been brought to bear upon the deciphering of letters found in a pocket-book near cape herschel yet from their being so very much defaced by time only a few detached sentences have been made out and these do not in the slightest degree refer to the proceedings of the lost expedition it will be seen that i have noticed the discrepancy between the number of souls accounted for by the point victory record and the generally received opinion that one hundred and thirty eight individuals sailed in the erebus and terror i am now enabled to state on the authority of the admiralty that only one hundred and thirty four individuals left the united kingdom and of these five men subsequently returned one by h m s rattler and four by the transport barretto junior so that only one hundred and twenty nine the exact number mentioned in the record actually entered the ice the five individuals were from h m s terror john brown able seaman robert carr armourer james elliot sailmaker william aitkin marine from h m s erebus thomas burt armourer the relics we have brought home have been deposited by the admiralty in the united service institution and now form a national memento the most simple and touching of those heroic men who perished in the path of duty but not until they had achieved the grand object of their voyage the discovery of the north-west passage london twenty fourth november eighteen fifty nine end of in the arctic seas a narrative of the discovery of the fate of sir john franklin and his companions by captain f l mcclintock Recording by Patrick Eaton, Kenilworth, Warwickshire, United Kingdom, August to October 2013.